the comments or the chat um which one of those you're most excited about yeah and it looks like we had some issues in sound in the very beginning i'm so sorry about that oh. y'all uh um, which one of those you're most excited about yeah all right it looks like we had some <laughs> It looked like we had some issues with sound in the very beginning. Wow, we have so many people in the chat. But let's um let's jump back into what we were talking about. We were talking about the all of the topics and themes that we have planned for you all today. Uh, we'll be doing the latest in data science, tools for data science, and scaling data science to the cloud. And this is not going to be all about Microsoft, like you know, we're, we're marketing it or anything like that. We have folks from the community that we've um, invited to talk today. Yeah, right? that was so, a big initiative for us. Yes. So we have five to 10 minute talks, um, which are approachable, mm -hmm. bite side pieces of really cool information, yep. hopefully giving you enough information to dive in on your own. And uh, we also have 25 minutes uh, long talks. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you won't be bored <laughs> at all. Um, and I was saying earlier that, I mean, the, the chat is already super duper vibrant, um, but please keep, keep engaging with all the speakers and our expert moderators in the chat. Um, we'll have five minute kind of question sessions for the 25 minute sessions, but not for the lightning talks, yeah. but feel free to still use the chat to um, talk to each other or even talk to talk to the speakers and moderators. Yeah, we have a bunch of moderators in the yes. channel. Um, a bunch of our colleagues are there and we have our student ambassadors there as well. And we have our some MVPs in there. Uh, are you familiar with the Python MVP program? Please tell us. Yeah, <laughs> so this week was the Python MVP Summit. Yep. So we invited tons of people to the Microsoft campus. Uh, they are experts in their field. We, they are under NDA, so they get the secret sauce of, of Microsoft products. And then we get to ask them a bunch of really engaging questions so we can get feedback on our products. And then they get to learn about our products before anyone else. Uh, so if you're interested in being a Python MVP, let's get that. Um, uh, you can join, uh, look up a Microsoft MVP program, you can Bing it, and uh, you'll be able to sign up and apply and go through the applica application process to be one of them. Do we have any MVPs in the chat? I know we have a few. We have some VS Code fans in the chat too. I'm biased towards that. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, uh, Sujan, I think it might have gotten cut off because of noise. What do you do here at Microsoft? Yeah. So I work on data science experiences for VS Code um, and any of the VS Code kind of touch points. So Jupyter Notebooks in VS Code, um, some of the AI experiences that we're building in VS Code, um, as well as I've been working with uh, GitHub team as well for, for code spaces experiences um, for cool, um, especially for data science. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that's what I work on. What do you work on? I am Python community advocate at Microsoft. And so I do uh, program management. So today was one of the things that I was working on for the last few months. Um, I help out teammates with things. I show up at conferences. I do demos, X, Y, and Z. But I have a love for VS Code as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, she did a lot of the hard work uh, behind the scenes. I'm very humble today. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're interested in staying involved with Python and VS Code and data science, um, you can join us um, by uh, filling out the survey. Tell us how you enjoyed the, today. You can do the data science cloud skills challenge. Uh, we can get that link up on this on the screen as well. Uh, choo -choo -choo. We have about 31 more days left on that, right? Yeah. yeah uh, so. April 15th is yep. the last day to participate. Cloud Skills Challenges are really cool because you get to go through uh, Microsoft Learn Education modules in order to get you to the, the end track. And so that would be data science in this in this um, experiment. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're also going to have some presence in some of the community uh, events as well. So next month we'll be at Pi Cascades if you want to meet us um, and talk to us and, and talk about how exciting this, this day was. Um, and we're also going to be in PyCon for or for May. May yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll be in Pittsburgh. And yep. we're really excited about yes. that. Yeah. You can also participate in the 14 Days of Data series. Uh, really excited about that one as well. And um, yeah, you can find more at our blog posts. Uh, you should check out uh, Python Dev Blog. 
All right. I think it's about time to jump into the to the sessions. I'm so excited. excited. Uh, Hi, and welcome to this session on Microsoft Fabric for Data Science. I'm Jasmine and I'm here joined with Ismail and we're gonna walk you through the data science workload within Microsoft Fabric. But before we do, let's talk through Microsoft Fabric and what it is, as well as how it relates to the world of AI. Because we know that AI is rapidly changing the world, but it's data that's the fuel that powers AI. So getting data ready for the era of AI has become critically important for every organization. And Microsoft makes it easy for your data to be AI ready with a unified analytics platform that is lake centric and open for everyone in the entire organization, which also empowers every business user to be able to use this data in the way that is intended to be used and for the people that is intended to be used for and with. And finally, it's AI powered. So there are AI capabilities built Baked, built and baked right into Fabric and essentially helping you accelerate your AI journey and your data journey. And the way that this really is applied is with the seven core workloads. So proven technologies like Azure Data Factory, Azure Setups Analytics, and Power BI essentially provide you with a single unified SaaS or software as a service experience. And pretty much what you get in Microsoft Fabric is this platform that's unified, that allows everybody to be able to access this data in one centralized location in a interface that's familiar and intuitive to the users. And finally, also accelerated with things like co-pilots and as well as generative AI that can be applied on your data so that you can essentially go from data to AI driven insights in a very short amount of time. Okay, so now that we know the well, a little bit about Fabric, let's talk a little bit about the data science process. And in the data science process, we are looking for data that we're going to enrich or transform or prepare so it can be used to train our models. No? In the end, what we want is to generate predictions and of course to create new insights for our company. So let's talk how, about Fabric and how it accelerates this process. So first thing we have is this concept of one lake. One lake is a little bit like one drive, so you put all the data you want in into a single place. So you can put data that comes from different sources, even from products from Microsoft like Power BI or things, things like that, warehouses, but also your text files or images or whatever you need. This data, and, and especially well, the well-structured data that we save as tables in Fabric, is saved as open, is in, an, in an open source format called Delta Parquet. Delta Parquet, of course, is really well supported by the Python ecosystems. And the good thing is every single data workload supports this data. We want to have only one copy of the data, so you don't need to, if you need to access it from a different system, you can do. Then the third concept for the data side is this concept of shortcuts. What are shortcuts? It's a way where we can create like links, let's say somehow to the data, so we don't need to create extra copies of the data if we want to access it, for example, for our data science processes. You don't have to ask someone to make a copy of you just get the access to the shortcuts. And of course, well, if you want to get access data that is outside of Fabric, like in a different cloud, you also can do it with shortcuts. So that's about creating the data, no? getting the data. But now once we have the data, well, we have to read it and we have to transform it. We do this through notebooks. And this is like a classical Jupyter notebook style experience, but well integrated with Fabric. Of course, you can use Python and PySpark to run your notebooks. You just run them as you want, and you can use all the tools from the Python ecosystems inside of this notebook. So you can use PySpark, you can use Pandas, you can use Matplotlib, SciPy, all the ecosystem of tools that we like and, and, and are used to play with. So all of this is supported through an integrated runtime. And well, let's talk a, a bit about that. 
We have a managed Spark runtime, so every single data processing work will be parallelized in case we need to scale. So everything is supported, everything is managed, and we can have different runtimes, a set of libraries, Python libraries, that are isolated from, from different runtime specifications through environments. And finally, we have this tool called Data Wrangler. And Data Wrangler is, a, let's say, a kind of graphical tool when you can create data transformations, you can prepare your data and see a preview of what is going on. Graphically, you choose options to do everything, but and in the end, it generates Python code and we can easily integrate this Python code into our notebooks. But of course, if you want to do more, well, you can use Copilot. So let's talk about Copilot, Jasmine. I really think you're gonna love this feature. Copilot for Microsoft Fabric is a continuously improving feature that enables increased productivity by using built-in generative AI. Now we're gonna take an example, look at an example of what that means. So Copilot uh, can assist me when, when working with things like Power BI, specific workloads like Power BI, where we need to build things like reports. So let's take a look at this example of this bike rentals workspace where there's this data that we prepped together and now we must go ahead and create a new report. Obviously I could just go ahead and start dragging and dropping on my own to start creating my own report but let's go ahead and use Copilot. Notice that it already has some starting prompts to get me started with a page and uh, now I'm just going ahead and selecting some of the options that Copilot has thought up for me. It's taken a look at my data and sees all these different things in my schema. And in fact, it's gone ahead and said, suggested one of these pages. So here we have uh, this trip forecast so we can essentially optimize where our bikes are. And just by submitting that prompt, we actually just got started with their support. Now, this is a great starting point, even if I don't have anything yet, but it saved me a bunch of time. So let's go ahead and create another page. This time I'm gonna ask for trip statistics and, status, and station status, because it's interesting to look at our different start and end stations. And you know it's included some uh, slicers so I can slice and dice by city. Um, I've got this map so I can zoom in and out on where the trips are starting. And uh, you know, we can essentially eye these trends where we're, where we're seeing essentially that people are essentially renting bikes in the rush hour. So rush hour in the morning and a rush hour in the afternoon. And here we go, some additional information, uh, trip duration, and as well as some additional insights just by having Copilot take a look at our data. And here we're going to ask it a little for a little bit more and about our data. We can see we just asked it a specific question about um, our stations. And we can see that it's way easier than um, exporting this to Excel and doing all these manual manipulations to the data. So now we're going and adding another visualization. And here we have, it's just what a pretty much a narrative summary of what's going on in our report. And here you can see it's giving me some interesting facts about the data. And you know, at this point I'm feeling pretty good about this report. And so as you can see, we, you know, we started from essentially data prepped. I could just ask for what I wanted and then we moved to um, data science, leveled up my skills to be able to build a forecast and now use Power BI with Copilot to essentially create a report in minutes. So let's take a look at another interesting feature specifically within the data science workload. Now Synapse ML is an open source Apache Spark library for machine learning. And it enables machine learning at scale with distributing trading of models and support for ML flow. And this includes integrations with machine learning services like Azure AI services, revision, speed language, 
processing and translation. It also supports things like Azure OpenAI to enable access to large language models that are fine tuned and ready to use. And of course, Microsoft Fabric is also powered by AI. And one of the most exciting features is the Copilot experience, which, you know, again, uses that natural language uh, processing support to do an analytics and generate data preparation tasks on notebooks. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And once we decide uh, which uh, models we want to run, well, the next step is to configure these models now. So we're going to put some set of hyperparameters and we are going to run them. And well, once we run this uh, experiment, let's say somehow we get some metrics and we use these metrics to compare our models and decide which one is the good one we want to use. All of these, well, we want a system that automates all of this, of course, and in our case, the system is MLflow. MLflow is like a standard tool that is well integrated with Fabric to do all of this. We can, for example, we can compare two runs on a different experiment. We can compare the different metrics. We can check, and as you can see here, we can check the runtime of each one of these metrics, which parameters we use, which libraries were used, and in which versions. Of course, we can promote and export a model from this run. And well, we can graphically see and, and compare the performance of the different metrics uh, on each model. So all of these, well, with a graphical system, without having to run external things to do everything, so all quite easy with Fabric. And well, once we finally have our model, let's say that is, let's say, inferring things for us, we want to show these results to the business side. And the issue is that many times the business side uses a different tooling, like Power BI, like this kind of reports-oriented tools that is not the same we use. So we have a library called Semantic Link that is, let's say, like a gate opener into the system. So now from our notebooks, we can access Power BI, we can get the different rules from Power BI, measures, all the things of the semantic model and integrate it into our data science process. So we can use it just to as a data set, as a data source, but we can also enrich data from Power BI from our experiments. For example, if we had a forecast column now, well, we can export this forecast column into Power BI. So that's a pretty neat thing to know that we also comes with Fabric, let's say for the getting insights point. Um, and well, in the end, you end up with reports like this one. So in the end, well, we finish here. Well, that data science in Microsoft Safari, well, it was a really short presentation. There's so much that we can talk about, but we wanted to give you a taste of what, what is there, no? Of course, Python is a first uh, language for, for data science and it's treated like that in Fabric. If you want to learn more, there are more tools that are going deep into uses of Python in, in in public and the different experiences so today you can join all of those or if you want also you can follow along afterwards you can go go in detail into this url so don't hesitate to visit this url and well thank you for joining us hello everyone and welcome to today's session on revolutionizing data workflows in python my name is Sumu Kemji, and I am excited to guide you through some powerful tools that can enhance your Python development experience. I am Sumu, final year undergraduate from India, software engineering intern, and also beta Microsoft Learn Ambassador. So, let's start by outlining what we will cover today. So we'll cover today the top five Python extensions in VS Code for Python developers, data scientists. So before coming to the top five Python extensions, so let us know about Visual Studio Code. So all of you already know about Visual Studio Code, which is top integrated development environment for programmers. So Visual Studio Code, commonly known as VS Code. It is a free open source code editor developed by Microsoft. It is lightweight, highly customizable, and supports a wide range of programming languages, including Python. VS Code offers 
a rich ecosystem of extensions tailored for Python development. Its intuitive interface and extensive features make it preferred choice for data scientists and developers alike. So now let's delve into some of the most and important extensions for Python development in VS Code. So the first extension which we are talking today is Python. Python extension is developed by Microsoft, which is an extension for VS Code, which provides rich support for Python language features. It includes debugging, linting, IntelliSense, code formatting, and many more. It serves as the foundation for seamless Python development experience. It also integrates with Jupyter Notebooks for interactive computing. It supports various Python interpreters and environments, including virtual environment, including virtual environments. So this is all about Python extension, which is a must-have extension for Python developers. So coming to the next ex extension, PyLance, which is most essential VS Code extension for Python developers. PyLance is a high-performance language server for Python built on top of Microsoft Python PyWrite static type checker. It offers advanced intelligence capabilities, type checking, and code navigation, empowering developers to write clean and efficient Python code. It supports Python 3.6 and later versions. It offers fast and efficient code analysis and also suitable for large code bases. So if you are dealing with large code bases of Python, you should have PyLance extension developed by Microsoft. As it offers advanced type checking and type inference capabilities, and also integrates seamlessly with Visual Studio Code's built-in features like debugging and code navigation. It can be very helpful for Python developers and data scientists to deal with large core bases. This is, so this is the second most used Python extension. So coming to the third most used and important Python extension for data scientists and Python developers is Jupyter. So Jupyter is an extension developed by Microsoft, which enables you to work with Jupyter Notebook directly within VS Code. So by this extension, you can directly involve running your code in Jupyter inside your VS Code. It provides familiar interface for inter interactive computing, allowing you to run code cell, visualize data, and create compelling narrative seamlessly. It supports cell-based execution for interactive development and data exploration. It also provides rich text and markdown support alongside code cells for documentation and narrative code. So it also offers support for multiple kernels, including Python, R, Julia, which makes it language friendly or language flexibility. It enables creation and editing of Jupyter Notebooks directly within Visual Studio. So this is the third most used and important Python extension developed by Microsoft in VS Code. So the fourth extension, which is important for Python developers and data scientists is Python X Explorer. Till now, we have seen that the top three extensions is used to write clean, and in code and which makes us to write easily the Python code and debugging and code formatting. So the fourth extension is used to test your Python code. 
It is developed by Little Fox team. It provides a user-friendly interface within Visual Studio Code for managing and running Python tests. So after writing a Python code, we should test it thoroughly using various test frameworks like PyTest, Unitest, or Nose. So this extension, Python Test Explorer, supports these testing frameworks for testing Python code. It facilitates test-driven development by integrating test frameworks like PyTest and Unitest and Nose in VS Code. It enables you to discover, run, and debug tests effortlessly, and also ensure the reliability and quality of your Python code base. It also allows filtering and grouping of tests based on different criteria for better organization and execution. So this is all about Python Test Explorer extension developed by Little Fox team. So the next most used extension for Python developers, which is most important for Python developers and data scientists is ARPL for Python. ARPL for Python, ARPL, another read eval print loop is a powerful tool for live coding and debugging. It offers real-time feedback on code execution, variable inspection, and error detection, making it invaluable for rapid prototyping and experimentation. It also offers an interactive environment for exploring Python syntax, libraries, and APIs without need to run a separate Python interpreter. It also allows us to visualize data structures, function outputs, and variable changes, enabling understanding and debugging capabilities, which supports quick experimentation and debugging by instantly showing variable values and output as code is typed. So this is the most important extension for Python. So these are the five most important extensions which every Python developer and data scientist must have. So in conclusion, by leveraging the power of VS Code extensions, you can revolutionize your data science workflows and unlock new values or levels of productivity and efficiency in Python development. So thank you one and all for joining this session. Thank you for giving me this op opportunity to express myself in this session. Thank you. Hey everyone, that was so great. I'm so glad we got to go into our first two lightning talks of the day. And now I get to bring on my friend, John Aziz. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, hey everyone. Hello, Sujin. Uh, do you mind? How are you doing? I'm fine, how about you? Great. Uh, so glad to speak with you and we'll let let you get into your presentation. Okay, thanks. Can someone bring up my share? Thank you. Hey everyone, hello again, and welcome to um, the RAG using the semantic kernel with Azure OpenAI and Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB code. Uh, it's a long name and you will know why we are using this specific type of uh, Azure Cosmos DB uh, later in the presentation today. So uh, I am John Aziz, I'm a Microsoft AI MVP and I'm currently uh, working um, as a coding instructor at a local company. I'm from Egypt, by the way. What are we going to get to today? We are going to learn about the Microsoft technologies used, and we are going to learn about the concepts behind them, and we're going to get uh, a demo, a light uh, demo for RAG and Jupyter Notebooks. If you have any questions while I'm speaking, we are live, I'm live with you. Please let me know how um, to help you, to assist you. If something I'm saying is not clear, I will be reviewing the comments while I'm speaking, and I will make sure to get to your comment. So these are the prerequisites if you want to follow along with me today. You need a GitHub account. You need an Azure subscription. You can uh, get uh, here. 
and activate your free Azure subscription right now. And if you are a student, you will have uh, another benefit of Azure uh, for students, which is a free subscription. It's another type for free subscriptions. And you need to apply for Azure OpenAI Access. If you have not already applied for Azure OpenAI Access, you won't be able to complete the demo today with me. So if you do have Azure OpenAI Access, I really encourage you to try and follow along. So what are the Microsoft technologies we are going to use today? The first one is Code Spaces. And Code Spaces uh, will provide us with a playground where we can test stuff out without having to install anything locally. And um, let me send you the URL. Uh, yeah, it will take several days. That's why I said that uh, you will need to use Azure OpenAI. Okay, so I can't send you the URL. Can someone send the URL? Okay. Uh, this is the URL for uh, the repo, which we will be working inside today. So this is the repo and it's called RAG, the same name as the demo or the, the session. And uh, it has some code, which you don't have to worry about. And uh, all we need to, to care about is that there is a button on the repo's page that says open in code spaces. So just click on this button and leave it uh, to load. It's not gonna take much time. Oh. We need to click on create again. It's not gonna take much time to load, but uh, we are gonna leave it and continue. Okay, so what else are we going to use? We are gonna use Azure OpenAI, which uh, is the way we are gonna be able to make chat. And I think all of you have already heard about Azure OpenAI and ChatGPT and all of that. So you can chat with someone and do natural language. And that's why we are going to use Azure OpenAI for two main reasons. The first one is that we are able to have chat with our data. And the second reason is that we are going to make our data uh, transform it into numbers, which is embeddings. And we will learn about this later. So we need two types of deployments. We need a chat deployment and embedding deployment. And let's do that. So we are gonna go to Microsoft Azure, click on Azure OpenAI, and click on Create. And then the steps are really easy and we are only going to be creating two resources today. So just give it a name, for example, MongoDB, Decor, Demo, RV. I have another one already created, but um, as a backup, but let's try to do it <laughs> live. <laughs> so how about we choose East US 2 and then just give it a name, open I workspace, uh, uh, VS code, any, anything will work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then let's choose standard S0, next, 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 and then create, that's it. So uh, you don't have to do a lot to be able to use Azure OpenAI. And that's us creating a service and this service will allow us to use the models that I talked to you about before, the chat model and the text embedding model. Uh, when the model is being created, we are going to also create an Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB v Core. And what is Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB v Core? It's a type of database where I can store JSON documents. And there is a, a specific structure for it, which I need you to understand because that's how we will build stuff. So we have our database account or database cluster. Inside this cluster, we can create lots of different databases. And inside each database, we can create a container. And this container will contain some JSON documents. So the container is the last thing Think of it as a table in Excel, which contains all of our data. And Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB v Core allows us to create the database and then use it 
uh, from Python, from Node, from Java, from Ruby, with a connector from the language, like by Mongo. And if you want to learn more about it, you can hit this URL. But let's get back here and create our chat and embedding deployments. So I'm just going to click on Go to Azure OpenAI Studio. And we are going to click on the first button that appears on the screen, which is Create Deployment, surprisingly. And then let's wait. It's loading. And yay, the create deployment here. Now let's click on it, create a new deployment, select GPT-35 Turbo, which is chat GPT model, and let's name it chat deployment. And then click on create. And we are going to create another deployment, which is called the embedding deployment. And you can use text embedding any one of those, but we're going to use EDA. And let's name it embedding deployment. Okay, now click on create. That's step one. We are done with Azure OpenAI. Now we go uh, back to the portal to create the Azure Cosmos DB from OpenDB Core. And we are not using Azure Cosmos DB because it can elastically scale up to lots of uh, storage or it, it it has lots of cool features. It's super fast, read and write, everything is cool about it. But we are using it for one reason, which we will get back to the slides and know. So let's just create it and name it uh, anything. V is code live and um, which one is it? I can't remember. I guess this one. It's not going to make a difference. And let's choose the same region that we chose before. Click on configure, and we are going to choose the smallest one. And by the way, you can use it for free. But we are going to choose the M25 uh, tier. And this is how many CPUs or virtual cores that are being provisioned when we create this resource. And the storage, we are going to, to choose the smallest storage option, which is a 23, uh, 32 gigab. And click on save, and that's it. Click on review and create and create. OK, wait for it to check everything. And then, hello. Oh, I didn't do something. What did not? Oh, I did not uh, add an admin. Uh, <laughs> I did not add my database credentials. So you need to add uh, the Cosmos DB admin and the password. I'm going to use a password that I know. Very good. And then click on create. Oh, I forgot the firewall rules too. Oh, God. Well, keep forgetting stuff. <laughs> so by the way, this is a really important step in the networking. Because if I did not add my current ID address to the firewall rules, I won't be able to access this database. And it's going to give you a timeout error when you try to use it in Python. So just click here, click allow public access to from Azure services. This is not public access for everyone. And then review and create, and click on create. That's great, uh, Phoenix. And then let's get back to the slides and continue. So why? Cosmos DB for MongoDB core. So it's, it has a very cool feature, which is built-in vector search. And what, what that means is that I don't have to perform my search somewhere and store my data somewhere else. I can store my data, which is a bunch of numbers, the embeddings, and perform search over them at the same place. And that's very good because I don't have to care about the other resources, are they working? And it, it makes the complexity of my solution uh, look way much lower. Because we only have to care about two resources right now, but Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB v Core and Azure OpenAI. And because we want to get started easily, we will be using the semantic kernel. And the semantic kernel will orchestrate all of these things together. It will communicate with 
the database, it will communicate with Azure OpenAI and do the rack for us. So we won't be doing much. Uh, we will be doing some code. It's not much, but we will be doing some code. But the semantic kernel will make it easy for us to wrap our database, uh, perform uh, vector search, and even the rack. And because it has lots of cool features, and we will get to explore today the memory feature. Standard cosine similarity across database or any other extra efficient worth mentioning. Yes, we are going to get to that when we get to the notebook. So it's cosine similarity. And you get to choose the, the type of uh, search that you will perform on your database. There are three available types, but let's leave that to the database uh, part. So now, some concepts, because some of you may have never heard about all of these things before. So this, this is a sample from our data. It's an OSQL data. It's a JSON document. It has an ID, a title, a content. And this data is some data I found on GitHub in a demo repo. And it's basically some uh, Microsoft Azure services. But uh, why am I using it? Because I, <laughs> I do not have that uh, much data available. And this data was good for testing because I know Azure and I know its services. And I know if what is I'm getting back is correct or not. <laughs> and this, these are my vector uh, embeddings. So what, what is vector embeddings for those of you who don't know? Uh, it's some numbers that hold the semantic meaning of the words inside them. And these numbers are in vectors, which we get to check the similarity or the distance between each vector. And that's why we have some functions like the one that Phoenix were asking about, uh, which is the cosine similarity. And this function basically takes the two vectors and sees how far are they from each other. If they are close to each other, it brings us back the answer as a response to our query. If they are not, it does not. Then, oh, RAG. Also, for those of you who don't know RAG, uh, retrieval augmented generation is intelligently retrieving some data with vector search. OK, and feeding it to my large language model, which is the chat GBT model, and making it answer based on this data and only this data using prompt engineering. So that's how RAG works. I apply vector search, as I told you, vector search will, will uh, calculate the similarity between two vectors, gives me back one answer or some answers, and I, I will take the best one, give it to my chat model, and tell it to respond to the user query from this content, only from this content. And now I have a grounded model that only responds from relevant uh, content. OK, let's get started. So now we are inside our, by the way, uh, the Cosmos DB for MongoDB core can take up to 10 minutes to get created. It's a big database. And, <laughs> but um, code spaces is working now. We are going to go to this one because I have it open and it has my secrets. Uh, already stored inside it because I'm not going to export my secrets live. But all you need to do is to go to your database, to go to the deployment, to go all of these places and uh, get the name. This is the name of the embedding. This is the name of the deployment. This is the name of the endpoint, the ABI key from keys and secrets, and the Cosmos uh, connection string. And this is from connection strings at Azure Cosmos DB, MongoDB core. And this is the type of the Azure Cosmos DB because there are lots of Cosmos DBs out there. And we want the MongoDB v core. And because semantic kernel only supports the v core currently. Also, we need a container name and the database name. These resources, the container name and database name, have not been created yet, but they will be created later on after we to do this, we need to load our environment variables using this command. Then that's what Phoenix was asking about. 
which is some parameters here that we will get to talk about a little bit. So the first parameter to create our index is a name, of course. I can't share the GitHub repo in the comments. I don't know why. But I encourage you all uh, to go to um, let me see. Can you go to the last link that says bit.ly forward slash rag dash sk dash cosmos dash vcore? This URL has, I don't know how can I, oh. okay. Uh, so this URL has steps that I'm doing right now, but it won't have the explanation for the code that we will get to do right now. Thank you. Now, it has the repo too. Uh, look for the repo down at fork uh, repo step two, I guess, or step three, I can't remember. So now, we have this one. Uh, what, what were we saying? So we were saying, yeah. So we are using the text embedding EDA, and this text embedding EDA generates a bunch of numbers. These numbers have a specific dimension, okay? And we need to give these dimensions to our index to know the lengths of our vector embeddings. Thank you, uh, I don't know who shared it, Isaac. And also the number of lists. So this number of lists and is the number of IVF clusters. Oh, by the way, uh, we are not going to specify that we, we need an IVF type of cluster. There are two types, there are HNSF, uh, which we will get to use today because the semantic kernel has a function, a built-in function that creates the index with IVF. So we don't have the option to specify the type of index. Uh, the only one available is the IVF index. So we will be using IVF index and it has something called a number of clusters of search that gets created. So we are going to specify it in the number of lists. The similarity, there are different types. We will use cosine. You can experiment with L2 and IB, Euclidean distance, and you can read this article to learn more about the different types of similarities. After that, semantic kernel makes it really easy, by the way. Um, here, this is a function. It's a helper function. It does not do anything rather than adding the data. And let me show you the data. I already showed it to you. So this is the data again. But uh, what we are doing here is that we are reading this file line by line and checking if it exists on the database. And if it doesn't, we save it. And these are some fancy uh, loader that will appear in the comments uh, or in the output of the cell when we run it. So then we initialize the semantic kernel, of course and we import the chat completion and the text embeddings because we are going to use them. And registering or adding a service to the semantic kernel is as easy as that we say kernel.add service. Then we give it the service with the deployment name, the endpoint, the ABI key, and all of that. And we are going to add our two services, embeddings and chat, and then this is the code that creates the database and container and vector. It is built in the semantic kernel. As I told you, under the hood, it's using by Mongo connector to do that. But what we get is that it creates everything for us. We just uh, say Azure Cosmos DB memory store to create. And there are two types of memories in semantic kernel. The store, which is our database, and the memory which is the semantic kernel uh, memory, not the database. So differentiate between these two things. In 0.3 seconds, it created the container. The container and everything is working. Now we are going to add it to the semantic kernel memory. So we are adding our data store to the memory. Then we will generate the embeddings. By the way, the semantic kernel will generate the embeddings for us and save it to the memory. Look, it's generating embeddings and saving new data. This is the fancy loader that I told you about. 
So now it's 107 records that got added. This is happening live. If I run it again, and I say it's killing because item already exists. <laughs> then if we go up there, let me show you something here because I want to show you. If we are just calling memory with save information. You give it the collection name, the ID, the text. And this text is where our embeddings get generated from. This text maps to the content here field, which is the biggest data I found here. So I took it and I'm generating embeddings based on it. Now we did create our database. We did register our memory store. We registered our chat and embeddings model. Now what? Now we try vector search. So we just say memory.search. And memory is SK uh, memory or semantic kernel memory. That's it. You give it the collection that you want to search, which is the container containing your database. And you give it the query, which is just a question. What is other database for managed instances? And please drop your questions in the chat if you want. Uh, if you want me to try to ask it, uh, but like make it related to Azure services, please. Now we print this in a fancy formatted way, which we don't care about. All we care about is that it gives us the correct answer and it gives us the similarity or the relevant relevance score, because this is again vector search and it calculates the distance between vectors and gives us back the answer to how the vectors are related. Then we are going to define our prompt. And the prompt is what makes it only respond based on the relevant responses. It grounds our model. So what are we saying to our chat model? We are saying to it, you are a chatbot that can have a conversation about any related topic to the provided context and give explicit answers from the provided context or say, I don't know if it doesn't exist. And I am giving it a variable, a, which is the DB record, the database record that I return it here from the vector search and the user query. Then we will define a semantic function, uh, which will get triggered to do our chat. When we, when we define a semantic function, we need to define two more things. A template config, which needs the execution settings. These ex execution settings uh, is where we define how many number of tokens, the temperature, and because we don't want any creativity in the response, we want it to respond from the data. We are making it zero. The top probability, you can experiment with it. Uh, but I used 0.5, you can use anything. And then we define the variables here that will be sent to the semantic kernel that will be sent to our database and to our, it will be sent to the chat service to respond from. Now I run this cell and it says prompt is not defined. I guess I didn't run the cell for the prompt. Yes, please add your questions. So now it did work. And we define function from the prompt. Then let's see, does it work? It does, and it responds with a less and more relevant response, I guess. And now we are going to test everything out. So I'm going to invoke the vector search. We are going to invoke the uh, semantic kernel chat deployment based on the response from the vector search here. So we are going to send this to our chat service to respond from here. And uh, we print, that's it, let's see. So now here we can say, hello from Jupyter Notebooks. And it will respond, hi, how can I assist you with Databricks? <laughs> so you know why it said Databricks? Because Databricks is related to Jupyter Notebooks. And the thought I'm asking about uh, Jupyter Notebooks. <laughs> uh, what is Azure 
Cosmos, DB, or Mongo, DB, V, Core. And it's a full image there. And then let's say exit, and it's going to say goodbye. Now, all of this can be wrapped. If we don't have questions, let me show you something. So all I did to make a website out of this is what? You will get a copy, I guess, is what? I took all of this code. I put it inside a file, which is my rag file, surprisingly. And I am calling the functions here from my website. So when someone calls my chat, they say, do you want a vector search? High level steps. Um, wait. I guess you can find it in the bit.ly link. Okay, I think I guess I need to install it. Yes, I guess you will be able to access the video. Oh, by the way, what I'm doing right now is let me try uh, the bash script. Um, the front end is a symbol page, by the way. So if we go back here, okay. Uh, the front end is one page. It has job, some JavaScript that sends the request. And this is from Pamela Fox uh, Quick Start Chat. It's an Azure sample. It's called um, Chat Quick Start. I can't remember the name exactly, but it's a very simple JavaScript code and some HTML that you get to try to say, hey, and it responds back, hello, how can I assist you? And you get to choose Victor, and if you say, hey, it's gonna give you not found, I guess. Oh, A is related. Okay, let me try something more complicated. How, what is the best rental service in New York? Oh, <laughs> I guess my Victor search is not that good. <laughs> so if we try RAG, oh, if we try RAG, it should say, I don't know. Yes, I don't have an answer that is not related to the provided context. So now it understands my question. But if I ask my Victor, it's going to return any, anything related to it. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. If you, if you have any questions, I don't know if you have questions on that. OK, so. If you don't have a question, yes, we are being charged. Uh, this is my handle on social media. You can reach out to me with questions and you can definitely check the bit.ly link that I shared with you before. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, John. And we don't have any time for questions, but you were answering them during your presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, that was awesome. And I'm so glad we got to that working demo and a live demo. That's so brave. Uh, thanks for joining uh, Data Science Day. And we'll be Thank introducing you. our next guest now. Uh, thrilled for this talk, Nitya, hi. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yay. Oh my God, so that was such a good talk. talk. I feel like an imposter. Live demos, you're putting me after a live demo. Okay. I've seen you do your fair share of live demos too. So we're in for a treat. I don't know if we have a live one today, but people should follow you on all the socials because you always have such cool stuff going on. Um, yeah, I'll get out of your way. Can you all hear me okay? Awesome, I'm going to get started. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Nithyan Arsaman. I'm a senior AI advocate on the developer relations team at Microsoft. But I'm actually here today because I want to get you excited about learning data analysis and visualization, even if you're not a Python developer or a data science expert. 
So before I get started, though, uh, let me actually share a link. So if you can, feel free to go grab this link and bookmark it, or you can fork the repo right now. We're not going to be able to obviously go through the whole repo right now, but what I will be doing, and I'll share the link at the end of the talk, is releasing a series of seven posts starting tomorrow, where we will have a tutorial for each one of these one a day. So my goal today is really to get you excited about wanting to go and explore this on your own. But we always have to start with this fundamental question, right? I mentioned that this is about jumpstarting a data analysis and um, visualization journey. But why would you do that if you're a developer? So why should you learn data analysis? Now, if you know about the whole kind of revolution that's happening in AI today, you probably know that everything starts with data. Data analysis drives machine learning models, which power AI algorithms, which are then driving these generative AI and predictive AI experiences. So if you're a data scientist, then data analysis and visualization is a must-have skill. But what if you're a developer? Trends are showing that there's been a shift left in this application cycle that you see here. This is a data science cycle at a very high level. And the shift left is because we're beginning to see things like responsible AI, where we really want to detect and mitigate harms very early in the development cycle rather than wait for post-production. And so if you pick this up as a developer, if you know the terms, ter technologies, the techniques, it's going to add value to you in your team. But if not, do it just because it's fun. So when you what stops you from learning? When you want to learn something, there's usually two things that stop you. One is what I think of as the knowledge gap. It's when you know you don't know something, but you kind of know how to get that knowledge. And usually developer tools help here. Like if you know if you have the right tools, the right tutorials, you can get where you need to be. The hard thing is the intuition gap because there are people who've been in this space for like decades. They know everything. How are you going to even meet that level of knowledge? You don't even know what you don't know. So where should you start? And this is where I want to kind of talk about how AI assistants can help you build your intuition. So the bottom line is you take just one thing away from the stock because it's really targeted at beginners and people who haven't worked with any of these tools. I want you to think about this, not just for data science, but for anything. If you want to learn to do something today, our old kind of like imposter syndrome is I don't have the experience. I can't do this, right? But I want us to shift the mindset to wait, you know what? There's developer tools to help me and there's AI that I can ask. So where do I start? And so my whole goal today is really to give you a roadmap that tells you where to get started. But I want to say one more thing. We can't go into this wanting to boil the ocean. You can't come up with 10 years worth of experience in a day. So what we really want is to think about a development environment and a roadmap, which has three things. First, I want to make sure that this journey is frictionless. That means that when I get started, let me get productive really quickly. How many of you have been at these workshops where someone says, here's a tutorial, here's a prerequisite, get started. And you're like, it's not working on my Mac. And the person next to you goes, well, it works on my machine. That's a problem. We don't, we need to have the way to kind of like get past that hurdle of setup. Second is we want to keep it focused. Every time you want to learn something, what do we do? We go to Stack Overflow or Google, but what does that make of us, right? We are like, oh, let me Google this. You start looking, you get into this rabbit hole, an hour later, you don't have an answer, but you're reading something else. Instead, we want to be goal focused. How do I keep my learning in the context of what I'm doing? I learn what I know, what I need, when I need it. And last but not least, let's make it friendly. And what I mean by this is that any environment I use, I want it to be shareable. I want it to be something that I can tap my friend and say, hey, I'm having this problem. Can you reproduce it and help me? Or maybe like, hey, I need this done and I know you're good at this. Can you collaborate with me on this? So, right, we don't want to be in this place where we're like, I need to write notes and remember what I did so I can tell you. So if you remember that one thing, I kind of want to dive into this roadmap for what I want to talk about today. If I do my job right, I'll have kind of given you a sense of what tools you can have from start to end. And starting tomorrow, you can go dive into these hands-on. So let's first start with frictionless. I need a consistent development environment with easy setup. And you know where I'm going with this if you're familiar with the space. That's code spaces. If you're not familiar with this, GitHub actually has a code spaces Jupyter template that I hugely recommend. But if you fork my repo, you'll notice that I actually extend that template. And in my repo, there's a branch called Data Science Day 2024. 
Um, if you do plan to fork it, make sure that you uncheck that little blue mark so that you're getting the version that's for this, this particular uh, event and not the main branch. But my point is, whether you take this repo or you take that template, you're going to start with a template that has something called a dev container. And to run it, you simply drop the code box down, switch into the code spaces tab, and say launch. And within seconds, in your browser, you will have a tab with a Visual Studio Code environment and your environment set up. That simple. You didn't have to install stuff. You didn't know depend nothing. You jump started your setup really quickly. And if you're like me, because GitHub Code Spaces does have a quota, and if you use Code Spaces as much as I do, uh, it kind of runs out. So you can also do the same thing on your local machine. Simply clone that repo to your local device and open it in Visual Studio Code. And if you install the dev container extension and you have a Docker desktop running, you will see a pop-up like that says, would you like to reopen this in container? Say yes, and you should see this. If you got this far, congratulations, you now have a development environment where you can start your data science journey and start playing with some of the ideas we'll talk about today. Now, I'm not going to do live demos because I've had enough issues today, but I will tell you that I am uh, running that same environment here in Docker desktop. So where possible, we'll keep switching back and forth to look at it, but I have screenshots just in case. So what this is doing for you is giving you a pre-built environment that works the same for everyone. You see the same thing that I do. But how does that work? Like, why is this important? So under the covers, dev containers, and if you remember one thing, remember this, it's configuration as code. What makes it awesome is that that configuration is actually defined in this one file called devcontainer.json. And it says, hey, please use this container image from Microsoft, which has environments for Python, Java, .NET, everything. And when you run this container, please go ahead and look at this requirements.txt file for all the dependencies I need you to install it. And that's it. The beauty of this, is that if I were to have a new requirement tomorrow, or if I want to add another, uh, change my image, I just have to change that file. The next person who forks that repo is going to get that environment. They didn't have to do anything to upgrade. So what configuration as code does is it makes version controlled environments so everybody sees the same thing. So how does it work, cloud or uh, local? There is a container that's running. If you are in GitHub code spaces, it's running in the Azure cloud. If you're using Docker desktop, it's running in your Docker desktop on your device. And in that, there is a VS Code server. So your VS Code client can now connect to that server, whether it's from your browser tab or whether it's from your local VS Code. And now your VS Code environment, which is your editing environment, and the runtime are sharing a file system which contains your source. And if you're on the cloud, it's your GitHub repo. And if it's your local device, it's your clone repository. But effectively, you are now set up with a Visual Studio Code environment, a dev container, everything exactly the way you want it. Great, let's move on to the next thing. Our next problem is I need this reproducible. If I want to share this with someone else, I need them to know what I did when I did it. Remember I told you we're using a Codespaces Jupyter template? Tool number two is Jupyter Notebooks. If you're not familiar with it, Jupyter Notebooks are an interactive environment that has code cells and documentation cells. So not only can you write your Python code, but you can write documentation right above it so you remember what you did. And if you were to have taken that code spaces Jupyter template, as you can see here, it comes with these three things out of the box. Three notebooks that you can use to get started on your journey. The first one is matplotlib, and we're looking at it right here, which teaches you just the fundamentals of using matplotlib, which is the most popular library for 2D data visualizations. So I'm going to switch over for a second. Demo gods help me. This is what you do. I'm not doing anything at all. I grab the notebook. I basically set this kernel. And this kernel is Python 3 because my dev container is already set up to use it. And then I simply, I'm going to clear all this. And then I'm going to run all. And what this is doing is it's running this code for me in this notebook and showing me the output. I can go in and I can do things like change it. I can say, OK, let me add one more, rerun this, and it should change. So I can play with this interactively and run this environment. And again, no effort on my part. This particular tutorial teaches you very basic uh, kind of functions from pipe, from matplotlib for plotting. But wait, there's another notebook you can look at, which is the second one on here for population.ipnb. We already did this part, so I'm going to look at this. So the second one, if I go look at that notebook over here, it looks similar because it's, oh, let's clear this again and run it, but 
it looks similar because it's really just running then kind of showing you how to visualize something, but there's something different. It's loading data from a file. And that is where we are introducing a second library called Pandas. Pandas is the second Python library that you really must know. It helps you with data manipulation, data gathering, cleaning, etc. And it'll work with other libraries like Seaborn and Matplotlib to actually help you visualize it. So you have an example there to get you started. And it's really simple. So what you can do in here is you can go in there and change that file. Just, you know, this is how you learn. Go in and change the file name. To make your life simple, I've put a little data folder here with the little data files. You're stuck with this file because I love Cricket. So you're going to learn more about Cricket than you ever knew. But you can bring your own CSV file if you want. Go ahead, change it. Do nothing else. Change it and say, can you run this and then change just the x-axis and values? So you're experimenting as you go. And you'll see you get this crazy plot. You're like, well, the good news is I made a change and it worked. The bad news is I have no idea what this code is doing. So now we want to get to the next step. How do I build my knowledge? Like, okay, tools are going to help me get there, but I still need to know what I will have to ask them to do. This is where GitHub Copilot can help. So we're, I think there are deep dive sessions coming up later today. So Copilot is a paid offering, uh, but you can have a free trial to try it out. And what it's really doing, you can install it uh, using dev containers or just add it on the fly. What it does is it provides AI assisted explainers, debugging help and et cetera under the covers. It's an LLM that knows how to do code completion and understands code. Just know that you can use it in two modes. Inline mode is where you open up Copilot on the right side inside a particular file. So it sets the context to that action that you're doing. And now you can use inline mode to ask it to explain something in there, fix a bug, et cetera. Or you can move into chat mode and say, the context is the entire workspace I'm in. And I love chat mode because it has powerful features like allowing you to create new, new notebooks to help you learn. Remember, we just looked at pandas. That looked nice, but it was like two lines of code. I want to know what pandas does. So I'm going to go over to Copilot chat and say, hey, can you create me a new notebook that teaches me about pandas usage? And when I hit enter, it created this. So if you go into my repo, you'll actually find, I think it's under, uh, sorry, under Copilot here, actually. So it created this. This was the first one that I changed. And when I asked it to create me a notebook, it created this for me. It did everything. And now I can say, hey, I want to run this. And I've left it exactly the way it created it so you can get a, uh, a sense of what it does. There will be errors. But it is beginning to give me some in, like you know interesting stuff. But then there's an error. And I'm like, I don't even know how to fix it. So it references the file. You can go and play with it. See if you can figure out how to fix the error. But the most important thing that I want you to look at when you use Copilot is that every time you ask it a question, it gives you a suggestion at the bottom. And those suggestions are how you expand your intuition. Remember I was saying, you don't even know what you don't know? Well, now you know what you don't know. So when you ask a question, it kind of is telling you, if you ask this, chances are there are these three things you didn't know about, you want to learn them as well. So I asked about visualizations. It says, do you want to know about this particular visualization? And if I dive into that rabbit hole, it says, do you want to know how to make that visualization? So build intuition by using Copilot as your inline coach. And remember, through this whole process, I never left. I never went to Google. Whatever I was doing, I was doing it in a goal-oriented way, moving myself forward. And last but not least, it's also a great way for you to explore your expertise in prompt engineering. Remember, I'm still chatting. And that means that my result is only as good as the prompt that I give it. One of the value propositions of having Jupyter Notebook is you want to be able to document the prompt you used when you created these things. And then later on, you can come back and refine it. And every time you refine it and you learn something, you document it. Not only will you be building your own knowledge base, but tomorrow, if you're sharing it with a friend and asking them to debug, they can reproduce it. So great. Remember that it has markdown cells and code cells. So that's good, right? We're buzzing along. Oh my gosh, we've got a development environment. We've got a interactive runtime with documentation. I have somebody to help me answer questions. And by the way, I'm not going to depth because there are sessions that will take you into like details of how do you use Copilot. But I know now I have somebody who can help me. What more? Well, remember that the dev container sets up your backend environment, your runtime. But it's still being connected to from a Visual Studio Code editor. Is there any way I can make my Visual Studio Code editor more productive for me uh, and make it shareable, perhaps? If you don't know about Visual Studio Code profiles, now's the time for you to go look at them. A Visual Studio Code profile is 
yet another thing that you can check in, you can export it and check it into your code base. Somebody else can then import it into their Visual Studio code to set the profile. And now you're both seeing the exact same editor experience. But what do I want you to do if you're starting off? Visual Studio code profiles help you set the extensions, the settings, the preferences, your look and feel of your editor. But wouldn't it be nice if it kind of knew that for data science, I need certain things? Well, yes, there is a data science profile. When you create a profile, and you can see it at the bottom here, click the little gear, pick a profile, oops, and say create a profile. And when you create it, you get choices. You can say derive it from the data science one, and I get a data science one. And part of that is a data wrangler extension. And that data wrangler extension, the minute I install it within my notebook, I will now see a little button that says, do you want to open this data in data wrangler instead? And that opens it up in an extension. And there is a session later today that will go into detail. So I won't go into detail here. But what it means is I'm seamlessly going from Jupyter Notebook into a data wrangler extension. In that extension, wow, look at this. It lets me say, hey, do you want to edit it? Why don't you tell me what operations you want to do to clean and fix the data? interactively low code, and I will write the code for you. And you can apply it, see if that fixes it. And then if you want, you can take it back to your notebook. So this is brilliant. Now I have a really good environment. Like I've got everything. We're all done, right? No, we're not, because I'm showing you this with Cricket. And I'm not, I'm sure a lot, like at least in the repo, it's Cricket. You don't know Cricket. Or maybe you want to like explore data science for a particular reason, like climate change. You want to understand how is you know carbon data, uh, how do I analyze and visualize that? Well. Where do you start? So I want to talk to you about three resources where you can find open data sets. When I say open, I mean these are curated data sets that are publicly available. Doesn't mean open uh, as in free. They will have licenses. Please pay attention and make sure that you attribute them. But the main thing in this is that you have sources that give you data science related data sets. Kaggle, everybody knows, is a great starting point. The most important thing for me in Kaggle is not only can I get a data set, but I can get community generated notebooks showing you how to analyze the data set that you can learn from. So in here, I keep talking about this uh, Cricket data set. Well, I go to the community and someone's already built a data, an exploratory data analysis notebook that I can use to understand, well, oh, that's, that's cool. So this is how I do a pie chart. Is that right? Okay, this is how I do a stack chart with colors. So I can learn from them. But wait, there's more. Not only can I find data analysis notebooks, I can find machine learning notebooks that use the model, I mean, that build models based on the data. So here, there's actually someone who's published a notebook that can predict cricket scores using this data. So you see how we kind of use these resources to keep expanding our knowledge path? Second resource, Hugging Face. Now, Kaggle is great for like when you've got curated data sets, you're just starting off. But then you want to get into deep learning. You want to look at what's happening in the large language model space, perhaps. You want to look at different types of use cases. Hugging Face is an open source community, and they have a really huge collection of data sets curated by the community. But more importantly, they have a data sets library, and they have tutorials that can really, really help you get this done. And over the course of time, I'll be adding all of these dependencies with notebook examples into that repo. So keep an eye out for that. Last but not least, there is Azure. So if you looked at those, but at some point you want to really think about production, you want to you want to change your mentality from hey I'm working with community curated data sets to a big data mindset. How do I actually integrate this into pipelines? How do I take it from like this analysis into scale? And this is where Azure Open Data Sets can kind of give you examples for real application domains with some of the Azure stuff that you might need to work them. So great. I think we're doing good on time. So I'm going to take a minute to tell you one of the most important things. And now this is really a speed round of developer tools. Like I said, keep the repo and watch for blog posts for step-by-step -step analysis for each one. But we're coming to the point where we're saying, great, you've learned all this stuff. But what is important if you start putting this in practice in the real world? So the next tool I want to talk about is responsible AI. So, or Responsible AI Toolkit. So Responsible AI is this uh, kind of like set of principles that's trying to safeguard how we use AI in the real world to make sure we do no harm. And that means there are six AI principles, transparency, accountability, fairness, safety. How do we ensure that our models, our analysis, our AI algorithms are all being responsible in their usage? And when you think about this, you really want to step back and think about it in two, two, two ways. One is I'm using the data to create a model. 
So I want to make sure that one, the data that I used is fair and covers all the demographics that might be using that model or might be using a, or might be forced to take a decision from that model. I want to make sure that the error rate for different demographics is the same, meaning that there isn't one demographic that gets a better deal from this algorithm. And then when I've built this model, when I've looked at the data and made sure that my model is fair and responsible, I want to go this extra mile and say, this is just a model, but that model is going to actually be deployed into an AI system where it's going to have a prediction that's used to make a decision. Am I making the right decisions? How do I debug that? So there's things like decision-making support in this toolkit where you can do counterfactual analysis. You can basically do what if analysis, say, what, what would happen if I did this? And so that particular site has Jupyter notebooks that you can pull in and explore. And then when we get to this point, this is going to be my favorite thing. All the stuff I've been telling you, use tools, learn the stuff. This is the traditional way. But we're in the realm of generative AI. What if I could take all this away from you and say, hey, just bring your data and ask questions and it shall happen. This is the latest. I mean, this is actually a tool from research called Lida and one of my favorites. And I, I would love for you to go explore it from Victor De Beer and Microsoft Research. And what it is, is it's an open source project that will visualize the data in a given data uh, file using natural language and large language models. And what it'll do is you don't need to know anything about data. It'll help you, it'll help you understand the shape of the data. It'll summarize the data for you. Say, oh, based, you just gave me a file. Let me tell you what's in that file. Then let me tell you what kinds of things you can learn from the file. And then let me tell you for anything that you wanted to learn, let me tell you how many different ways you can visualize it. Want to see how that works? You can actually go run the thing. This morning I had issues because there was some uh, there was some problems with uh, I think it's working now, but you can see the goals running. Yeah. So this morning I had some issues with OpenAI, but you can go check it out. What you need for this is an OpenAI key. And one of the benefits of doing this in GitHub Codespaces is if you go to Codespaces, you can just create a new secret key and then associate it with the repo that you forked into. And now when you launch Codespaces, that key is just available in the environment. You don't need to do anything. But if you're like me and you're using Docker Desktop, just make sure that you make a copy of end copy and put those uh, parameters in there. But here is what Lida can do for you. So I put this warning because this morning I had some issues with OpenAI, but I'm just going to walk through what you can do. You just come there to Lida and say, here is my CSV file. What is it? Can you tell me what the shape of this data is? And it summarizes and says, well, I found these columns, these fields. And so far, this is kind of traditional, nothing new, except that I didn't have to go and use a library. I just asked. But then it gets interesting. Remember, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm like, hey, OK, this is great. I know the shape of the data. But what is it that I can ask? What, what kinds of insights can I get from this? Generate goals for me. And it comes up with, here are some questions that this data could answer for you. This is cricket. What is the distribution of the first innings? What is the distribution of scores? And not only that, it tells me, hey, for this question, I'll even recommend a visualization and give you a rationale for why that's a good visualization to explain it. And so I can actually build on this and say, you know what? Because this is natural language and it's open source, I can say, but wait, this is cricket. I don't want to know everything. I want, I'm, I'm a Mumbai Indians fan. I'm that team's fan. I want a persona set to a person who loves that team. Now tell me what my goals are. And you'll see the goals now change to reflect that persona. Then I can say, hey, show me how to visualize the data. You said that for the goals, I could visualize them. And it says, here you go. Have not done anything yet. I've literally just been asking the library to do this for me. Then I can say, but wait, I, there's a goal that I didn't see. I'd like to... I'd like you to come up with a visualization for it. This is my query. What's the frequency of task decisions based on team? And says, so, sure, here, here you go. So I can, in natural language, did I know what that meant? No, I'm literally asking, how do I get this? And it generates this for me. Remember, Copilot can do this too, but I would have to know how to frame the question. I'd have to know what to ask. And also, if I wanted to customize it, I couldn't. But it's still a great place to start. You just have two options. I can work prompt engineering into the query. Not only can I ask it, hey, I've got my own question. But I can be like, change the color, put this axis, everything in natural language. I didn't need to know the functions. But I can go further and say, you told me these goals, but I want to know why. Why did you pick them? I'm not sure what the explanation is for this. 
And I can say, hey, for I, I like that question. Can you tell me four different ways I could visualize it? So I think I'm almost out of time. So I'm going to kind of wrap up really quickly towards the end. But the goal that I'm trying to say is your, your journey should be first get started with an environment then get assistance to help you explore it and be fearless about changing things. Get data, look at the community, learn from them. Make sure you're always thinking responsibly. Then start using generative AI tools to see if you can do this with natural language. And when you get there, you can start thinking down the line about the paradigm shift. All the things we're talking about fit into the traditional machine learning op cycle, where you're really generating a predictive AI application. But when you're moving to generative AI and natural language, that changes. So do you want to know how to build these kind of apps? Well, you're in luck because this week we are also releasing a series of five posts and go to that site and that will walk you through end to end development of a production grade retrieval augmented generation app using a Python SDK on Azure AI Studio. So that's yet another thing that you can try out. And last but not least, what can you do next? At this point, if you fork the repo, go haywire. Just go and extend it. Add your own packages. Every time you see a tutorial, drag it in there, put a notebook, start playing with it, add the requirements, keep maintaining that environment so that you can continue to learn. So in conclusion, we started with three goals. Make it frictionless, make it focused, make it friendly. We talked about tools that can help us. And with that, I'm going to leave you with the last two resources. This is what we kind of covered today. And this is my schedule of posts for the upcoming week. You can go to that URL um, and check out for a post tomorrow. Or just if you fork the repo, I'll make sure that I update the readme with links. And there will be a post today in that series that will kind of dive into one of those tutorials. And if you want to keep in touch uh, with what's going on in the space, there is also this link to a collection that I set up that I will continue to keep updated with latest tools, tutorials, and more. And uh, with that, I hope I am, I know I'm a little bit over time, but hopefully uh, it was okay and I missed all the questions. So Don and Sujit, if, if I miss something, please let me know. Uh, oh, and I have a, a typo, so I probably should not show that. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Oh, are you muted? You're muted. No, thank you so much for, for the awesome session. Everybody was asking if this will be recorded and available afterwards. So thank you for oh, an awesome session. And I think we've been trying to answer some of the questions that were on here uh, in the chat um, throughout okay. the session, but we did have a few questions that we did want to ask. Um, so as for next steps, um, uh -huh. you said, try it out and might go to my repo and then create your own code space. Uh, when you're creating the, the code space, is there a particular like compute size that people should be um, selecting? Not at all. Uh, I actually suggest that you do the code space, the default one, just to get through the exercises that are there. But if you're going to use Docker desktop, uh, like, like the way I am, you can scale it up if you start trying to do machine learning things. So on for the basic stuff that I'm doing, the, the free tier of GitHub code spaces is more than enough. That said, what I would, what I would encourage you to do is pick a data set, like try looking at different data sets. Um, I'll also park that whole conversation in a corner and say, we love code spaces, but if you want to, there are other tools you can use to go explore the stuff out. Azure also has like, you know, GPU based environments that you can look at, but yeah, from code mm -hmm. spaces, lowest tier should be fine. Do you now use code spaces in most of your cases now, or do you ever <laughs> use your local machine at all? Like, <laughs> no, yes, I do. Do you want to know why I have to do my demo on Docker desktop? Because I ran out of my free tier of code spaces. I absolutely <laughs> ran out. 14 days before. And so I'm like, oh my God, but this is the beauty of it. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll keep on Docker desktop. And yeah, I use it all the time. Uh, that is a good good thing you brought up. You can set up um, automatic kind of like guard so that you don't run it forever. If running it like it, it, there's free quota, but if you use it up, it's gone. But yeah, I use it everywhere. And I'll tell you one additional thing. I use it with my 15 year old who's in high school. Because one of the things you want to do is you want to stop people wasting their time in setup. You want them to get into the learning, right? And this will help. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for being on here and for answering all the questions. Sounds good. Thank you all for having me. And I get extra bonus points because I am wearing a pie shirt for pie day. Yes. So. <laughs>
<laughs> happy Pi Day. <laughs> happy Pi Day. Thanks for having me and happy Data Science Day to all. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we have about two more minutes uh, until the next lightning talks. Um, so thank you everybody for being engaging already. We had a pretty good stream of people like sticking around and 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 chatting in the chat. And so yeah, the um, stream's been like popping the whole time. I'm so excited. <laughs> awesome. Um, maybe I'll use the, the two minutes to kind of talk about some of the new like VS Code notebook experiences that we've implemented. Um, notebooks is a huge part of the data science workflow. Um, and we did want to quickly touch on some of the new features that maybe you don't know about, um, especially the experimental ones. Um, so we wanted to talk about the go to symbol. So what we've been doing in VS Code is trying to bring the native VS Code experiences into notebooks um, because some of these things like go to symbol or search to uh, search and replace, like those kind of things were working in every part of VS Code except for notebooks for a while. Um, now those both of those work. Um, and uh, if you have instantiated your variables for your notebooks uh, in your kernel, um, now you can actually see them in the run and debug panel um, on the left side, uh, or I guess on the right side, if, or wherever you have. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's VS Code. Really I always keep mine on the left, but I have seen some where you dock it on the right, and it just yep. blows my mind. But yeah. Yeah. So you can you can see that through there. So it looks a lot more native um, and like in sync with your normal VS code flow. Um, and then also uh, you can do a little bit more customization. It might sound silly, but I know some folks are, are very adamant on indentation. So like, is it uh, tabs versus spaces and how many spaces is tabs? Like you can customize that in notebooks as well. Um, and then as a feature, an ex experimental feature that I really like um, and, and, and I, I would love your feedback on um, is running dependent cells on a target cell. So if you're on a target cell and you say, hey, I want to run this on a, or I, I want to run all the cells that this cell depends on um, from above. Um, so you can actually mm. now do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yep. You could, um, if the link is going across the bottom of the screen, uh, aka.ms forward slash VSC hyphen notebook hyphen feedback. That's cool. I haven't heard about that one yet. So that one, you actually do have to turn it on in the settings, and I will okay. put that in the chat um, because it is an experimental feature. Cool. Um, but yes, please, even if it's not about that, please give us feedback, comments, and everything through through that link. I love um, our use of experiments in VS Code. Yeah. <laughs> it's a way that, so I mean, I, I talk with you PMs, and, and Luciana does them a ton, uh, but you're able to turn on this particular feature and then open up the, the mm -hmm. number of users so you can roll it back if you need to, yep. but you also get to like try that experience experience out. It's really user focused. I love that. Yeah, and we have a uh, we have very gracious users who are allow us to do that as well. Right, right. to an experiment. With you and you can also turn the experiments off if you're just not interested. So what I yep. do is I have VS Code Insiders, and I try to code with VS Code Insiders yep. all the time. But I've also installed a VS Code uh, stable, the mm -hmm. like default, I guess, yep. at the blue icon versus the green icon. Yep. And in the green, I always include all my experiments mm -hmm. on, so I just have whatever. I yep. just get all the latest and greatest. Yep. Uh, cool. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we have a few lightning talks lined up now. Absolutely. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and play those for you? Yeah, let's jump in. Yep. Hello. Welcome to my session on getting started with Python using Data Wrangler in Microsoft Fabric. My name is Sandeep Pawar. I'm a senior Power BI architect at Hitachi Solutions, and I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. Today, I want to talk about a Data Wrangler feature in uh, Microsoft Notebooks. Data Wrangler allows you to use uh, a, a user interface experience in Microsoft Fabric Notebooks to work with or to create uh, Python using the UI. So if you're somebody who is new to Python, um, maybe you're coming from a Power BI background or some other background, or maybe you're just a business user um, and you want to explore that data in a notebook, using Python, but are not sure about how to get started with Python, Data Wrangler is a perfect tool for you. In today's session, what I want to show you is how easy it is for you to explore the data, transform the data, and then create new data frames using Data Wrangler. It is an integrated tool, so you do not have to purchase anything new or install anything. Microsoft Fabric offers you a wholly integrated experience on one single platform to get you started. 
as adv another advantage of this tool is if you're new to Python, you will be able to see the Python code that is created for you, which you can use to learn Python. So let's get started. So what I have done is in my, if you're new to Microsoft Fabric, uh, there are different types of uh, experiences that are available. Power BI is for business intelligence. Data Factory is for orchestration of the data. Um, and then down below here, you'll see you have data engineering and data science. You can go to data engineering or data science and create a notebook. I've already created a notebook called Data Wrangler, so I'll get started uh, with it. Now to uh, to clean the data, we first need the data, right? Um, so up here at the top, you'll see I have different languages I can choose from. So I'll select Python in this case, um, all the way and then just a little bit of Python code and say, okay, uh, I'm going to import pandas um, as aliasing as speedy. And this is a, um, uh, I'm just importing some data from GitHub. This is a business data. Let me zoom in a bit here. But this is some business data, as you can see, region, country, orders, total cost, profit, etc. And what I want to do uh, is I want to be able to change the data types or identify the data types, create new columns, aggregate the data. And ultimately, what I want to do is by each country and then year, what is the profit margin? In this case, if you notice, I don't I have the total cost, total profit, um, and then the order date, but I don't have the year and I don't have this. So how can we do this with uh, Data Wrangler? Well, the first things, um, we need to identify what are the data types here. So I'll go ahead and say df.dtypes, which will tell me uh, if I have the right data I need. And as we can see, I have region, country, item type. Um, the date is an object, meaning it is a string. Um, for a year, we need it to be a date. Um, and then the, the column that we want uh, ultimately is the margin, which I don't have in this case. What I can do is I can go to data and then pull down transform data using data wrangler and right away i can see there is a pandas data frame that's available for me to get started i can also choose how many rows i want uh, from this data so the options here are that i can choose df and then i can choose the first the last or the random sampling in this case i just have thousand rows so the, it won't matter uh, but if i wanted to i could just you know load 50 rows in this case um, just for the sake of demonstration i'll just go to first or let's go to random um, and then open this will launch a new ui as you can see where you will see the um you will see the uh, the data frame in a tabular fashion and there are different things uh, dif different components to this ui uh, on the left side here, you'll see different operations that you can perform. So drop duplicate rows, uh, format uh, at search. Then I see the data uh, here uh, in the columnar or tabular fashion. And then summary of the column that, um, that I select here. Now, as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, we, can, we want to change the data type as well. In pandas, as we see earlier, these uh, columns were loaded or some of the columns were loaded as object. If I select this first column, for example, the year, you'll see right away that there are seven distinct values. The country has uh, 185, item type is 12. Um, to reduce the overall size of the data frame and then to make it, for, for, to make it uh, fast enough for us to, uh, to work with this data, um, we can optimize this a little bit more by changing the data type, uh, meaning instead of the string or the object, we can convert that into um, uh, a category or data type. I can do that by selecting and then clicking on the three ellipses and then say change data type, which tells, but then I'm prompted that, hey, for region, what do you wanna do? And I can see the new data type as category. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, what we want to do is change a whole lot of these, right? So I can control and then select all of this. 
Um, rest of them are date time and then the other are high cardinality or these ones are all numerical. So they, we are good here and then I can change go to schema and then change the column type where I select. I want this to be a category and then as soon as I do that, notice here it generated the Python code. I can apply and as I apply, notice at the bottom here that I started with loading the data frame, then the changing of the column type. And as we do that, uh, the, the, the steps are highlighted and we see um, a negative here, meaning this is the original or the, yeah, this is the original column we had and this is the new column we had shown by the, the, the green sign. So you are always able to go back and forth and then uh, identify what transformations you've applied. And then plus on top of that, you're also able to see the preview of the steps that you applied um, and at the same time uh, look at uh, the, the Python code as well. Next, what I want to do is for the date column, so order date, uh, let's say I want to convert this into, um, uh, we want to be able to change this into uh, uh, the uh, date time, right? So I'll go here, change this to date. Uh, again, the same thing here uh, will be applicable. So I selected this column, uh, uh, this order date. So let's go order date and then the transformation again. Let's select this and then click on apply. So this created this. Now I want to be able to extract year from it. Um, there's a pretty handy function in here, which uh, you can do by new column by example. So what I'll do is select this and say new column by example, and this is my year. And I want, what do I want from it? Well, I can just type in by example, and then it is, you will see it is loading the operation preview, but it is intelligent enough to know that it, um, I want to extract the year from it uh, as I typed it. And yes, it does know that I want to extract the year right away. So, which is great. I'll click on apply. And the last part we need is we want to create a new column, which is the profit divided by cost to get the, the, the margin. So I'll go and then say create um, custom operation here. And um, actually, let's, let me go here and then I can say um, I want to create a new uh, custom operation, new column by example again. and or rather, let me one second. Oh, sorry, the formula. New create by formula. And in this case, I want to create a new column called margin where this is my data frame. And the column that I want is total profit. So this is something that if you have, uh, if you are have experience with uh, uh, Python already, you can use this uh, to create uh, new columns or apply um, uh, any transformations you need on top of that. So I'll go this, so which created the margin. And the last step we need is a group by. So I'll do a group by by operation. Mm, and I want to group by by, not by profit, but I want to do a group by by country and then year. And the aggregation that I want is by the margin and I want the mean of that and then click on apply. And now I'm done with all my transformations that I want. And then finally I can click on add code to notebook and there you go. We did not use, we just used the UI to come up with this transformation altogether just using the data wrangler. Um, and in the process, we can also scan this code and then learn how to uh, use Python. So hope this was helpful for you. Thank you very much. Hello and a warm welcome to the Python Data Science Day Body Driven Development Session. I am Bethany Jibchumba, a cloud advocate at Microsoft, and I'll be taking you through how you can incorporate 
AI into your development journey with um, your building your models or analyzing your data? How can you use AI to make you more productive, efficient, and to produce high quality work? I liken this to whenever I go to somewhere that I am unfamiliar with or somewhere that I have not, not been in in a while, I will ensure I will use maps to give me that sense of reduction. It not only prevents me from getting lost, but it also saves time. And in case I make an error and probably take one wrong turn, it will reroute and ensure that I still get to my destination. GitHub Copilot comes in handy and gives you an edge, gives you an edge by ensuring your productivity is increased, making you quite faster and better, quickly fix bugs and issues and errors you encounter, ensuring you're developing efficiently, and also ensure the quality of your work is top notch, and you're able to deliver work that is well documented, full of best practices, and you're proud of the work that you output, right? In this session, we have three main tools of trade. Of course, GitHub Copilot, our AI program, pair programmer that will enable us to help us as we code. GitHub Code Spaces, which is our cloud developer environment, making sure you do not have to download and install anything in our local machine, but comfortably work in the cloud. And Jupyter Notebooks, where we'll be writing our code. It's fun because you not only get to write your code, but you also are able to add text mark down and see the outputs of your code directly there, as well as adding images. So let's get started and see GitHub Copilot in action. First and foremost, this is our development environment. We have our code space open. Looks the same as Visual Studio Code. So it's a very familiar dev environment. We have our data, which is the Avocado CSV data, and we want to add our extensions. So to add our extensions, We'll search for Copilot extension and we'll ensure we have both GitHub Copilot and Copilot Chat. Copilot is our inline pair programmer and Chat is our chat, technically our conversational pair programmer, whereby you can be able to chat with Copilot and ask for anything that you might need. And one of the first things you might want to do is ensure you have a starter template whereby you have a notebook that you can get started from. So we have our data, uh, which is the Avocado CSV data, and we want to be able to predict the prices over a period of time. In our case, we'll be using the Freema model. So what we'll want to do is go in and um, ask our chat, okay, uh, chat, can you, in our workspace, create a new notebook to predict the prices of Avocados using the Freema model? And as you can see, it will come in handy and go ahead and create a new notebook for us. And our notebook will be sequentially developed in such a way that you can be able to see this will be the contents. One, import the required libraries, load and explore the data set, pre-processing, visualizing our data, and building our time series model and evaluating it at the end. So it gives us an overview of how our data will look like, and you can go ahead and get the option create a notebook and create a notebook. Once you created a notebook, you can be able to see the output, which is a very clean notebook that has contents that skill over time. So I've realized in my notebook, I'm looking at the visualizations and I'm not seeing a correlation matrix, and I want to be able to build that. So what do I do? I go ahead and use Copilot, the inline editor, and use Control plus I. Using Control plus I will enable me to request for something right on my code. So let's see how it is in action. So creating a new cell, Control plus I, then I ask you to create a heat map using C1 for only the numerical values in our data. And it generates the code for me once I accept. Yeah, and then I can run the code and voila, we have our correlation heat map. This is very interesting because it normally takes me a while to remember the exact commands I need. I know I, I need to have the data, uh, remove the numerical data, 
and be able to just call call, but the inline, how do I annotate? Should we annotation be true or false? And then you can also be able to experiment with it as you go further. Another thing is we've seen how you can use control plus I to generate code, but what about using comments? How can you use comments to generate your code? So what I want to do is to drop some of the columns. We have a lot of columns that we may not need. So I might want to drop some of the columns. So I'll go back, uh, slide, and create a new code and just add a comment. I want to drop some of the columns. Let me drop some of the columns. And I can list the columns. You can see as I list the columns I want to drop, it also suggests probably you should also add this column, total bug, small bug. It suggests the data, the code, the, the drop that I need to drop my data, and it gives me the output of simplified data frame that has reduced data, and I don't see the necessary thing. And next, I want to make sure uh, data is ready for a model. So we are just trying to predict the overrated prices. We will focus on one type of uh, avocado, either organic or conventional, in our case conventional. And then we'll also want to focus on a specific region. In our case, we'll choose the Albany region. So we want to be able to filter our data to only have conventional avocado types and the region Albany. So I'll go ahead and uh, try and do that, right? So you can go ahead, uh, create a new code, and try and fill us with. But as you can see, I'm making a mistake. I don't know if you can see the mistake, but I have made a mistake. If I run the code, it will tell me, um, no, you have an error. This needs to be fixed. So the error is I'm adding two float variables, which is not something that can be done. And the perfect thing about Copilot is I just need to use the start sign here. And it will tell me, okay, what do you want to do? You want to fix the error, the error that has already been written down there. Tell me this is the error you want to fix. Probably this is the solution. And once I accept the solution, I can go ahead and get my new data with field, my new data frame with a filtered set of data. So I've fixed the errors on the code. So when using came series, I decided to use a library, PDM Arima. And I forgot the name of the library. So I was thinking about it. I couldn't quite remember the name of the library. So I decided to just go to terminal and try something. Just try and install a library and see if it will go through. So I misspelled it by leaving out the A at the end. So it's telling me, no, you have an error. And I wanted to fix it. So it's asking, OK. Do you want to fix with Copilot? By clicking on the start sign at the end, gives me, okay, explain it in Copilot. It explains my issues, tells me how I can fix it. So I'm missing an A at the end. Do it again. And once I've been able to correct my mistake, you can see the output is the library is successfully installed. We but we've now been able to fix quickly fix errors and ensuring you are developing efficiently. The next thing is how is the output of your work? So the first thing we want to test is a model. So how do we validate a model? We've gone through our data, we've gone through the train and test data, but we want to add more validation. So I want Copilot to generate for me a random list of prices that I can use for validation. So let's see how it works. So I just ask, can you help me with a sample I can use to validate the prices and it's giving me ideas of, okay, this is what you can use. And if I add to my code, I can also have it there in the prices and be able to see, okay, is this data something, is this validation data right? Is the prediction okay? And so on and so forth. And then the next thing you might want to do is ensure your code is readable. You can also use chat and do slash docs, but then the other thing you can do is probably you already have an idea of what exactly the documentation you want to write is. So for me, I have a formula that I use. So you want to first explain the data, next explain the methodology, how did I solve the problem at hand, and then the next thing is give the results. What they solved, did I 
teach the accuracy. And lastly, conclusion. If you see what I've written, if I share it with an exec or someone who's not familiar with data science, they might struggle and wonder, okay, what does this mean? What does MSC MA mean? Why, why does it matter to me? What exactly is even an ARIMA model? So I can go ahead and go to Copilot chat and ask the question, okay, can you be able to modify the markdown for me and make it more readable? So it gives me a modification. And the fun thing is I can add it directly as code or markdown in whichever one you choose, can add it directly to my notebook. And you can continue iterating, continue trying and find new ways to be able to make it better. And last but not least, once you've been able to help create a documentation, you want to share your work with the world. So you might want to commit your work to your repository in the cloud, or you might want to do a good field request message. So in our case, we'll just work with commits. And if I generate a commit message, it gives me, okay, the commit message you can use is this is what you did, you will, trying to add avocado price prediction using a RIMA model, which is the last thing I did. Of course, I can't commit because I haven't staged my changes, so I'll go to terminal, do git add all the changes I've made, go back to my commit message and be able to commit it and sync it to the cloud. And voila, I can be able to share my work. That's just about it around what I wanted to share. One, being able to ensure your productivity is improved by coding much faster and better. Two, being able to ensure that you are also efficient. If you encounter a bug or an error, you're able to fix it as fast as possible. And lastly, being able to improve the quality of your work. But as with any technology, AI has a couple of limitations. These are limitations accompanied by GitHub Copilot. Number one limitation is the training data set. The data set that was used in training was very limited and it didn't technically cover the, your proprietary data or any private data that you have. So ensure when you're trying to ask a question, ensure you're able to give enough context. And the reason why you need to always provide context is because AI cannot read your mind. You have to be able to articulate what you might mean. And the other thing to remember is this is a statistical model. So how it works is it predicts the most probable text or chunk of text that's supposed to come up next. It does not really understand what you're saying, meaning it might be able to, it might sometimes give inaccurate responses or have potential biases. So ensure you always go through the results that you're getting, ensure you always go read through, ensure you always have someone who's double checking and being accountable for all the outputs AI is giving. Other than that, you can continue developing your skills with Copilot, go ahead and try it out. Uh, and then the other thing is we have GitHub Copilot Adventures, helping you explore the different Copilot ways and lastly, a cheat sheet of how you can use chat GPT and data science. Thank you so much for your time. As I mentioned, I'm Bethany Jepchumba, and you can find me on social media using at Bethany Jep. Bye-bye. Hello, hi everyone, and welcome to the Supercharging Your Data Science Project with GitHub Tools session of the Python Data Science Day. While celebrating Pi Day, we are going to explore some tools within the GitHub platform that can help us enhance our data science workflows. But before moving on with our topic today, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Carlotta Castelluccio, I'm a cloud advocate in Microsoft. Uh, I'm focused on machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies, uh, and I'm based in Italy. My job's mission is to help every student, developer, or entrepreneur succeed with AI by building innovative solutions responsibly. And to achieve this goal, I develop te technical content and host skilling sessions like this one, uh, hopefully enabling my audience to take the most out of AI technologies. 
Now, AI technology is advancing at a rapid pace, uh, bringing new innovations that are transforming our workplace. And one role that is being especially disrupted by these advancements is that of the data scientist. So the role of whom is building those AI models. Uh, data science is already an exciting field, uh, but new tools are taking it to the next level in terms of productivity and capabilities. Uh, with the help of these new technologies, data scientists can work faster and more efficiently than ever before. And in this session, I show you these advancements in action. To explore those innovations in tooling, uh, let's imagine we have been asked to create a predictive model to forecast the number of rentals for a bicycle rental business uh, based on seasonality and weather conditions. And to build such a model, starting from an historical rentals dataset, we're going to perform some data analysis and experiments in uh, a Python Jupyter notebook uh, on Visual Studio Code. And the secret source of the productivity boost uh, to our project is made by two main ingredients, GitHub Copilot and GitHub Codespaces. Uh, as you all know, uh, GitHub was born as a web-based platform based on Git and used for version control and collaboration on software development projects. Uh, but year by year, the platform has evolved a lot, becoming much more than that. And tools like Copilot are so key within the platform that GitHub CEO recently stated that just as GitHub was founded on Git, uh, today the org is refounded on GitHub Copilot. Uh, Copilot is an AI-empowered assistant embedded into the Visual Studio Code interface, but available also in other text editors and IDEs, uh, and offering inline suggestion as you code in different languages, uh, but also slash commands to accelerate repetitive tasks and the chat experience. It's based on an OpenAI large language model trained on data extracted by um, a high volume of public GitHub repository, and it's the most widely AI developer tool used today. On the other hand, GitHub Codespaces is a predefined development environment hosted in the cloud, uh, coming together with a seamless attached text editor, which by default is Visual Studio Code, uh, accessible via web browser. So you can even run your code uh, through a mobile phone um, if you can connect on the internet. Uh, by default, code spaces are created from an Ubuntu Linux image that includes a selection of popular languages and tools, but you can customize your project and configuration for, um, for all your users of your project. So this basically creates a repeatable code space configuration for all the users. Uh, let's see those things in practice uh, by jumping into Visual Studio Code. So first thing first, when we open Visual Studio Code, we have an empty workspace. I believe that starting a new project and setting up everything we need to work on it is probably the hardest part. An empty workspace might be intimidating. Once you get started, going ahead becomes more smooth. Now, before we can start writing our first line of Python code, or even start creating a new Jupyter notebook, we need to have the last version of Python installed on our local machine and the Python and Jupyter extensions installed in Visual Studio Code. And that's not all. Then we also have to install the, the Python libraries needed to explore, to clean, to visualize the data and the ones needed to train and evaluate our machine learning model. So lots and lots of installation prerequisites dependencies. Now, this set of prerequisites may vary from one project to another, and some of them might have conflicts and dependencies requiring some additional efforts to our data science workflow. Also, if we collaborate with a team of colleagues on the same project, they should replicate the same installation processing on their machines to be able to contribute to our code. But hey, don't worry, we are in 2024, we have artificial intelligence, we have GitHub Copilot, we have GitHub Codespaces. So let's see how we can leverage those tools. Once we have enabled GitHub Copilot chat in Visual Studio Code, 
We can interact with this built-in virtual assistant through a chat interface by asking questions in natural language or using chat agents. So from the sidebar menu, let's open the chat tab and let's work with agents. We can think of an agent as an expert. We can ask for support on a specific subject. Similarly to when we mention a user in the chat, we can use the add symbol to start interacting with an agent. And then to further define the scope of our request to the agent, we can also use a few slash commands. Let's do an example. So to create our workspace, we can use the agent at workspace, and then we can use the slash command slash new to specify that we want to create a new workspace. And then we can add some further description of how we want this workspace to be created. So we can add the description, a new workspace for a Jupyter Python notebook with the GitHub code spaces configuration, installing pandas, numpy and scikit-learn, which are some common libraries for doing data visualization, data analysis, and machine learning tasks in Python. So by sending this message to our workspace agent, we will get a suggested directory structure for our workspace project, including several files. First of all, the devcontainer.json file into the .devcontainer folder, which is a configuration file for the GitHub Codespaces development container. If we open it, we will see that in this file, we will have, for example, the specification for the Docker image to use and uh, the extensions to install um, in the dev container. Then we have a Docker file placeholder where we can add a Docker file containing additional instructions needed to create the Docker container image. We have a requirements.txt file listing the Python packages to install in the development container that we will use in our project, like pandas, numpy, scikit-learn uh, and JupyterLab. And then we have a notebook template, uh, which is a template Jupyter notebook file importing uh, the requirements listed into the requirement.txt file um, and with some other things. So basically we have here one single cell, uh, which is a starting point, of course, for our notebook. It's not a complete notebook. Um, but still, it's a good starting point, right? And then uh, we also have a readme file, which is a placeholder file containing the documentation for, for the project. Now, by clicking on the create workspace at the bottom, the directory structure will be created locally and the files will be initialized with some basic content that we can customize for our scenario. Basically, we get a project skeleton that we can use to kick off our project, much better than a starting from a blank space or an empty workspace, right? But now, let me jump to my demo project workspace, where I've already added some customizations to these template files created by GitHub Copilot um, that uh, will allow me to show you some other cool stuff. So in my example of the data science project, uh, we want to build to forecast the bicycle rentals trend. Uh, to complete my container setup, I added my uh, Docker file in the uh, Docker file folder with the definition to by dev container image. Then I also customize the list of extensions in the devcontainer.json by adding the copilot chat and the GitHub copilot 
Visual Studio Code extension. In a way, these are installed when launching a new code spaces remotely because I want them to be there to support me in my data science workflow. And then I also added some further requirements to my requirements.txt file that I know I will need throughout my project. Of course, I also added my Python code to the Jupyter Notebook template. But before going into the details of the notebook, let me create a GitHub code spaces to execute it based on the configuration files we just explored. Now, to create a GitHub code spaces, you need first of all a GitHub repo, remote re GitHub repo. So you need to create a repo hosting your code remotely. You can do that directly on the github.com website or you can use the Visual Studio Code built-in features. Now, clicking on the source control button here, you see that my code is already linked to a remote repo. But if you are not connected to any remote source, you'll find a button here to initialize your repository with a graphical user interface. Once we have our code hosted in a remote repository, we can ask again support to GitHub Copilot chat to create a remote GitHub code spaces on top of our repository by opening again the chat window and using this time another agent which is called uh, Visual Studio Code and which is specialized on questions about Visual Studio Code facilities. Um, and then we can specify our question to the agent, which in this case will be, how can I create a GitHub code spaces on top of this repository using Visual Studio Code? This time, our expert agent uh, will return a list of instructions to achieve our goal. So you see, we have, uh, first of all, open the command palette, then type the create new code space com, co the create new code space command and so on and so forth. So let's follow the instructions uh, using the, the suggested keyboard shortcut. So opening the command palette from Control Shift P and then clicking on the code spaces create new code spaces command. Um, and we will get a list of repositories um, from the uh, GitHub account connected with uh, Visual Studio Code. So my GitHub account in this case, you can see that here I can basically pick the GitHub code, the GitHub repository on top of which I want to create my new code spaces. So once I select the repository, the creation process starts and we should wait a few minutes for the code space to be Created properly and open it within Visual Studio Code. But for the purpose of this demo, to speed things up, I already created a GitHub code space beforehand. So let's just check that we are connected to it from the Remote Explorer tab of, from the sidebar menu. Uh, here you can see all the specification, the details, the status of the connected workspace. Now that we are connected to our GitHub code space, we can have a look to our Jupyter notebook and execute it in our remote environment. What we can observe is that the kernel defined in the configuration file has been loaded successfully with the creation of the code space. And since this customized kernel is pre-configured with all the dependencies we need, uh, all the packages imported in the notebook can be used without the need of any further installation. Let's look at the code now. This is a very simple Python notebook with a few code chunks. Uh, the first code cell imports the data set of the history of bicycle rentals from a URL into a pandas data frame. This is the data, the data we'll be using throughout the uh, data science workflow. Uh, and then the other code cells perform data visualization to explore the distribution of, of the data uh, with a few graphs. And then we have the training and testing of a linear regression model to predict the future sales trend of the bicycle rentals. 
And finally, we have uh, the evaluation of the trained model using mean squared errors and other evaluation metrics. Let's now add a new code chunk to visualize the difference between the actual and the predicted values with a scatter plot, in which we have uh, the actual values of daily bike shares on the x-axis and the predicted values on the y-axis. So if I start type PLT, which stands for plot, and then dot, uh, you can see that GitHub Copilot starts suggesting me the completion of the code uh, in line. So by going over the gray text, which is the GitHub Copilot suggestion, I can select of, I can choose between accepting all the suggestion, accepting a portion of it, or just ignore it and continue with um, um, writing my own code. So in this case, uh, since it's exactly what I want to uh, write, I will go into accept the, the suggestion. So defining I, my uh, scatter plot with uh, the Y uh, test and the predictions values. Uh, and then you see that as I continue, GitHub Copilot continued to provide me with uh, suggesting the, um, the completion of, of the code. Uh, so defining the X label, Y label, the title, and so on and so forth. Uh, so if now I, um, you know, uh, complete my code cell and then I execute it, I get the desired graph. Note that um, GitHub Copilot is able to provide me with relevant suggestions here because the large language model on which it's based is augmented with my projects file. I have it opened in my workspace. But let me show you another thing. Let's imagine that by writing our code, we made a mistake. For example, by inserting a typo in the name of the um, Y uh, dash test array. Now, by executing this code cell now, I would get a name error um, exception, since there's not a find array is matching that name, right? Uh, in a case like that, GitHub Copilot can assist us troubleshooting the error. We just need to click on the fix using Copilot button, and we get an analysis of the error, along with the suggested code changes to fix it. Uh, in a layout um, very similar to the one of GitHub changes, GitHub edits. So uh, it, a kind of layout I'm, I'm quite familiar with as a GitHub user. And the same can be accomplished by using the slash fix uh, command in the inline chart that you can open uh, using uh, the Ctrl I um, keyboard shortcut. So you have the choice of using the button or opening the inline chart and use the slash fix command with additional specifications if needed. Now, once our code is fixed, there's another challenge we might need to face, documentation. Drafting clear documentation for our code is essential to make it readable when shared to collaborators, customers, and even for our future selves. It's hard to recall every single piece of the code we write without documentation, right? Again, we can accelerate this tedious and time-consuming process through GitHub Copilot. By selecting the piece of code of interest, we can then use um, a slash command in the chat window to generate the relevant documentation. The slash command uh, we are using this time is the slash doc command that helps us easily get the detailed description of our piece of code, uh, line by line, that we can use, for example, as the content of a markdown cell in our notebook, since Jupyter Notebook allows us to alternate code to markdown. So we can copy and paste it in uh, a markdown cell. Here it is. And of course, we can review it and uh, edit it, um, but for the purpose of this demo, we will just accept the output as it is. 
Uh, finally, by saving, my changes will be saved in code spaces, but not on the remote repository. Uh, this means that if I accidentally delete the code spaces or if it expires, I'm going to lose my edits. So I need to push my commits and to do that, I can use again a built-in Visual Studio Code functionality provided by the source control panel. Um, and there's another painful moment, right? When you need to add a description to your pull request. But you know what? You can now ask to GitHub Copilot to generate for you a relevant message for your pull request. And uh, you are all set with, you know, just one click. Here I had already a suggestion, but if I click again on the, uh, on the button here, I have uh, eight uh, this field populated with a, a new suggestion describing exactly um, the changes I've applied to my uh, project. That's it for our demo today. Let's now jump back to our deck to do the session wrap up. In this session, we provided some tips and tricks for data scientists to improve their productivity and enhance collaboration by leveraging GitHub tools. Uh, Python and Visual Studio Code. We covered how to create a reproducible workspace using GitHub Code Spaces and interacting with GitHub Copilot through a chat interface uh, to streamline project setups. We also demonstrated how GitHub Copilot provides inline suggestions, assists with debugging, and helps automate documentation tasks, ultimately improving the efficiency and effectiveness of data science workloads. Keep learning using the links provided in this deck. Uh, you can replicate the demo on your own since the code I used is available in a public repo uh, at the link you see on the screen. And uh, if you're going to try the prompts we used in, in the demo in your environment, be aware that you might get different results since the Copilot engine is a non-deterministic large language model. So for the same input, you uh, can get different outputs. And if you'd like to share your learning journey with AI enthusiasts like you, uh, join the AI community Discord server um, at the link on the screen and stay up to date. Thanks for joining and happy Python Data Science Day. Bye bye. Thank you so much for that talk. That was fantastic. I love that she ended with joining the Discord. You can also join the Python Discord. Uh, we have Discords and Discords and Discords here, but we're all we all love to hang out in there. You can chat with some of the Python extras, um, experts, and they hang out in both. So you could go to aka.ms forward slash Python hyphen Discord to hang out with us there. Um, but also we have more data science things for you. You can join our Cloud Skills Challenge as well. Uh, we have links below. Uh, make sure you're uh, figuring out all of the things that we're doing with Python at aka.ms forward slash Python. Uh, we have learned modules, curriculums, 14 days of data science posts, uh, more and more things for you to join in. Um, and I'm glad you're here with us today. It's been a really, really great one. So we have no more, more sessions. And I guess we're just going to jump in. Right Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Python Data Science Day on P-Day held by Microsoft. Today, we will be talking about streaming data preparation with Pydantic. Based on your CBAS, we are starting. I'm Hassan from Istanbul, Turkey. With over four years of software development experience, I have spent <coughs> two years in data analytics and engineering and rest of them as a software development engineer. Let's get started about Pydantic. Brief overview of Pydantic. Let's imagine a case where there's 20 million of rows, 300 columns, and you need to model, validate, and serialize this data to serve machine learning engineers, to data analytics engineers. And if you are working in a company where there is only 10 people, this case can come to you pretty inappropriate or unusual, but if you are working with, within a company where there is data going on every day on basis and like a 
if your main focus is data, that's a pretty usual case. In most simplest way, I can see any company order table pretty looks like this. What would you do in that case? How would you validate 300 columns? How would you model these 300 columns and make sure this serializable? You can serve as a relational or in JSON format. How would you achieve this goal? You can, of course, for each situation, write some custom functions. Would it be faster or not? Or you can just look into PyDantic. Most widely used <laughs> data validation library for Python. Fast and extensible, the interest suitable, and the most importantly, Pydantic defined how data should look like. You can define each constraint of your columns, like a mean value, max value, should it be string, should it include alphanumeric characters, does URL valid or not, everything already included in Pydantic. Just you need to learn how to use it. Why do we need to use Pydantic? Why don't we just write each time some user-defined function? Because of uh, if you are really good at Python, you may aware of typing packages, which is probably introduced after 3.6. And then with this library, you can define for each variable types. Like, uh, for example, you want your name variable should be string, or you want your, I don't know, number variable should be integer and so on. And this is basically limiting the user to type an other type. Of course, in Python, it doesn't limit, but in Pydantic, if you define your field type as a string, it's only except string and so on. And the other reason is, <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, do you really believe that your custom function would be fast enough? Like a, here we are talking about 20 million of rows, not like a 10 rows, etc. That's why it's a pretty challenging. Because Pydantic version 2, which is recently introduced, written by Rust, and it is, if you compare with the competitor, five times more faster than them. And the other reason, like uh, the JSON, JSON schema support, like uh, you can easily serialize any data which you map with Pydantic. You can dump in the dictionary for Python uh, primitive type, or you can <laughs> dump into no SQL suitable formats and so on. And therefore, of course, it's a serializable. And the other interesting facts, like uh, approximately 8,000 packages on PyPy published using Pydantic. Somehow they are dependent, maybe they're they are mainly dependent or maybe uh, indirectly. And uh, hundreds of organizations in the world using Pydantic, including fun companies. Like, uh, for example, OpenAI, NSA, NVIDIA, Microsoft, and so on. And if you ask me how Pydantic simply looks like, you can see on the left down, like uh, you define in a class where you inher inherit model from Pydantic.base model. And then you just write in your each field. Like, uh, for example, event should include, for example, title, date, is online sponsored by who, etc. And you just, like uh, in this example, as you may see, passing the, <coughs> sorry, I'm kind of uh, full. You just pass in the dictionary by using this double star. It's kind of dictionary unpacking. <coughs> Let's get into some numbers. Regarding the PyPy stats, uh, Pydantic has monthly approximately 150 million of dollars. And 90 of 25 Nasdaq companies actively use Pydantic in their daily developments. And it is one of the interesting facts because it's not common to see open source packages getting some investment. But recently, Pydantic received $4.7 million investment by Sequoia. And regarding the Sequoia, they are planning to extend capability of Pydantic and maybe publish on cloud, which is accessible more easily. And as I mentioned it earlier, it is brought in my Rust, so five times faster than uh, enemies or competitors, how you say. And if you are into software development, you may already know it. 
actively everyone developing up his microservices which return JSON or at the exam are going to be forgotten. <coughs> Let's dive into concepts of Pydantic. In the most simplest way, Pydantic has four different core concepts, like a models, wheels, serialization, and validators. What are the models? Models share many similarities as Python data classes with some important core differences, such as validation, serialization, JSON schema generation. And uh, mod models, in most simplest way, is a class where inherited from the Pydantic that base class. And if you ever wrote any code in C, you may it may look like a C struct type because in C also you almost define in the same type. And what I'm defining here looks like on here. You importing from Pydantic base model, you define in typical Python class and you just inherit them from base model. And in the down you are writing each field which is needed. And the other thing is a fields. Fields are function to use it to customize your field of your model. For example, you have a uh, name field in your model and just how you want the name should look like. Should it be string? Should it has how many character? Do you want some special requirement in your name? Like it should only have lowercase, alphanumeric, etc. And this is where you where you need to use field because you can add a lot of metadata and as well as capabilities and limitation to make sure your data look like as you want. <coughs> Other great feature of Pydantic is it will make your any data serializable. If you receive a JSON, you can easily serialize or like a, even if you didn't receive JSON, you, let's imagine that you get your data by scrapping via beautiful soup from different sources and you want to make it easily uh, accessible like uh, as a relational and so on. So you can just map with Pydantic and then convert to any type you want, like a relational, NoSQL, etc. <laughs> and if you ask me how field look like, you can see on the left, right down, like uh, you can add a lot of metadata as description, title, and you can add constraint, GT, min length, max length, etc., and as well as regex. And serialization, as I mentioned, it's, uh, you can easily switch your data to core Python dictionary or JSON and so on. And it is like a, just you need to write model that model underscore them dump or model underscore dump underscore JSON and it will be default uh, serialized. And the greatest another thing is a validators. Like a, like I say, let's even forget about the edge case. Let's think that just table with under throws three columns. And let's assume it's a ID name, no ID, URL, and email. <coughs> ID maybe is the easier one. You will write some simple min max constraint, but URL, maybe you don't want someone enter fake URL. So what do you need to do? You need to find from the Stack Overflow or from ChatGPT a lot of code we look and make sure it is working. And then you need to write some custom function to validate URL. Or maybe you just want HTTPS. So you need to add also this constraint. And as well as email. Okay, you need to again write some regex validator. Then you need to say I'm only accepting following domains and so on. And <laughs> like a Everything, as I'm saying, is a doable, surely. But is it faster? Is it not time consuming? Surely it's time consuming and it's not faster, as you can imagine, Pydantic. So that's where Pydantic helps you. You can validate your data and put into form what you want. <laughs> Let's dive into our demo. Today in our demo, we are planning to Roll data from GitHub API and load into SQL after transferring the form that we want. And summary of our data, 
summary of our demo, we will be uh, fetching user data from GitHub API, then define PyDunting models to represent data in the form which we want, validate the information that we receive it, and load into SQL data. <coughs> On the right, you can see how GitHub API result looks like. Like you can see about the person, which is me, login, which is equal username, ID, which is not important, node ID still, which is not important, URL, which is photo of my profile, followers, what more, keep pretty interesting, all this metadata, name, company, blog, location, the created date, when I created my accounts, updated dates, when I recently put it something into, so that's pretty different data type, when, a lot of interesting things like email, URL. So let's dive into how it looked like. <coughs> the first thing to do, surely write some function to get the data. So by using requests, which is written by Kenneth Rays, we basically uh, wrote some get request function. And then as you see here, first we sending requests to user, endpoint and we sending request to reposter endpoint and followers endpoint and gist endpoint and we just joining all of them in the users json data and if everything goes good we have a json which includes user metadata repositories followers and gist if not just some error message <coughs> let's wrote the repository and gist pydantic model. And please pay attention the fields on the code base, the typing, date time, allies, and GA, GT, LA, LT. For example, okay, in the repo full name, it's as usual, just we are receiving the repository full name and we are using field because we will have some configuration in our data. And as you see here, as a default, which means if nothing comes, just put nothing. We just put in three dots. And as allies, which mean if I will directly pass JSON files, I want full underscore name will map with repo full name, as well as HTML underscore URL will map with the repo underscore public URL. This is what we where we need to use allies. And here is what's more interesting, number of stars and created that. Number of stars, as you may guess, if you developed something pretty interesting, can be 100, can be 1,000, etc. But surely it cannot be less than zero, right? Because nobody can put you down. You will have zero just. So we are adding basic and simplest limitation, greater or equal zero. So it means that if we met, end of the day, it should be at least zero, not more. If no, it will receive validation error. And created and updated that if you work it with Redshift or SQL, it's, it is the same exactly time step format. So we are saying that the data we will receive, it will be in the time step format. And we are using data from data time import data. <laughs> and the topics basically, let's assume that you wrote some pretty interesting repository and they are keeping the text about your reporter, so it is what is about, so it's a list of string. <coughs> uh, let's look at also uh, GIST model. We are also creating some class and inheriting from base model from Pydantic import base model. And here everything same, just which is interesting and which we see first is a GIST underscore public URL here. Also here, sorry, maybe I forgot to mention. Here is pretty interesting thing. Like I said, you know, someone can enter fake URL and surely GitHub doesn't care. It's like they don't validate. They just take the input and put it as a metadata because end of the day, you are the person who will show your repository beautiful, not the GitHub. But let's assume that this is pretty critical for us. So we need to make sure it is valid and it is real URL. So if there is no Pydantic, what we need to do, we need to write some regex validator, then we need to write, okay, except on HTTP, on except on HTTPS, or which is finishing with .root, .tr, .etc. 
but with any URL type, you can easily do this. You just wrote it as a type and then continue as it is. Of course, in that case, I just had typical general URL limitations and constraints. It can accept HTTP, HTTPS, and normal limitation. <laughs> and here is the, uh, on the left down, you can see some simplest uh, error situation. For example, I tried and take a screenshot from the code, which is the false. And here we are receiving validation error about the star geyser count because where it is here, yeah. I to show you, I especially said that this JSON data minus five or minus ten. I don't know what is set it here uh, to show it's it can occur error. And as you see here, it's saying that star geyser count should be greater than zero because that time I said it GT equals zero, so it should be at least one. <laughs> Let's look at the next page. Here is also we are of course basically developing, uh, set, creating a two different model. And here's one and two things pretty interesting is first inheritance from other model and uh, more complex validations like uh, patterns, min length, max length. Firstly, it's like about we are keeping information about follower data model. We are basically keeping the username, user public URL and user avatar URL. And about URL, things still same. We just type setting to type to any URL and the allies HTML URL at avatar URL. But about the username, it is still same. And I will do this in the down page. We, I get this information from GitHub official documentation. GitHub username may only contain alphanumeric characters or hyphens. So it's like, for example, it cannot be question mark or I don't know quota. And in the next one, class user, it's like a, in the Pydantic way, in user model, what we are doing instead of inheriting from the base model, we are inheriting the, from the follower model. And the reason we are doing this, because my user model already has the uh, this three field, username, user public area, and user avatar area. So of course I can be dumb as, and then just like a, <coughs> like a dub, duplicate my code, but instead of doing this, I take advantage of inheriting from the model. So when I inherit, I will already have all the features of base model and all these three field. This is the greatest things, greatest another thing about Pydantic. And here, all number of fields, should be greater equals zero because you know you cannot have minus five followers or following or repositories or guests. And about Twitter's username, it's a pretty interesting because here we are using pattern. In previous version, it was called regex parameter, but they changed it as a pattern parameter. We are validating Twitter username because, like I said, GitHub doesn't validate that your Twitter username or valid or not because it's a pretty costly for them, they just getting the information what you enter. And regarding the Twitter documentation, username must be between four to 15 characters and should only contain letters, number and underscore. So to do a second condition, we are writing just pattern. It should be my lower AZ, upper AZ as zero nine or underscore. And to achieve between four to 15, we are just setting min length and max length. So it will validate the information, and if it's not true, it will just return false. <coughs> That's a pretty fast solution, and we, it's, it will save us writing for each on use case some custom validator. <coughs> and we wrote, we developed already our models, user model, follower model, repository model, GIST model. So let's initialize our model. If you remember our first uh, demo page, which I showed our JSON data, it is equal exactly this user data. User data kept this uh, API request response. And what only we do here, instead of this equal this, this equal this, we just using dictionary unpacking this double star mean, like uh, unpack this dictionary with user model. And it is only thing this, Dictionary unpacking to 
mapping our k with the, our uh, model k. So when this code run, within seconds, everything already initialized. Another thing what we can do, like I said, okay, we initialized our model, everything working good. If there is no error throughout. The second thing is like, okay, let's assume that we are working with MySQL database. We can simply just dump to JSON file or S3 or Amazon, Microsoft blob storage and then take advantage of this simple solution. <laughs> as well as if we are running some machine learning model, we can take advantage of pickle that dumps and our model. I also would like to show you some advanced parameters of model underscore dump underscore JSON. <laughs> Let's assume that, okay, we developed uh, this ATL flow by using Pydantic, and then middle of our process, we received some requirements from business. They want to exclude some fields. We have two ways. First, remove from the model this field. It will solve our problem, but maybe one business team requires this field one business team doesn't require this team. So by using model of JSON exclude parameter, you can basically pass fields what you don't want and it will be excluded from your final result. As well as if you only want to include specific one, it's like it depends on if you have 310 of them need to be included, of course you will use include. But if 10 of them need to be excluded, you will use just exclude parameter. And there's a lot of like a, the warning in, in case of failure, you want warning uh, or not. Or for example, in that it's also pretty interesting one. You know, like uh, that's uh, maybe <laughs> one of the irritating thing about JSON sometimes. When you dump data, it's like a pretty ugly. You need to use some, how it's called, b 2 fire to see your data pretty interesting. So indeed of using this, you can pet set indent as you want to set like a more readable. So you can set, for example, for it will be each time when dive into next, it will set like a for indent like this. And this is all about our demo. Of course, I will show you next one, just SQL, but it's a briefly, which is not the core thing about our demo. <coughs> we, uh, as you remember, created four different models, like uh, to keep gist, to keep repository, to keep follower, and to keep user. And uh, we also right now need to define relationship to map with our models into SQL. So as you may imagine, one user can have zero or hundred repositories. So it's like a user to repository, one to many relationship, as well as one user can have zero or hundred followers. So it's also one to many relationship. And as well as one user can have more than one guest or nothing at all. That's why it's also one to many relationship. Like it is simple. Uh, you just need to write the same field as a create statement, create table, guest, and the field one, field two, field three. It's a pretty straightforward solution. That's why I'm not including in the uh, demo this SQL part. But like a, like you see in the within like a 10, five minutes, we get our data, fastly map our data, the format what we want, and we wrote directly fast validations. <laughs> and it's ready to load SQL or ready to serve to machine learning engineer teams. And here, like uh, for example, <laughs> on the top, I I get this screenshot from JSON Hero, which is pretty good tool to beautify the JSON result. All these fields except repository, guest, and follower come from the first API call, and these guests, followers, and repositories come from other API calls. End of the day, our user data looks like this. And here also from JSON Crack screenshot, like uh, to show the tree of our JSON. So <laughs> if you need to validate and get fast results, it's, it's a pretty good idea to take advantage of Pydantic. Thank you for listening to our demo. If you have questions, please let me know in the chat so I can freely help you. Uh, and what are the other things I wish I could say you? Like I said, Pydantic is pretty nice solution about the defining model, validating model. But if you ever develop any REST API with FAST API, you may already aware of 
pedantic because it's also in Python. In fast up, it's pretty often it is used and helping to define the return type or input type of your like a REST application. So not only receive the data and deal with the data, but also to define your input model, you can use Pydantic. And also, as well as the recently, as you may realize, LLM model become pretty interesting and famous. <laughs> and regarding the comparison, if you pass your prompt as a Pydantic model, like in each different field, define the different requirements, you will receive better results. So if you basically send to ChatGPT some calls by using Pydantic, it's possible that you will receive better results. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day. Cheers. That was great, Hassan. Thank you so much. And Hassan is in the chat with us, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So you can ask your questions in the chat and I think he'll be able to answer um, all of your questions. I do have a question for you, Hassan. I mean, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, I <laughs> I saw that first picture that you showed with like 20 million rows, 300 columns, like, okay, now I need to like validate it and serialize it. I totally <laughs> can relate to that. Um, and Pydantic sounds really great for like simplifying and making efficient those like um, data preparation workflow, but why, what else do you wish to kind of see in Pydantic? I'm kind of curious about that. So if you could put that in the chat as well to answer that question, I would really appreciate it. Um, and for the rest of the folks uh, who are joining us right now, um, I'm also curious, like who uses GitHub Copilot or any other LLMs for your data science workflow? Um, maybe put like a snake emoji on there. Uh, and I love to hear like, what have you found useful? Like how like what are the questions that you ask like what are the questions that you ask and you don't get back the answer that you want um just you know very very curious on how that's being used um in the community today so let us know um and yeah i think we're ready to move on to our next uh lightning sessions right or is it is it yes lightning talks yeah um, awesome thank you so much Asan. let's let's bring it back up on screen alternatives to Pydantic. Is that what we're asking? Alternative, yes. Yeah, what other tools? Mm -hmm. What would be some alternatives, Hassan? And just as a reminder, you can go to aka.ms slash Python slash data science day <laughs> to take a look at uh, other sessions and lightning talks that's coming up. Absolutely. So, um, cool. Let's jump into the next talk. All righty. Building models like a pro with Microsoft Fabric Synapse. Microsoft Fabric is your one-stop show for streamlining your ML workflow and becoming a champion. Fabric breaks down data silos, Power BI for studying insights, Data Factory for smooth pipelines, and Python or R, Ryan Supreme alongside libraries, all within one unified environment. That is Microsoft Synapse. No more tool juggling, just pure data science plates. That's what we call Microsoft Synapse. And you know what? The real magic lies in the Synapse data science. Why? Because all your words related to data wrangling will be cleaned using Data Wrangler because it shapes your data like magic, while MLflow tracks your experiments like a hog, helping you find the winning model faster than ever. Deployment confidence is getting increased for sure if you use Microsoft Synapse because Synapse scales effortlessly on the cloud and which will 
let you score your data and make real world impact. Your model will reach the real world and there will be no exceptions. Now, you might be wondering why Fabric and Synapse? Because it's time to teach the data predatory. There are certain regions which I would like to tell you for using Microsoft Synapse and Fabric. First, once it will surely boost your productivity. Say goodbye to fragmented workflows and hello to a laser focus efficiency. Synapse take care of the degradery, freeing you to build impactful models and extract insightful diamonds from your data. Second, it embraces the lake house. Store and analyze your data in its native format. No complex transformations needed. Simplicity awaits, no headaches. And third, you will become a data science maestro because forget fragmented dreams and fragmented tools. And join this lighting tool to know, talk to know more about the fabric and synapse. Now, you might be wondering how Synapse can help you. So it will build your champion model in following ways, and it will help you to build those models more effectively. So how it, it can help you? The first is the data exploration. Dive into your data with R or Python notebooks, utilizing built-in tools like Data Wrangler to wrangle and visualize, find patterns, uncover hidden gems. Second, it will help you in model training. PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, Synapse empowers everything. It experiments with algorithms, track and compare models with ML flows, and find your champion. And the last but not least, it will help you boost your confidence while deployment. Synapse take care of your model deployment, which will help you to score your data at scale and to make real world impact. Your models goes hero to legend using Microsoft Synapse. And the model version matters. You can also track and compare different iterations ensuring you always choose the best. You can also use MLflow magic. It is a built-in tool which tracks your experiments like a hawk, giving you insights and control like never before. So that's what about Microsoft Synapse and Microsoft Fabric. I would really love to know more about how was your experience using this Microsoft Synapse. And that's all. Thank you so much for joining this lightning talk. And thank you so much. That was an awesome lightning talk. I'm so excited that we got to talk to so many people so far um, throughout this day. We have still more content. To get a hold of the content in full schedule, you can visit aka.ms forward slash Python forward slash data science day, and that'll be the full schedule. But if you do aka.ms forward slash Python, you will go to our new landing page that is still evolving with all of the different things that we have and all of the different products that we have that support Python. We have some labs up there. We have some learning labs that we bubble up to the top, some blogs that we're adding to the top because sometimes our blogs are on top tech community and sometimes they're on uh, the Python dev blog, which I highly recommend you, you check out. Um, but let's jump into Cloud Skills Challenge and some other goodies you have for us. Sure. Um... Let's see. I need to find the, the right. Can you guys see the content? Or... Let's add it to the screen. Okay. Yep. So we got Python Data Science Cloud Skills Challenge. This is something that you can work on on your own time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, we talked about it a little bit uh, previously as well, but it's basically a series of learn modules mm -hmm. that you can go through. Um, uh, like I said, on your own time. And then at the end of it, you basically get a little badge saying, hey, you've yeah. completed this. Um, and and you can flaunt it in LinkedIn and whatnot as well. Um, so yeah, that this is this is going on currently, mm -hmm. um, and you it, 
I think you can see here that you have 31 days left uh, until April 15th. And scroll down um, some more. There's a leaderboard. You yes. can get your name on the leaderboard to uh, for participation. Yep. Oh, shout out to the three people who've already done it. And it also shows that people are halfway there. Mm -hmm. So you got 31 days to join in on the fun. Yep. All right. We got exactly 100 participants so far. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's exciting. <awesome. laughs> Cool. Um, and I can quickly this time to talk about uh, some of the content that was shared before, but maybe this will be like a supplementary kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of folks talked about code spaces earlier and they talked about templates and Jupyter templates. So I just wanted to quickly share with you how you can get there for, for those of you who missed it. Um, so all you need to do is go to your go to github.com slash code spaces. Um, and once you're signed into your account, um, you'll be able to see this page directly. If if you're not signed in, I think it's just like a generic page, but mm -hmm. you, once you signed in, you see this page. Um, and Jupyter Notebook is one of the ones that's being displayed uh, in right at the center of your screen. Um, so once you say use this template, that's when you get connected to code spaces. You don't have to use this one. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you can use a blank one um, if you want, but this one is really good, especially if you're starting out um, because there's some like sample notebooks and data already loaded in there. Oh, so you don't cool. even have to worry about like going to Kaggle and like finding whichever data um, that you want to work with. Cool. Um, so yeah, I uh, wanted to share that. And then the other thing is, I think somebody asked earlier and I don't think I, act, I was answering it and then I, I was answering some other questions <laughs> um, about how you can connect to code spaces uh, or how you can use um, just your local machine. Mm. Um, and I wanted to show you how you can um, use code spaces compute on your local machine as well. So mm -hmm. um, on, uh, let's say you're in your local VS Code, this is my local VS Code environment, um, and you go to whatever notebook that you are in, um, you can go to the kernel selector, mm -hmm. um, go to, can you guys see the screen okay? Is it too small? Maybe Should a I zoom, zoom in. in a little bit more? Okay. Okay. That's good. Okay. So kernel selector, um, select another kernel, and you have this button called connect to code space if you have the code spaces um, uh, extension installed. Okay. Um, so once you do that, basically you have a a Jupyter server or like a code space compute acting as a Jupyter server. I'm sorry to interrupt. You hit yeah. the bottom left-hand corner for the remote development? No. So okay. <laughs> that's a little bit different. So you can do that, right? So you could go to out of that that is for connecting to whatever remote development that you can okay so not to be confused yep. you went That's somewhere else you used your command palette to find it yeah so you Perfect. go to your kernel selector uh, okay for your notebook so yep. this is specific yep. for your notebook if you okay. want to use code spaces as a Jupyter server itself and you don't want you don't need all the the bells and whistles that it comes with for having a being in a remote environment yes okay um, that makes sense yep so Connect to code space. Um, and then I already have a few because I was playing around with it and I, I always play around with it, but you can just <laughs> say create a new code space. Um, and then at that point you can choose whatever cores or RAM or storage that, you, uh, that you're that you interested in. Um, I know folks get excited about seeing GPU on mine because I have access to it, but I know not everybody has it. Um, if you want it and if you need it, please shout it out. <laughs> I'm trying to convince the team to. To, to make that into a uh, reality for everybody. But cool. anyways, um, yeah, so you can just select it and then you get connected. So now you're not even using your machine's uh, uh, compute, you're using the code spaces compute. Um, so we got yeah. a good question in the chat. Can yeah. code spaces be used without internet? No, no, you have to be connected to the internet. Um, that's how we communicate with code spaces. So, so I guess co a code space without internet mm -hmm. is like a dev container. You'd be using mm -hmm. locally. You would also need Docker desktop, mm -hmm. um, and you'd be using your own machine's exactly. compute. Mm -hmm. um, but the cool thing about code spaces, because it's connected to the internet, is you're using Azure's compute. Yep, yep. Yeah, for me, um, a lot of the times when I use code spaces is when I'm on my iPad. <laughs> oh, cool. That's um, a good yeah. use case. Yeah, so I just use code spaces when I'm on, you know, like I. My iPad obviously is not as powerful as my development machine. Um, okay. So that's when I would just go to um, github.com slash code spaces and, and, and go from there. We're getting some asks for some GPUs in the chat. Yes. I love that. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> if you want the nice thing, nice and shiny things, this is why we show up for these events. You got to tell us. And so we'll funnel that back to the product team. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we'll try to get it for you. We'll right. see. Um, now it's time to jump into our next session. 
Uh, we're running a little early, but that's okay. Um, we're going to be talking about unleashing the power of deep learning. Uh, we're going to build a dog versus cat image classifier. Very cool. All right. Let's play the tape. <laughs> Hi, hello, good morning, good evening, and thank you so much for joining me for this session today. Uh, so the topic of today's session is a dog versus cat classification using a convolution neural network. So we would be designing a convolution neural network uh, and we would be feeding it images of dogs and cats. And the model would predict that if it's a dog image or if it's a cat image. So in my opinion, this session would be helpful for anyone who has heard about CNN, but they do not know any the work, the inner workings about it. So this would be a good starting point for anyone who wants to learn about CNN. Okay, so a little bit about me. So my name is Jyoti Swaroop Makina. I am a beta Microsoft Learn Student Ambassador. Um, I am a deep learning enthusiast. I love exploring all and everything about machine learning in general, but specifically in deep learning. Currently, I'm exploring all the neural networks, LSTMs. There is so much to explore. And I'm also a full stack developer. I'm from India. I'm a third year student uh, pursuing artificial intelligence and machine learning from Heritage Institute of Technology. And a few of my hobbies include uh, playing football, uh, watching movies, and I'm an ardent book reader. Okay, so this is what we are going to cover. I I just have I, I just have prepared a few slides. After we cover those slides, there's a little bit of theory. We can straight away jump into code. So th these are the topics that we are going to cover today. We will talk about first what a CNN is. We would give a brief. I would give a brief introduction about CNN and how they aid in image processing and pattern recognition. A very important point to note before learning any new technology is why did that technology come about? Like what was the reason for the invention or the development of that technology? So we would talk about why can't we use ANN and why there was a necessity for CNN to come about. And then we would talk about the typical CNN architecture, like how, uh, what are the different layers in a CNN model? With that out of the way, then we'll move to various CNN applications and then we were tied straight straight into the code. Like I said, like I promised, we just have a few slides, a little bit of theory, and we'll dive straight into the code. Okay, introduction to CNN. So this is how a typical CNN looks like. I know this can be very daunting. When I first started learning CNN, it was daunting for me as well. So there are many layers here, but what's important to focus is this layer, like. This dense layer is nothing but what you have been using in artificial neural networks. So it's just this artificial neural network. In CNN, these layers are added, the ones that you can see in these colors. So these layers are added in CNN. So what are these layers? These are the convolution and pooling layers. We'll talk about them uh, a little later. So first of all, what exactly is CNN? So as the definition states below, CNNs are also known as a connet. They are a special kind of neural network for processing data that has a known grid-like topology, like for time series data or images, which are, which are 2D. So any data that has a grid-like topology, you can use a CNN for it. So in 1D, the example is a time series data, and for 2D, those are typically images. So why CNN and why not ANN? Like, why do we, why can't we use uh, ANN with image data? Like this is a typical ANN architecture, right? We have the input layer, then we have the much dreaded black box. Uh, we have the hidden layers here and we have the output layer. So the question is, can we use ANNs on image data? What do you guys think? So we can use artificial neural networks with image data, but they have a few drawbacks. So the first drawback is high computation cost. So if I go back, so if we consider this little image of Tweety here, so let's say this 
let's take an example that this image is of size 40 by 40. This is a 40 by 40 pixel grid image, which is a very low resolution image, right? So we have 40 cross 40 uh, image. And let's for now forget that we have any of these layers here, right? So let's say we are feeding this image directly into the ENN. That is the artificial neural. So what would be the steps? First, we would convert this 2D grid structure into a 1D, one dimensional array. That is what is flattened layer does. So flattened layer basically converts a higher dimensional array to a 1D array. So we would convert this 40 cross 40, which is 1600, and we would convert into this 1D array. So we are feeding this. So this layer that you can see here, it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 uh, neurons here. So consider this having 1600 neurons. So the input layer would be of dimension 1600 cross 1. And then we are feeding it into this layer, the first hidden layer, right? In this example, it has 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 here. It has, again, it has 7 here. So it's like 1600. And let's imagine that 7 is a very low number. You will, for instance, be taking much more than 7. So for an example, let's take 100 neurons. So as you can imagine, the weights, so each edge that you're seeing here, right? Each connection that you're seeing, each pixel is connected to your neuron. It has an associated weight with it, right? So this connection that we're doing, 1600 here and 100 uh, neurons here. So the weights in the first layer itself would be 1600 into 100, which is around 160,000. So imagine just for the first hidden layer, we have 160,000 trainable parameters. And a typical, uh, a typical uh, neural network architecture has at least, I mean, you can have many hidden layers, right? You can have 10, 20, or you can have two, three hidden layers as well, right? So with that many hidden layers, you can imagine that the training parameters goes up. So as the training number of training parameters increases, so does the, the so does the time for calculating for back propagation increases, and so does the computation cost. That is what I mean by high computation cost. And then overfitting. So overfitting in very simple terms is that the model performs well in training, but it performs bad in testing. So since every pixel is connected to every other neuron, we can have a chance of overfitting uh, when it comes to artificial neural networks. And next is a very important point, which is loss of important information like spatial arrangement of pixels. So what, what do I mean by that? If you come back to this picture again, as you can see here, these eyes, right? Since these eyes are located close to each other, right? And they have a spatial meaning. If eyes are located very far apart from each other, then that wouldn't make sense, right? The fact that they are close to each other has a spatial meaning to it. But what are we doing? We are basically converting this grid-like structure and we are converting into 1D array. So we are losing the importance of that spatial arrangement. This is a very important drawback that artificial neural networks do not cover. Which brings us to CNN architecture. So does CNN cover all these drawbacks? Yes, the answer is yes. So this is how a typical CNN architecture looks like. Again, this is the dense layer, which is also known as the fully connected layer. And these are the layers that I was talking about. Okay, so we have the convolution layer and we have a pooling layer. Typically, these are the two layers that you're going to add. You can add multiple layers of these. And we also use an activation function, um, a non-linear activation function like ReLU, which stands for Rectify Linear Unit, uh, which is basically any negative is converted to zero and positive stays, stays the same value. So this we have, we have the image of the zebra, right? So this input image is fed into a convolution layer. So the task of a convolution layer is to basically extract primitive features from the image. Uh, what do I mean by primitive features? Primitive features are basically the edges. As you can see, uh, this zebra is formed of multiple edges, right? This edge here, this tail here, this leg here, this curved edge here, here, this one, near to the face. So the convolution layer, the task of a convolution layer is to extract these primitive features, edges. That is the first convolution layer. The next convolution layer, it usually the features that it got from the first layer, it extracts more complex features from the first layer. Third convolution layer extracts more complex features from the second layer and so on. So if the first convolution layer extracted only these edges, the second convolution layer might have extracted these legs, like that this is a leg, this is a face, this is a tail. And, and if there's a third convolution layer, it might have extracted that, okay, this is the entire 
body, there's a lower body, and maybe another layer would have identified that this is a zebra. That is what a typical convolution layer does. And then moving on, we have a pooling layer. So pooling layer has a very specific purpose as to why do we use it. So if I take this example, so the zebra is here, right? And the tail of the zebra is here. Let's say we have an image in which the zebra is flipped, where the head of the zebra is on the left side of the image and the tail of the zebra is on the right side of the image. But still, it's, it's still a zebra, right? It doesn't matter if the tail is on the left side or the right side. It still is a zebra. So this is what, this is a problem known as translation invariance. So pooling helps images so that they become translation invariant. That is a very overview of what this convolution and pooling layers are. That is more than enough just to get up and running, right? So we have these convolution pooling layers. After that, we feed it into this flatten layer. So basically it takes care of everything that we just talked about, right? Then uh, we flatten it into 1D array and then we pass it into this dense layer, which then does the classification. And since in according to this, this example, it is a multi-class classification problem. So we have used the softmax activation function. If uh, in this example, that in the example that we are going to take, it's a binary classification problem, dog or cat, right? So we, we will use sigmoid. You can also use binary cross entropy uh, activation function. So some CNN applications, um, CNN is heavily used in image classification, something that we're going to do in our demo today, uh, right? Object localization, object localization basically means uh, it helps to identify in what part of the image our desired object is located. Like it is locating, that okay, the dog is here, the dog is here, grass is here, and so on. That is what object localization does. Face detection and recognition, Again, a very common feature. Uh, nowadays, smartphones uh, come, uh, the cameras in our smartphones uh, have this feature inbuilt. And you would be pleased to know that uh, they use convolution neural networks. Okay, with that out of the way, as promised, we will dive straight into the code and we would see, we would do and we would build a model, a CNN model that does the classification of a dog or a cat. Okay, so this is basically um, the Google Colab here, right? So as you can see, my runtime got uh, disconnected. Okay, so what we're doing is, first of all, we're importing it from Kaggle. So I found this data set here. I have pasted the link here, dogs, cats. So I pasted the link of this at the data set here. So what we're doing is, first we're importing it directly from Kaggle, what you can could have done is you could have installed it into your computer and then loaded it onto your Google Colab. But I found this way to be much easier. As you can see, the file is quite large. It's 1.06 GB. So I did that. One more thing, um, you should, uh, in runtime, you can go and make it GPU. As you can see, because this, there's a lot of data here. And if you would train this model on a CPU, it would take a lot of time. So using a GPU would enhance your training time. Okay, so the first steps are just loading data from Kaggle onto Google Colab and we get a zip file. So we just unzip it. That's just basic code here, right? And then we are importing the necessary modules from TensorFlow. We are importing Keras, Sequential, and we're importing all the layers that we are going to use. Uh, this code here, generators, um, this is very important. Um, Basically, this, this serves a very specific purpose. And the fact is that our training data is large. So since our training data is large, what we would do is we would divide our training data into batches. I have chosen the batch data 32 here. So it divides the data into batches and then it feeds the data. It loads the data into the RAM in the form of batches. So one batch is loaded onto the RAM. All the processing is done. And another batch is loaded onto the, ba onto the RAM. Processing is done and so on, right? So this code, I found it from uh, the Kaggle documentation, uh, right? So it just basically does that. And it basically, I have written uh, two variables here, which is training data set and validation data set. So we are basically getting, dividing our data into training data set and validation data set. As you can see, 
there are about 20,000 images in the training data set and um, uh, 5,000 files in the validation data set. Okay, uh, then the next process is normalizing uh, the data set. So normalizing is important uh, so because uh, our pixel values, basically images have pixel values ranging from 0 to 255. So we have to normalize it to 0 to 1. So there is an advantage of normalizing our data. It enhances our model's performance and it improves our accuracy. So it's always considered a good practice that we normalize our data. Like it's, it's there's no harm in, in normalizing data. Okay, so this is the main, this is the entire scene and architecture that we will be talking about. As you can see, there is a spawn 2D layer, which is basically the convolution layer that we talked about. And then there is this max pooling layer, which is basically the pooling layer that we talked about. So I have taken this spawn convolution layer, pooling layer, Convolution layer again, pulling layer again, convolution layer again, and then pulling layer again. So I've taken three convolution layers and three pulling layers basically. And I have done the batch normalization here. So this step, batch normalization, as you can see, I have done this for improving the trainings model. So what you can do is um you, you can first not run this code. You can just add convolution layer and pulling layer and try and test that. I did that and my model's accuracy was coming very low. So I had to improve my model's accuracy. So that is what batch normalization does. That is why I imported, as you can see here, I imported right at the top batch normalization. That is why we imported this layer here. So, so I'm adding three convolution layers and then three pooling layers. So usually machine in machine learning and deep learning, there is a lot of experimentation involved. Like one of the questions that I was, uh, that I had was, um, how can we know how many layers and how many kernels that we're using in each layer? How can we know that? So the answer to that is it comes with practice and it comes with a lot of experimentation. You have to experiment. You have to see that, okay, if you're using two layers, if is my accuracy score coming good? If my, if using three layers, is my accuracy score coming better? Sometimes it may be the case that you are using too many layers and they, there may be a case of overfitting, right? So you, it's a machine learning and deep learning is a lot involves a lot of experimentation and that is what makes this field so interesting in my opinion. Okay. So we have added these convolution and pooling layers and then we are flattening it into the, that big giant one dimensional array, right? And this code, um, one second. Okay, for some reason, it said it 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 wasn't being able to connect the GPU. Okay, no issues there. Okay, yeah, as you can see, now it's been connected, right? Then we have the uh, dense neural network, which is basically the uh, fully connected layer. So we're using 128 neurons in the first layer, then we're using a dropout layer. Then in, in the second layer, we are using 64 neurons. And in the third, which is basically the output layer, we are using the activation function of sigmoid. So when I run model dot summary, this is the entire summary, right? So each image in our uh, data set is of the size two fifty six cross two fifty six. Okay, so we have two fifty six cross two fifty six, uh, and that is fed into spawn two D layer. As you can see, the first output is this one, right? Uh, so the first output is this one. So as you can see, it has 896 parameters that it has to train. And then you can see, and this is all the data, the necessary data that, that comes out with it, right? So the total training parameters is this huge giant number. So it will take a lot of time for training. And in fact, it did take a lot of time for training. So what I did was I did the training beforehand. It, it took about 10 minutes to train this uh, data set, uh, this model basically. So I did that again. So I, I've used the Adam optimizer. And as I said, this, since this is a binary um, classification problem, I've used a binary cross entropy loss here. And when we run model.fit, it basically runs it. As you can see, there are 625. Uh, so there are 10 epochs we are running it for. And there is a 625, right? Okay. So important thing to note is that you can see that a loss is coming, is, is decreasing, right? It started off with 1.52 and the loss came down to 0 0.17. We're getting a pretty decent accuracy as well, 0 0.92. And 
simultaneously there is this validation loss which is about 0.76 which is fairly good right then we have this uh, plots here which is basically accuracy and validation accuracy as you can see here uh, the training accuracy is been increasing whereas the validation accuracy was fluctuating and it about in the end reached about 0.75 right this clearly shows that there is a difference between the training accuracy and the, and the validation accuracy so this shows that there is overfitting here even here, right? This this the difference here is showing that our model has overfitting issues, right? Again, the same here, loss and validation loss. See, the loss is decreasing for the trading data set, but the validation loss is, has been fluctuating, and in the end it came out about here. So yeah, I plotted these um, uh, graphs for you so that we can see that there is overfitting happening here. So how can we overcome overfitting? So these are the few steps here. We can add more data, we can do data augmentation, we can add so drop out layers and batch normalization. So I did drop out and batch normalization as you, as you can see in the code above, uh, which has improved the overfitting here. The, before overfitting was pretty huge, pretty large. It has significantly reduced the overfitting here. But still, this shows that there is room for improvement in our model. Okay, so with that, our training set is done, our training part of our data set is done. So what we'll do is we'll run it for, we'll do a test, right? We'll feed our model an image of a dog and a cat, and we'll see that if it is working or not, if our model is being able to predict that or not. So I've done that. I've had this cat.jpg image. And when I show that, so there is a cat image, right? So then basically I'm resizing it to, to, so to 256 cross 256. And then I'm feeding it into my model, right? So once I'm feeding it into a model, our model will give us a probability, right? If it is from 0 to 0 0.5 in the in the range, it means that our model is predicting that it's a cat. If it's from 0 0.5 to 1, it means that our model is predicting it's a dog. So it has given a value, and I'm storing that in output, and then running, running this simple if-else condition, right? So what is it saying that if the range, if the output is less than 0 0.5, tell him that it's an image of a cat or a dog. As you can see, voila, it is telling that this is an image of a cat. So we'll run it for the dog as well, right? We're running it for the dog, the skiing code again, again, again. We are now feeding the dog image here. So it runs for that again. Now it is showing that the image is that of a dog, which means the probability would have must be in the range of 0 0.5 to 1. So yeah, with that, this is the code implementation of CNN. Uh, I think this is a pretty good head start for you to get up and running with CNN to see that what all you can do with CNN. Again, there is a lot of things that you can do with CNN. You can integrate OpenCV as well. And yeah. So yeah. I hope you found this presentation helpful. So yeah. Thank you so much. What an awesome talk. I love anything that's going to give me some dog and cat pictures. <laughs> but we really got into the like nitty gritty of it. It was very, very applicable. And I'm so appreciative that we have such engagement from our student ambassadors, our MVPs, our Microsoft employees. But we also have talks from the community. And I'm hearing in the chat that we'd love more community talks in our next round. We're gonna be doing more of these Python discipline days. They'll do some data science days. We're gonna do an Azure developers day again. Um, so we're gonna keep this up, keep uh, an eye out on our channels and other work that the Python community is doing at Microsoft, because we love to keep it as community focused as possible. Um, and speaking of community, we have these things called hack togethers. So it is a hackathon through Microsoft It's open to Anyone who wants to explore the discipline that we're doing, we had a Power Platforms one, and we're going to have in the next uh, videos, we're going to have the last two finalists for the Fabric Hack together. Uh, they came together to learn and experiment on things. They got access to Azure uh, Copilot and OpenAI um, in order to be able to execute some of these really cool visions. And when you join the Act Hack Together community, you get to act, uh, ask questions, share ideas, join some live streams and talk with experts. And then if you win or if, you, if you're a finalist, you get some goodies, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't call it goodies. It's 
really, really good. Yeah, goodies. it's really good goodies. They're like prizes. Um, they're yeah, actual yeah. prizes. Exactly. So I mean, I think you get monetary compensation. You can you can look those up um, mm-hmm. how much they are by uh, yourself, but you get monetary compensation, and then you also get some um, some extra credits for Azure. Cool. Um, and then I think Don Wanchen mentioned that like you get access to Azure OpenAI and things like that, really. So it's something. You get access to things that you would normally have to wait for a long yeah. time. So you um, you get access to those. So I think it's really great to participate in these, learn from you know other people that you're yep. working with, and also talk directly to the people who are actually developing these products. Yeah, and they're building real world applications. Um, and I think the the last two uh, videos that we have also emphasize that these are real world applications that you can use, and you know you get to ideate and create and. Uh, it yeah. seems like a lot of fun. For sure. All right. So we are just about at time. So we're going to jump into the last two uh, Hack Together talks. And then we got a few more talks for the rest of the day. Oh, nice. This is exactly what I wanted to cook. Ah, too bad. It's gone bad. Have to get rid of it. Is this something that has ever happened to you? To us, it did as well. And this is exactly the reason why we came up with a solution and the use case for this AI hackathon. What we're trying to achieve is battling food waste. And because change starts with you, this is exactly where we are going to tackle the problem. We are helping you with our solution, keep track of all the products that you have in your pantry or fridge and use them up before they expire. You will be able to keep a list of things that you have in the fridge, know exactly when they're about to expire. And if they're gonna expire in a couple of days, you will get recipes that help you use them up and turn them into nice and very healthy meals that help you minimize the food waste and make the best use of the products that you have at home. Together with my colleague, Christian Tote, we, I'm Alex Dean. Uh, we created a solution using Fabric as our um, tool of choice to track food that's being imported into a database using Power Apps and image recognition. We'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. And the idea is using AI to A, figure out when the food is going to expire and be using AI to also figure out great tasting recipes that we can use to use up food before it actually expires to make sure that we use what's in our fridge. Now, Christian, the word over to you to give us a bit of a demonstration and talk us through the solution that's been built. Yes, thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me quickly switch my camera and show you what we have. So what we developed, as Alex mentioned, is a solution to fight food waste. Um, the idea and the, the layout of what we have built looks a little bit like the uh, Visio that you see in front of yourself. So um, the, the layout is as following. We're importing the data from the Open Food Facts database and putting everything that we have there into a lake house. Um, then we have uh, another portion of the solution, which is uh, the scanner app. And with this, we are bringing everything that you have in your pantry or that you brought home from your trip to the supermarket that you can scan and take pictures of. And we are taking this and writing it into another database. And then we are using AI to check how long these uh, products that you bought or that you're checking in are going to last in your fridge or in your pantry so that we can determine if we have to use them up or if we uh, can still have them in the pantry a little bit longer and stock them for longer. And this is um, done via uh, using, uh, like I said, OpenAI and bringing everything to, into a semantic model then creating some triggers, the data activator, we integrated that into the solution so that we can trigger a flow once one of our measures, um, which is when is the food going to expire. Once our, our measures hits a certain threshold, we will get a trigger, send this to a power automate flow, 
and again trigger a request or a prompt asking the AI to create recipes with all of the food in our fridge and all of the ingredients that are about to expire soon. This is then uh, taken into a mail and sent to you for your convenience so that you know exactly, okay, um, this is the day when I need to need to use them up. I've got two or three more days left and uh, it's, it's time to take action so that we don't wasting any food. And we're gonna show you part of the, the solution. Like I said, first of all, we're um, loading the, the Open Food Facts database and we use the notebook to load it. And uh, this is what it looks like. So what we're doing is uh, we are creating first our lake house, which is the important part. We're we starting with the lake house. Then we are loading food the, the zip from Open Food Facts. Uh, we're saving it into the lake house, unpacking it, and then writing everything into the lake house so that we have a reference for our uh, barcodes that we're going to scan with the Power App um, so that we can, can see, okay, what is the product? and when it is going to expire, getting some more information about the, the products itself. And by the way, big shout out to the Microsoft uh, Python team. Thank you so much for giving us these great samples that you can install in the Fabric workspaces. They gave us all the ideas to be able to easily download files from the internet and populate our lakeouts. Exactly, so th this is uh, really a, a plug and play solution. So we. We used uh, a lot of the, the code that we already had and um, could use that to create our solution as we wanted to have them. And um, yeah, that last part, write them into the lake house. And uh, after everything is written into the lake house, what we're doing then is uh, we are showing you, quickly showing you the, the scanner app, how this works. So this is the, the barcode scanner app that we are using to fill our fridge or to put all of the products that we have into our fridge. We're reading the barcode. Yeah, it's not, uh, not enough. We can also take a picture and uh, check what the, what the product is. And then we are gonna to, uh, going to, to log the product and uh, send it to our fridge so that we know what do we have as uh, products to use? Okay, and this actually triggers our next notebook, which you can see here, the add ingredients to the fridge. Okay, I'll take over here. So the first thing we're doing is we're importing the OpenAI um, library into this into this notebook. Now it's important for anybody who's going to be reproducing this. If you trigger a notebook using a schedule or in this, in our case, using a API endpoint, um, you can't use the pip magic. You can't install OpenAI on the fly. It has to be pre-installed with the right VIP version that, that you require. Um, so you'll see at the top, the environment is the OpenAI environment. We created a specific environment for this with the OpenAI DLL already loaded. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have a parameter block that allows us to pass in the parameters from the Power Apps um, workflow. Uh, so that's now going to be passing in a bag of nuts and the barcode. Um, we're passing in both because sometimes we might not find a barcode in the database. It's a huge database with over 3 million items, but there might still be barcodes that it doesn't know. So having a little AI builder um, image detection helps us be a little bit more robust when it comes to figuring out what product we're looking at. Uh, so we, the next step, we're looking up the barcode in the, in the database, and if we find it, then we use that product name. Uh, here comes the fun part, the OpenAI part. Uh, we're now using OpenAI as a food concierge who will tell us how long does a product normally last in the fridge or in the pantry. So this can tell us a cucumber lasts maybe for five to seven days in the fridge and a bag of nuts might last six months in the pantry. Uh, using some clever prompt engineering, we ask OpenAI to give us a good estimate of how long it will last. Now, although we tell OpenAI to tell us always in days, GPT keeps on giving me or us weeks and months, so we have to do a little bit of cleanup. And so the next segment is just cleaning up the response, saying, hey, if it's months, then we take a times 30. If it's weeks, we take a times seven and try to figure out sort of the, the average that might be 
three to five weeks. So we'll take an average of four weeks and say, okay, this product will last four weeks in the pantry and use that as an expiry date. So we pack that onto the current date and we know roughly when it's going to expire and we're going to save that to the database. Um, that can now be used as a trigger point as soon as the expiry date um, triggers an action. And I'm going to pass that over back to Christian. Yep. Thanks, Alex. So this is the fridge uh, that we now filled with our products um, with the logic that Alex just explained. So uh, we have lots of different things in the fridge, lots of different products in the fridge. And this is the, the basis for our model that we created. So really basic semantic model based up on the, the lake house table. And we're doing some really basic calculation to determine, okay, uh, when is the product going to go bad um, with the date that we just determined by using the AI. And this feeds into a report, also really just a basic report that shows us um, how long are these different projects going to last. For example, the pita bread is uh, really a, a longer shelf life item. Um, the vegetable stock will last for, for okay. another year almost. And uh, we have some falafel mix. Um, some tomatoes and the items that we really need to use uh, as soon as possible are the, the chicken breast, mint, some milk, eggs, cucumbers, um, yogurt, etc. So um, this is the, the items that we need to use up fast. With this, uh, we created um, a data activator trigger. So uh, we created a reflex. And um, as you can see, we're, we're seeing, okay, our yogurt um, is, is going to go bad. Uh, pretty soon, so uh, we're assuming this is now now triggering um, our custom action that we defined before, and we're using this custom action to send, whenever this trigger hits, um, uh, an action to our Power Automate flow, and this is the Power Automate flow. So every time the the trigger fires, everything every time a product goes under five days or until its expiry date. Um, we're, we're getting the trigger, uh, then we're um, defining the secret, um, the, the API key that we need to um, later lock on to open AI and to actually use the services. We're doing some requests based on the data, so we want to know how long certain, certain items will last. We know, want to know which are the required items that we need to use. This is exactly what I wanted to cook. Ah, too bad. It's gone bad. Have to get rid of it. Is this something that has ever happened to you? To us, it did as well. And this is exactly the reason why we came up with a solution and the use case for this AI hackathon. What we are trying to achieve is battling food waste. And because change starts with you, this is exactly where we are going to tackle the problem. We are helping you with our solution, keep track of all the products that you have in your pantry or fridge and use them up before they expire. You will be able to keep a list of things that you have in the fridge, know exactly when they're about to expire. And if they're going to expire in a couple of days, you will get recipes that help you use them up and turn them into nice and very healthy meals that help you minimize the food waste and make the best use of the products that you have at home. Together with my colleague Christian Tote, we, I'm Alex Dean. Uh, we created a solution using Fabric as our um, tool of choice to track food that's being imported into a database using power apps and image recognition. We'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. And the idea is using AI to A, figure out when the food is going to expire and B, using AI to also figure out great tasting recipes that we can use to use up food before it actually expires to make sure that we use what's in our fridge. Now, Christian, the word over to you 
to give us a bit of a demonstration and talk us through the solution that's been built. Yes, thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me quickly switch my camera and show you what we have. So what we developed, as Alex mentioned, is a solution to fight food waste. Um, the idea and the, the layout of what we have built looks a little bit like the uh, Visio that you see in front of yourself. So um, the, the layout is as following. We're importing the data from the Open Food Facts database and putting everything that we have there into a lake house. Um, then we have uh, another portion of the solution, which is uh, the scanner app. And with this, we are bringing everything that you have in your pantry or that you brought home from your trip to the supermarket that you can scan and take pictures of. And we are taking this and writing it into another database. And then we are using AI to check how long these uh, products that you bought or that you're checking in are going to last in your fridge or in your pantry so that we can determine if we have to use them up or if we uh, can still have them in the pantry a little bit longer and stock them for longer. And this is um, done via uh, using, uh, like I said, OpenAI and bringing everything to, into a semantic model, then creating some triggers, the data activator, we integrated that into the solution so that we can trigger a flow once one of our measures, um, which is when is the food going to expire? Once our, our measure hits a certain threshold, we will get a trigger, send this to a Power Automate flow, and again, trigger a request or a prompt asking the AI to create recipes with all of the food in our fridge and all of the ingredients that are about to expire soon. This is then uh, taken into a mail and sent to you for your convenience so that you know exactly, okay, um, this is the day when I need to need to use them up. I've got two or three more days left and uh, it's, it's time to take action so that we don't wasting any food. And we're gonna show you parts of the, the solution. Like I said, first of all, we are um, loading the, the Open Food Facts database and we use the notebook to load it. And uh, this is what it looks like. So what we're doing is uh, we are creating first our lake house, which is the important part. We're we starting with the lake house. Then we are loading food fit the, the zip from Open Food Facts. Uh, we're saving it into the lake house, unpacking it, and then writing everything into the lake house so that we have a reference for our uh, barcodes that we're going to scan with the Power App um, so that we can, can see, okay, what is the product and when it is going to expire, getting some more information about the, the products itself. And By the way, big shout out to the Microsoft uh, Python team. Thank you so much for giving us these great samples that you can install in the Fabric workspaces. They gave us all the ideas to be able to easily download files from the internet and populate our lakeouts. Exactly. So th this is uh, really a, a plug and play solution. So we, we used uh, a lot of the, the code that we already had and um, could use that to create our solution as we wanted to have them. And um, yeah, that last part, write them into the lake house. And uh, after everything is written into the lake house, what we're doing then is uh, we are showing you, quickly showing you the, the scanner app, how this works. So this is the, the barcode scanner app that we are using to fill our fridge or to put all of the products that we have into our fridge. We're reading the barcode. Yeah, it's not uh, not enough. We can also take a picture and uh, check what the what the product is. And then we are gonna to uh, going to to log the product and uh, send it to our fridge so that we know what do we have as uh, products to use. Okay, and this actually triggers our next notebook, which you can see here, the add ingredients to the fridge. Okay, I'll take over here. So the first thing we're doing is we're importing the OpenAI um, library into this into this notebook. Now it's important for anybody who's going to be reproducing this 
if you trigger a notebook using a schedule or in this in our case using a API endpoint um, you can't use the pip magic you can't install OpenAI on the fly it has to be pre-installed with the right VIP version that that you require um, so you'll see at the top the environment is the OpenAI environment we created a specific environment for this with the OpenAI DLL already loaded so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a parameter block that allows us to pass in the parameters from the Power Apps um, workflow. Uh, so that's now going to be passing in a bag of nuts and the barcode. Um, we're passing in both because sometimes we might not find a barcode in the database. It's a huge database with over 3 million items, but there might still be barcodes that it doesn't know. So having a little AI builder um, image detection helps us be a little bit more robust when it comes to figuring out what product we're looking at. Uh, so we, the next step, we're looking up the barcode in the, in the database, and if we find it, then we use that product name. Uh, here comes the fun part, the OpenAI part. Uh, we're now using OpenAI as a food concierge who will tell us how long does a product normally last in the fridge or in the pantry. So this can tell us a cucumber lasts maybe for five to seven days in the fridge and a bag of nuts might last six months in the pantry. Uh, using some clever prompt engineering, we ask OpenAI to give us a good estimate of how long it will last. Now, although we tell OpenAI to tell us always in days, GPT keeps on giving me or us weeks and months, so we have to do a little bit of cleanup. And so the next segment is just cleaning up the response, saying, hey, if it's months, then we take a times 30. If it's weeks, we take a times seven and try to figure out sort of the, the average that might be three to five weeks. So we'll take an average of four weeks and say, okay, this product will last four weeks in the pantry and use that as an expiry date. So we pack that onto the current date and we know roughly when it's going to expire and we're going to save that to the database. Um, that can now be used as a trigger point as soon as the expiry date um, triggers an action. And I'm going to pass that over back to Christian. Yep. Thanks, Alex. So this is the fridge uh, that we now filled with our products um, with the logic that Alex just explained. So. Uh, we have lots of different things in the fridge, lots of different products in the fridge. And this is the, the basis for our model that we created. So really basic semantic model based up on the, the lake house table. And we're doing some really basic calculation to determine, okay, uh, when is the product going to go bad um, with the dates that we just determined by using the AI. And this feeds into a report also really just a basic report that shows us um, how long are these different projects going to last. For example, the pita bread is uh, really a, a longer shelf life item. Um, the vegetable stock will last for, for okay. another year almost. And uh, we have some falafel mix, um, some tomatoes, and the items that we really need to use uh, as soon as possible are the, the chicken breast, mint, some milk, eggs, cucumbers, um, yogurt, etc. So um, this is the, the items that we need to use up fast. With this, uh, we created um, a data activator trigger. So uh, we created a reflex. And um, as you can see, where we're seeing, okay, our yogurt um, is, is going to go bad uh, pretty soon. So uh, we're assuming this is now, now triggering um, our custom action that we defined before. And we're using this custom action to send whenever this trigger hits um, uh, an action to our Power Automate flow. And this is the Power Automate flow. So every time the, the trigger fires everything, every time a product goes under five days or until its expiry date, um, we are, we're getting the trigger. Uh, then we are um, defining the secret, um, the, the API key that we need to um, later lock on to OpenAI and to actually use the services. We're doing some requests based on the data. So we want to know how long certain certain items will last. We know want to know which are the required items that we need to use up, which are the items in the fridge that will last a bit longer so that we can use that information later on, uh, later on in our recipe and create a recipe that not only uses the part of the, the product that is going to, exp going to expire soon, but also everything else that I have in the fridge. And... 
We're doing some formatting, then sending it to OpenAI to actually create the recipe, um, doing, again, some formatting and sending a mail. Now, before, and, before you uh, move on, important tip here. Yeah, we, we actually decided to use an HTTP call to talk to the OpenAI endpoint. Uh, that's mainly because of the, the way that the Hackathon API endpoint is available to us. There is also a custom action that allows you to talk directly to the OpenAI um, environment, and, but that is not Azure OpenAI, that is OpenAI. Yeah, so for us to talk to Azure OpenAI and to talk to the Hackathon endpoint, we ended up using an HTTP call um, to, make that, to make that work. Exactly. Um, thanks. So, um, as mentioned, in the end, we're, we're sending a mail, and the mail that you will receive is something like this. So, um, you get the information uh, about the items that are uh, going to expire, and you get some really nice recipes that not only use up, like I said, the, the items that are going to expire, but also, for example, um, the, the eggplant or the pita bread and falafel mix that is in our fridge that we can use, but are not really, really uh, to be used up soon. So this is our solution. This is what we came up with. We hope you like it. And uh, we think this adds really some value and um, helps battle the food waste. And this is why we are the food fighters. Yeah. And um, we actually added one little bonus feature to the solution as well. Um, Christian, can you just quickly open up the the training Python notebook, and I can walk people through that as well uh, in the Fabric environment. So you might have noticed really good recipe suggestions, but you might have a very specific cooking style. Maybe you love to cook Asian fusion, or maybe you're vegan, and you only want to get vegan recipes provided by um, the, the, the model. Uh, so what we also added to the whole solution is a Python notebook that allows you to effectively fine-tune your own model and use that as your own personal master chef. So in this one here, we're, we're going to be using the pip magic, so pip install to install the um, OpenAI DLL into this notebook. And if you scroll down, uh, a classic parameter block that's just got the um, API key. We're using Key Vault to keep that secure. And then um, the next part is getting the data. So we provided as part of the Git repo a um, a training file, and that training file um, focuses specifically on recipes that are Asian fusion vegan. So a vegan master chef that that really likes to create crazy mixtures between Asian flavors and European ingredients, uh, maybe once in a while with a dumpling mix, uh, maybe a taco twist on it, and, and using that in a fine tuning will really steer the, the GPT assistant down a certain path. And using that, if we scroll down further, uh, we are then going to upload the training file. We're going to run a training directly from Python um, and um, have OpenAI train the model. Now, we had to use the OpenAI API for this in the end because um, the Hackathon API couldn't handle fine tunings. But that's cool. Um, if you want to do it yourself, you can do it um, with OpenAI. Fine tune it. And here's the fun part. This is now using the newly trained model. Uh, where we're telling him you're a, a certain style we like to see. Uh, here are some ingredients, cucumber, capsicum, flour, and soy sauce. And uh, <laughs> this instance came up with a fusion cucumber pancake um, suggestion. So making pancakes uh, that, are, that are quite eggy and floury like a normal pancake, but with some interesting Asian ingredients uh, and a dipping sauce uh, to top with that. I haven't tried the recipe, but I'm actually curious to see what that's going to taste like. Um, so yes, you can even create your own master chef uh, that is going to be cooking just the way you want to uh, based on the ingredients in your fridge. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you um, enjoy the Git repository. Feel free to download all the Python notebooks we've made available for you. We've put the DAX measures in there. Uh, we've also um, created a power platform solution file for you to also install the Power app with the barcode scanner, the image scanner, the um, automate flow that sends it to the Python notebook, and the automate flow that um, 
gets the recipe and sends you an email with the recipe. All of that is in the solution file for you guys to also install within your environment and um, start creating your own food waste um, hacking solutions. Hello, and welcome to our overview. Hello, and welcome to our overview video for our Microsoft Fabric Global AI Hack Project. We've only got five minutes, so let's get right into it. The objective of our project was to take a traditional subject matter area for BI, so accounts payable, and see, can we implement an accounts payable solution that uses as many of these aspects of Fabric as we can, something that uses the new AI capabilities, including Copilot? Can we build a machine learning model using notebooks? Um, and ultimately, we made a predictive model that's going to tell us for a given invoice that has yet to be paid, are we predicting that this is going to be paid early on time or late? And along the way, we use all the capabilities of Fabric to get us there. So to get right into it, um, the main setup of this um, workspace is we have three lake houses. We've kind of split it into a medallion. So we have a bronze, silver, and gold layer. And we have various notebooks that are handling the machine learning modeling and the transformations to go from bronze, silver, to gold. We have a semantic model, and we have a Power BI report that is going to consume the results and bring everything to a, a usable report for the, for the end users. So from a source system perspective, we are using an SAP system. We are landing data directly into OneLake using an ETL tool with ADLS Gen 2 capabilities. So we land Parquet files right into the Bronze Lake House, and we use a few simple cells here to um, transform our column names and then write delta tables to the Silver Lake House. While we're writing our Silver Lake House, it is also useful to have a calendar table and we used the Copilot capabilities in Data Factory, and we had Copilot um, generate quite a bit of the state table. So we had it give us the base state table between two given dates, and then we added many other columns just with prompts. And we'll have all of the prompts that we used in our GitHub repository of how we made the state table with Copilot. It worked pretty well. And then from a dimensional modeling perspective, we are writing our facts and our dims to the gold layer. And our chosen method for this, what we found to be the most um, useful for us is we like to write SQL, so we're just using create or replace statement, uh, create or replace table statements, and we're just writing out, you know, our case statements, our joins, our where clauses, everything we need to make the tables into the final shape that we want them. Uh, we use that in a notebook here, and we write everything to the gold layer. So now I'm going to hand this over to Bob, and he's going to explain a little bit about our machine learning model. Thanks, Bob Buttrick, and I'll be taking you through a quick look at our data exploration and modeling notebook. So after our initial imports, uh, we of course start by fetching and preparing the data for modeling. Uh, so first we did a little uh, exploration of the, the data. So just looking at the, the trend of the payment uh, status category over the last 12 months. This first uh, code block here is just a function that we put together that does some of the, the pre-processing needed uh, to feed into the model. So we had some uh, numeric and categorical transformers that we used. Uh, as well as just some general preparation, splitting the data frames into our uh, train and test. So this is the results of our split. I uh, just did a quick uh, check just to look at the shape of the data, make sure everything's uh, good to feed into the model. Now in the modeling piece. So decided uh, for this project just to use the random forest model, which is kind of my, my go-to in general. Uh, in this case, technically the ultimate result is predicting a category so early, late, or on time. But uh, we decided to actually do a regression and predict the number of days and then finally uh, just convert those to the categories. Uh, our logic there was if the business decides to change what those categories are in the future, uh, saying uh, I think we have it set up as zero to two days uh, before the due date is considered on time. So if the business wanted to change that in the future, it'd be easy just to modify the code instead of uh, retraining a model to predict uh, the categories. Uh, so for the first step in this process, I ran a grid search uh, for a random forest model. So we used all of these different parameters that I ran through. I believe there are 800 and some uh, combinations that we tried with using five-fold cross-validation. Once that uh, completed, I grabbed the best performing uh, parameters for our model, uh, put them in here, and now we're actually training the models using those parameters. Here's the results of our model. So our training R squared uh, value is 0.93 and our test is 0.65. So uh, obviously a bit to be desired on the, the test uh, results and uh, the difference between those numbers between the training and the test kind of indicates some overfitting. So we'll have to circle back and do some additional tweaking to the model and uh, possibly some more feature engineering. Looking at the residuals, so most everything is centered around uh, zero, which is uh, ideal, plus or minus about 50 it looks like, with some outliers out there, but not uh, too terribly. Next we did a look at prediction errors. So this uh, light gray line is uh, the actual values. So that's that's the line that we would like to be at if everything was predicted perfectly. The darker line is what we're at, so a little bit off from there. At our feature importance, the top uh, 30 features that uh, made up 93% of the, the importance. 
and finally, here's the results of our training. So I just created a data frame that uh, showed the actual uh, days earlier or late, our predicted value, and then converted into categories and ultimately the accuracy. And then finally, we're going to take that data frame that we uh, created early on with our uh, unseen, uh, non-clear documents, uh, run that through the model that we created, and then ultimately output what we need to feed into our Power BI dashboard. Okay, so now we're taking the results of that machine learning model. We are using a simple SQL statement to join them into our main fact table and write all of this down to the Gold Lake House. And from there, we're able to complete our semantic model. So we have a simple star schema with our predictions in the fact table. We have our measures. We have our calendar table that Copilot created for us. And we have the rest of the DIMMs we made in the notebook. Uh, one thing to note on the measures here, uh, during the hackathon, we actually had a new feature come out to use Copilot to document our DAX measures. So we went, a lot, we went ahead and we did this for all the DAX measures in this model. They've been documented using Copilot. Uh, it works pretty well. So Copilot was able to generally give us a description that we didn't have to edit much. We were able to more or less just take it and run with it, maybe make a small tweak here and there. Um, but really going to enjoy using Copilot to document the models. Uh, really, I'm looking forward to seeing this feature come to the rest of the objects in a model. And then finally, um, everything is coming together in Power BI to create something that our end users can consume. So this is going to be a set of payables reports implemented um, with aging, payment uh, history and status by vendor. We have all of our before due and overdue balances, our clearing rate. Um, we have everything we would want to know. We have vendor summaries. We're using all of the visualization capabilities of Power BI at our disposal. And then most interestingly, we're taking the results of our predicted model and we are showing those in the same context as our line items. So we can take all of our aging line items, things that are invoices that are coming up to be paid, and we can see, okay, does the model predict that we're gonna be paying this late, earlier on time? And by how many days uh, in relation to the due date are we predicting that's gonna be early, late, or on time? So that just becomes another tool in the toolbox for your accounts payable team to prioritize and to handle their day-to-day -day workflow. So we had a great time developing the solution. Again, we're gonna be continuing to enhance this so it's production ready. And uh, really looking forward to seeing how Microsoft Fabric continues to evolve this year. Um, and thank you so much for considering our submission for the Microsoft Fabric Hackathon. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to my season Beyond Keyboards, Image Similarity Set in Azure Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL. In the next 10 minutes, you will learn how to build vector similarity sets on Azure Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL using the PC vector extension and the Azure AI Vision Multimodal Appendix APIs. My name is Fotnisa Fritu and I'm a Microsoft MVP in Artificial Intelligence based in Greece. I'm interested in cloud technologies, Azure AI and IoT and I maintain a technical blog where I post articles about technologies I'm passionate about. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. So before uh, exploring what vector sex is, let's understand the problem that we are trying to solve. Unlike traditional sex systems that rely on measurement of keywords, tags, or other metadata to retrieve similar images, vector search systems leverage machine learning to capture the meaning of the data. This approach enables users to search based on the intended meaning rather than uh, exact match on keywords. For example, if you remember the key aspects of the movie, you can retrieve uh, the desired film by, <coughs> by describing uh, the scenario without even using the exact keywords found in the original description. So in this session, uh, you will understand the code, you will understand what vector embedding is, and you will explore how a vector set system works. You will also build a simple similarity search application using Azure Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL and the Azure AI Vision Multimodal Embedding API. So, vector search is based on the conversion of abstraction data such as text, images, audio and video into a numerical representation which is called a vector embedding. You can think of a vector embedding as an array containing numerical values. 
These arrays are high dimensional entities, and summarize the information contained in the original data. Vector embeddings can be generated using machine learning models that are capable of <coughs> capturing the meaning of the original data, identifying patterns, and identifying similarities between the data. But what is so special about vector embeddings that makes them so useful? By converting abstraction data into numerical representation, we can measure the similarity of the original data by calculating the, the distance of the corresponding appendix. For example, by visualizing the golden banks into the two-dimensional vector space, we can see that the goals, cat, and kitten, which are semantically similar, are located close together, while the goals, cat, and bus, which are dissimilar, are placed further apart. To calculate similarity, you can use standard distance metrics such as Euclidean distance or similarity metrics such as uh, the cosine similarity. Cosine similarity is actually one of the most widely used similarity metrics in a vector set system. Vector set synthesis course by comparing the vector embedding of a user query with a set of predefined vector embeddings to find a list of vector embeddings that are more similar to the query vector. Vector embeddings are typically stored in vector databases, which are specialized type of database optimized for storing and querying vectors with a large number of dimensions. In this vector search system, it's essential to use the same embedding model for calculating the vector embeddings of an object. In Azure Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL, vector similarity search is enabled by the Pixie Vector Extension. To use this extension, you should first create it using the Select Create Extension command. The Pixel Vector Extension introduces a new data type vector, which we can use when creating a table to indicate that the column will contain vector data. For example, consider that we want to build a table for an art gallery. This table will contain information for its painting, like its style, artist name, a short description, a link to the original image file, and a vector embedding generated from the from the Emacs file. You can also specify the number of dimensions of the vectors, which in our case is equal to 1024. To, to retrieve similar paintings, you can use SQL select statement and the built-in vector operators. For example, uh, this select statement calculates the cosine distance between the query vector and every vector stored in our database, sorts the result by the calculated distance, and then retrieve the five most similar images. Let's see a short demo. For example, we want to find paintings that depict a table with flowers. First, we calculate the the, the vector embedding of our query uses the vectorized text API, and then we we'll use the query vector in our SQL select statement. As you can see, we have uh, retrieved uh, paintings depicting a table of flowers without using any other type of metadata. You can also search for paintings using another painting as a reference. Uh, for example, in this, we will use the still life with flowers painting as a reference. And first, we calculate the vector embedding of our query using the vectorizing as API and then execute a SQL select statement to retrieve the similar painting. And again, we have successfully retrieved paintings that are similar to our reference painting without using any other type of metadata. This type of search is called exact nearest neighbor search because it compares the query vector with every vector stored in the database. And while this type of search provides a perfect record, uh, it can lead to larger search times. So to enhance emphasis when using larger data sets, uh, we can create indexes to enable approximate nearest neighbor search, with straight-off result quality for speed. 
Pixie Vector supports two types of approximate indexes, the inverted file flat or IDF flat index and the hierarchical navigable smart word or XNSW index. The IDF flat index works by grouping the vector embeddings into clusters, also known as Voronoi Rixions on cells, and limiting the cell scope only to the few nearest clusters or is query instead of the uh, entire dataset. The XNSW index is based on the construction of multi-layer proximity graphs. It's one of the most popular uh, best performing algorithms for approximate nearest neighbor cells and is also available for the in the majority of the vector databases. To create an IVF flat index, you can use the create index a statement and specify two parameters, the, the distance metric that you want to use when creating the clusters, for example the cosine distance, and the number of clusters that you want to create, for example 15. It's essential to create the IVF flat index once the table is populated with data, and if you if you add more vector embeddings in your table, you should repeat the index in order uh, to calculate uh, the new cluster centroids. An XNSW can be created using the same command and in this case we should specify two parameters that are related to the construction of the multi-layer graph. Since the, since the XNSW algorithm is pretty complex, I highly recommend reading the relevant research paper in order to understand how these parameters affect the performance of the XNSW index. Let's, let's see a short demo. Again, we are trying to find paintings that depict a table with flowers. We follow the same steps to calculate the query vector and execute the same SQL select statement. As you can see, we are able to retrieve the same paintings obtained using exact nearest neighbor sets, but with a lower uh, sex time. To view the execution plan, you can prefix the SQL select statement with the explain analyzed keywords. If you are interested in this topic, you, uh, you can uh, check out my project on my GitHub repository and you can also find some useful information uh, on Microsoft Docs. Thank you and enjoy the rest day at Python Data Science Day. Hey everyone, my name is Jeffrey, and welcome to today's session on exploring Data Wrangler in VS Code. Um, today we'll be using the free Data Wrangler extension for VS Code to explore, analyze, and clean a data set of Airbnb listings in Seattle. And throughout the journey, we'll be checking out how Data Wrangler will help um, increase the productivity of data scientists and increase the learnings that you get from your data set. So to start off, I'm in VS Code right now, uh, my favorite editor. And I do have the Data Wrangler extension already installed, as you can see right here. Um, you can find this in the VS Code Marketplace. And I also have a Jupyter Notebook open. And I have Pandas loaded, as well as the Airbnb data set as a CSV uh, loaded into my uh, notebook as well. So to in one way to invoke Data Wrangler from the notebook is if you have a data frame, such as DF here, which is my Airbnb data set, if I just type DF, DF.head, or anything that prints out the data frame, you'll see this new uh, open data frame or whatever your variable is in data wrangler button um, in the cell status bar. So feel free to click at this anytime and this will open up the data wrangler extension. When you first launch data wrangler, you'll see a really rich interface of your data. So you can see this is the Airbnb data set. Um, you'll see at the top, uh, all the columns at the top. It'll tell you as well additional information, such as what is the data type of the column, um, any missing or distinct values, and what the percentage of it is relative to the overall data set. Uh, depending on the data type as well, you'll see the summary statistics or what the uh, representation is um, and the histogram of the distribution of the data. So for numeric columns, you can see distribution. Um, for string columns, you'll just see how many distinct values there are. Um, if there's any columns, um, like object columns, you'll see also the frequency. So you can see um, how many of each um, item appears in the column as well. You'll also see at the top a, um, a data shape summary. So you can see how much data you have. And on the left-hand side, you'll get a data summary of 
what are all the columns, um, which of the columns have missing values, um, et cetera. So firstly, let's take a look at uh, what we can do with the data set. So let's quickly look through the data. We can see, um, you can do some really basic filtering and sorts. So let's say we want to look exclusively at the Queen Anne neighborhood here. I see a lot of them. We can actually just invoke a filter right here um, by clicking on the uh, three dots at the top right. We can click Add Filter. Um, let's say uh, equal to, and let's just say Queen Anne. And we can see as I'm doing this live, Data Wrangler automatically updates the view and the grid to only contain the information um, that I'm providing here. So you can see it's only Queen Anne now, and we can see we've filtered it down. And all these stats update um, live as I'm actually updating the filter. So that's great as well. Um, let's just undo this filter because we want to look at all the data set. But if we recall, when we go back into our full data summary, we can see there's a lot of missing values in some of the columns, such as square footage. Um, we want to find where square footage is because um, this is a pretty big data set. We can actually just use this go to column feature. Um, it shows everything. If I can just search for the word square feet, square feet, and it'll jump nicely to this column. So I think because we want to do a little bit more exploring and a little bit more data cleaning and analyzing, we'll want to switch from this viewing mode, um, which is what Data Wrangler opens by default, into editing mode. So viewing mode kind of lets you explore the data really quickly, apply some like basic sorts of filters, look at the data, um, look at the distributions of the data as we did earlier. But if you want to do um, any more cleaning or um, any manipulation of the data sets, uh, we'll want to go into editing mode where you can leverage a lot of Data Wrangler's built-in operations to do such. So now that I'm in editing mode, you'll see a couple things change. So one thing you'll see is now this new operations panel on the uh, left-hand side, top left. Uh, what this does is this showcases all of the Data Wrangler's built-in operations um, that you can apply. So they're all grouped by category of operation. And um, you'll see in a minute of how I can actually use these operations to help with cleaning the data set in a much faster manner than just writing code. Um, the left-hand side, you'll also see a new panel called Cleaning Steps. And again, this will be um, self-explanatory when you see it in a minute. But as you're applying operations and doing different transformations to your data set, you'll see this start to populate with the different steps that you actually did. So you can keep, it's kind of like a history. You can keep track of everything you did. And the bottom side here, you'll see, and again, in a minute, um, this will show a live preview and automatically generate the code required to make that transformation. Um, so let's get back into it. So um, like I mentioned earlier, square footage was one of the columns that we saw that had a lot of missing values. And we can confirm that here. When we look at the missing, we'll see 97% of values are missing here. Um, so we'll probably want to generally rule of thumb, like this is a lot of columns. We can't really, um, a lot of missing values. We can't really impute m many of these because there's just so many that are missing. So it might be just easier to get rid of this column. Um, so one way we can do that is we can click on the top right side. We can click. Um, drop columns here showcases some of the most commonly used operations, but if you want to get access to all of them, it's that operation panel you saw on the left. So when you actually invoke an operation here, which is um, I'm dropping columns here, you'll see a few things change. So you'll see a diff of the view. So if folks are familiar with um, GitHub, um, this is kind of like a diff of what's actually happening to the data. This one's a pretty simple one because we're just dropping the, the column. So it highlights everything that's going to be um, removed in red and changed in green. So this um, in this case, it's just dropping the columns. So you'll see everything is red. Um, you'll also see this code was automatically generated by Data Wrangler as well. So it gives you, um, you can also look at the code to make sure that's doing the correct operation. And if everything looks good to you, you can click Apply. And once I click Apply, you'll see that that um, that column no longer exists in my data set, as well as you'll see this new drop, operate, or drop columns in my cleaning step. So again, this is what I mentioned earlier, where as you're cleaning the data, you'll see this start to populate. Um, another thing we can do is if we look back into the missing values, we'll see review scores rating also had a good amount of uh, missing values. So we want to handle that. So let's find that um, by searching for review score ratings here. And this one only has, we're looking at 17%. So most of the data is pretty clean here. Most of the data is intact. So we'll actually probably want to keep this column um, or most of the data in this column. So what we can do is, again, you can see some of the missing values here. We'll want to just, instead of dropping the entire column, we can handle some of these missing values. So we can say, um, one thing we can do is we can just drop the missing values. There's other strategies as well, but in this case, we'll just drop the, the values that are non-existent. So what's great is we can see as I go into my preview of the operation, you'll see all the columns that are actually being dropped, or sorry, all the rows that are being dropped highlighted in red. So it gives you a very visual indicator of what's actually happening to your data. And again, you'll see 
the code automatically being generated at the bottom. And you'll see um, a new set of st like uh, st column statistics on your data. So you can now see if I applied this, the missing values become zero. Um, so if everything looks good to me here, I can click, uh, go ahead and click apply. Um, so now that I've done the review scores rating, um, we'll see there's still a few missing values, but there's not as much anymore. So we'll, um, we'll for the sake of time, we'll get into exploring some of the data set as well. So let's go, let's look at the price column because um, as an Airbnb data set, a lot of us when we're booking Airbnbs, we care a lot about the price of the place. And that's one thing I think we'll wanna analyze in this data set and see how price compares to different bedrooms, bathrooms, different neighborhoods, as we saw in some of the other data in the data set. Um, one thing we'll notice is that price is actually an object. And this is likely because you'll see like there's a dollar sign here, there's also dots here. So it's not fully represented as a number. And which is also why we're not getting this histogram. So we we'll want to see, we we'll want to convert this um, from like a human readable price to something that's more machine readable. That's just a raw value. Um, typically, if you're doing this outside data wrangler, you probably have to write some code to figure out how to uh, remove the uh, the uh, dollar sign as well as the dots. But because the like the numbers are not standardized, right? You might have like um, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, etc. It's not as trivial, and you'll have to probably look up online. Um, Data Wrangler actually has this really cool built operation called um, by example. Um, so we can do string transform by example here. And what this does, it's um, if folks are familiar with uh, Excel here, it's very similar to Excel where it tries to recognize a pattern that you give and tries to impute the rest of the values. So in this case, we're going to be um, giving uh, creating a new column by example. Let's say price clean since we're cleaning up the price here. And then we'll, it says enter an example. So let's just say we want to extract 85 from this. Um, it tries to impute the rest of it. Um, it gives this question mark because it's not fully sure on this one. It gives, um, so it's saying, hey, enter another example. And we can see here it didn't do it correctly. It thought I was trying to pull just the first two numbers of, every, of everything. So here I'm going to update the example and set it to 150. And now you can see because of these two examples, that's able to smartly impute the rest of what it should be deriving. Um, based on these two examples it gave. So you can see now it's like 975 for this, um, but it still remembers that if it's just 80, then, or if it's just two digits, it'll pull that out as well. And again, the best part is you'll see because this we're in Data Wrangler, um, it automatically generates the code for you and provides that transparency or trust um, to you as the user. So you know exactly what it's doing. It's not behind some sort of black box here. And you'll see um, exactly what it's doing. So you can see it's finding um, it's the index, it's finding all the values between the dollar sign and the dot. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do here. So if everything looks good, and again, this is a little preview mode. If everything looks good, I can click apply. And now you'll see this is part of my data set um, as a new call. And now that I've added this price clean, I probably don't need this original price anymore. So I'm going to drop this column. Um, and again, sim something similar I did earlier. And one thing I'll notice is I still don't see this histogram and it's because this price clean is still an object because I'm ex just extracting at this value. So I want to convert this um, with this change column type operation from object to, um, there's, a lot of op there's a lot of different types here, but let's just say float32 as an example. And again, here you can see the diff that's happening. So you can see that um, this is the previous column and this is what's actually going to be added or what's going to be changed. Um, you can see it's changing all the float and now we'll start to see that histogram here. So if that looks good, we'll click apply. And now we can kind of see some more data about the price. So we can see the minimum price here is $22 a night at for an Airbnb and the maximum price is around $1,000, which is pretty expensive. We can see the average is probably around here. So if I want to see more information about price clean, I can actually click on this column and it now focuses the summary on this specific column and it gives me more information. So I can see things like the mean price um, uh, or the standard deviation, the minimum price, um, et cetera. And so if you want to see a specific data on a specific column, you just click that column and it updates it here. But if you want to go back, you can unselect it and you can see the data summary of everything. Um, but yeah, $1,000 a night is pretty nice. So let's, uh, let's just quickly sort it um, just for my own curiosity's sake to see maybe what, the, like, what this place is. Um, so if I look through, so now we can see this is the $1,000 a night place. Um, we can see that it's a four person place. There's only one bathroom, two bedrooms. I don't know if it deserves $1,000 a night. Um, it is a house though, so it is pretty big. And we can see it's the neighborhood of Ravina. Um, but one thing I also noticed is that this column says availability 365, which kind of represents how many nights of the year in the last 365 years it's actually available. And we can see it's available for almost all the year. So I think this person likely overpriced their Airbnb. 
Um, and that's why there's just so many nights that it's available. So that's another cool or interesting thing we're already learning from this data set. Um, one thing we'll also want to do is, um, given that, um, we can see some of the availability is zero, which means it's just not available to book at all. I think if we want to get an accurate representation of the data, we can actually filter out anything that's available um, for zero nights, which means it's just fully booked out or that person's just not even um, providing or listing this Airbnb or something that's available like every single day, which basically means that it's just probably overpriced and nobody wants it. So let's just say greater than as the condition and say greater than zero. Um, and then we can also add another filter. We can say availability 365 again, and we can say, let's say less than um, 365. So again, as you can see, as I'm typing live, it's updating both the code live and the data grid live. So you can see what's actually happening um, with your data set very interactively. Um, so here I'm just removing everything. I can click apply. And now we can see the max and min has updated here. So now that the price is being clean and we're getting rid of some of the outliers for the availability, let's see how the price, um, let's see how like things like the, let's say property type affect the price. So we can do a classic group buy over here. So let's select property type. Let's go and search for a group buy and aggregate. And let's aggregate on price. Um, so price claim, that's the operation we, or that's the column we just added. And by default, it does count. And what count is, is just showing you how many of these property types there are. So we can see um, super quickly, let's just uh, bring this down here. We can see most of them, at least from what I see, yeah, most of the uh, property types here are apartments, of course. Um, I'm sure that's probably what's the most abundant. Um, we'll see the second most is houses. And we can also see a distribution of some of the more interesting or unique things. So let's just click apply here. Um, and let's see what else there is. So there's also things such as, um, campers, RVs, um, there's a boat, there's there's three boats, which is kind of cool. So maybe we'll look into that a little bit more. Uh, we can also see like some tree houses, townhouses as well. So this is kind of interesting to see like the distribution of what people are actually offering in Seattle. But I did count earlier. I actually want to see if any of these property types change by price. So instead of count, uh, what we can do is let's say you already committed an operation as I did before. I can actually jump back to this any of these previous operations at any time um, and I can go edit it. So here I'm going back to the group by and aggregate. And instead of count, let's just say I want to get the uh, the mean. So what's the average price for each of these um, each of these property types? Uh, so you can see here now I can see the average price of a condo. Um, not surprisingly, it's probably more expensive than an apartment. Um, here's the average price of the house. It's $130 a night. Um, and we can see the boat obviously is by far the most expensive at $513 a night as well. So some more interesting facts. Um, about our data. Another thing we might want to do is instead of, so let's just click uh, update. So now we can see, uh, I just updated the previous operation, but I actually want to aggregate. We saw something like um, the neighborhood as well, right? So not just property type uh, might affect the price of the Airbnb, but also the neighborhood of where it's at. So we're going to kind of check that out. So we can actually just delete the previous operation by just clicking this. And if we recall, there's this neighborhood um, column here. So let's just group by this neighborhood column instead of the property type and see how that actually affects price. So again, I can click on neighborhood. I can do group by and aggregate again. And we'll aggregate on price one more time. And by default, it's count again. So we can see um, count just gives us a really good distribution of where um, all the neighborhoods are or where the most common neighborhoods are for Airbnbs. Um, so if you want to do this, we can actually just quickly click apply, sort descending, just to make it look easier. So we can see the most of the Airbnbs are going to be Capitol Hill. Um, these are, um, if you're not familiar with Seattle, these are some of the more centrally located places. And again, I think the lower values, if I just scroll all the way down, like these are kind of places that are um, a little bit further away from the city. So the, again, um, another thing we can do, is, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, we'll want to change from count again to mean. So we can see the average price rather than just the number. And so we can kind of see what is the, kind of like the most expensive areas, right? Um, so if I scroll down or if I sort by descending, we can see this neighborhood of Portage Bay as well as Westlake have the most expensive um, average Airbnbs per night. And again, if I scroll down, we can see um, where the some of the cheaper ones are per night as well. Um, so let's just go back. And another thing we'll want to do is we saw earlier that there are bathrooms and bedrooms as well. Um, so we want to see maybe how the neighborhood affects bathrooms and bedrooms. So let's just say uh, we can also, um, instead of just aggregating on one column, we can say, let's say bedrooms here. 
And instead of count again, we'll go back to mean, which is going to represent the average number of bedrooms for the neighborhood. And we can do the same for bathrooms. So let's say mean. And again, we can see, again, this all update live as I'm making these modification, as well as the code updating live. So this is just one of the power, one of the, um, uh, one of the benefits of using Data Wrangler is rather than just working in a notebook where you don't really know what's happening until you actually execute the code and you've got to write some extra code to visualize it all, Data Wrangler is kind of just doing it automatically for you as you interact with the data um, with the UI. So again, if after this aggregation, we can kind of see um, Alki, um, this neighborhood of Alki has around maybe 1.8 bedrooms, right, on average, and 1.3 bathrooms. But we can see maybe somewhere that's smaller, like this neighborhood, only has an average of just one bedroom and one bathroom um, in the neighborhood. Um, so again, it gives you just additional information uh, of can, of course, you can just write this group by on your own, but this just makes it a lot easier to visualize um, and do uh, within Data Wrangler. So let's just update this. And these numbers right now, uh, because I'm sure, let's see, uh, these were float 64, so we have a lot of different decimal places. Uh, we want to clean this up a little bit. So let's actually round all these. So we can go into our operations, um, numeric, because these are number columns. And we have some operations, built-in operations to help round the numbers to make it easier to view. So let's go into round. And let's say we want to set it to two decimal places, right? And again, we can see this update live. You can see this is going from this super long number <laughs> into um, a rounded um, two decimal place number. Um, here, obviously, there's just one, so it's going to go there. And again, get the code for it, and we can click Apply. So we can see how quickly we went from just this massive data set into something that's a lot more readable and gives a lot more information um, to your eyes uh, in a much nicer viewing way of rounded numbers rather than the whole super long number as well. So if this looks good, you can also export it as well. But one thing, one last thing I want to showcase, um, I'm just going to undo some of the previous things we did, is if we want to actually do any machine learning on this as well, we'll want to convert some of the text into numbers, something that's machine readable. So one example of this is this host is superhost column. Um, this is supposed to represent true and false to tell you if that host is a superhost or not. But T and F are not easily um, uh, represented by uh, to a computer. So I want to convert this to a number. So we'll have this operation um, under formulas called one hot encode. And this is a very common operation to convert your numeric or your string columns to actually, or categorical columns, sorry, to a number column. And we can see now what uh, one hot encode does is it's going to change, like uh, it's going to create two columns out of this and it's going to set it to one if it's false uh, for that column or one if it's true for that column. So you can see here the true becomes one here, it's becomes zero and removes that original column. So I can click Apply. And now um, this makes it a lot easier for, um, for me to do any apply any machine learning algorithms to this as well. So I, we did a lot today. Um, there was a lot. <laughs> I think there's also a lot of operations that we still didn't go through. Um, if I just open a lot of these operations, well, you'll see a lot of different string operations we can do, like capitalizing the text, um, any date type formatting as well. Uh, we can also calculate text length. There's also some scheme operations. So if you want to clone or duplicate your column, rename the column as well. So a lot of different operations that Data Wrangler supports. And if there's an operation you want to do that's not built in, we can also just you can also just start typing code. So if I want to remove this ID column because this just seems like it's the Airbnb ID, I can just maybe just even take this example, right? I can do df equals df dot drop columns equals ID. Oh, there's, um, sorry, Peggy, there was one. I think there's like a bug that just. <laughs> so if there's an operation that's not supported here on Data Wrangler as well, um, we can also always type in any operation as well. So if there's any operations that um, you want to write, if you just want to write Python code as well, you can type Python code here and it'll automatically update live in the grid. So earlier, we just saw a bunch of operations that you can do that Data Wrangler does support. But if there aren't any operations or if there's something custom you want to write or an operation that's not built in um, supported by Data Wrangler right now, you can also just enter this box and just type in any piece of code that you would like. And anytime you write code here, it'll automatically reflect live in the screen as well. So again, you get the same benefits of Data Wrangler of having it very interactive, showing you what's happening to the data. But you can choose to whether to write code if you prefer that, or you can use one of the built-in operations and interact with the UI as well. 
So once uh, we did, we accomplished a lot of different steps today. We can see we did like nine different steps, not even including the ones that we undid or deleted or changed. Um, but once they're kind of done, we can, um, we can quickly take a look as a sanity check of previewing everything we did earlier. So we can see all the pieces of code that we wrote or had data regular write for us. Um, all the different operations also very nicely commented as well. So if you don't exactly remember what you did uh, based on the code, it'll tell you in human readable text of what's actually happening. Um, if everything looks good to you, we have we can jump to the export menu at the very top. So you'll see there's different ways we can actually bring this back. Because um, if you recall from the very beginning of our talk, we started within a Jupyter notebook um, to get to this data set. Um, but there's different ways to go back to the notebook or um, export somewhere else as well, if you'd like. Um, so the common one is to export to notebook, which will bring this piece of code back to the notebook. There's also exports file. So let's say you want to, you start off with the data frame, but you wanted to save it as like a CSV file or give it to a coworker working with Excel, you can do that as well. Or we can just copy all this code to this button and you can paste it into GitHub. You can paste it as a Python file as well, but there's different ways to export all of this. Um, but the main um, artifact or the thing that you're generating with Data Wrangler is that piece of code or the data as well. So in this case, if we want to jump back to the notebook, we can just quickly click export to notebook. And boom, we're just back into that cell right after we launch Data Wrangler in. And you'll see it puts it into, it generates a piece of a comment saying that, hey, this was generated by Data Wrangler, um, but also puts it into a very nice, clean function. So we can see uh, everything that we saw earlier, puts in a nice, clean function, creates a copy of it. So again, uh, we're not modifying that original data set. So once you're in Data Wrangler, you don't have to worry about um, deleting anything or making any changes because we're modifying a copy of the data set, um, it, it kind of facilitates or lets you explore the data without having to worry about making any um, unwanted modifications or, or um, destructive modifications as well. And now in the data set, we can just quickly run the code again and we'll get the latest data or the clean data. Um, but that was in a nutshell um, of ex exploring Data Wrangler um, in VS Code. Um, as a recap, we started with a notebook in VS Code today. We had an Airbnb data set of different Airbnb listings in Seattle. Um, we loaded that into our notebook. Um, we opened Data Wrangler um, with the Launch Data Wrangler button. Um, and then once in Data Wrangler, we did a lot of exploration. Um, we looked through the different columns of data. Um, we cleaned up the data, so we removed a lot of the missing values. Um, we also tried to convert some of the, the types of data, right? So if you remember the price, it had like that dollar sign, so we cleaned it up as well. Uh, we tried to do some uh, one-hot encoding as well as some group buys. Um, and then we finally, once everything was good, we kind of exported it back into the notebook and we get that piece of code here and we can continue on with what we're doing. And of course, you can always enter data wrangle anytime within the notebook as well. Um, but uh, this is just in a nutshell of what we can do with Data Wrangler. So thank you everyone for joining my session. And if you'd like to learn more about Data Wrangler, it's free to download on the VS Code Marketplace by such searching for the keyword Data Wrangler as well. Or if you want to learn more about the documentation or anything, you can just go to aka.ms slash data wrangler. So thank you, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. We see that a lot of people are actually joining us again. Um, we're guessing probably after lunch. <laughs> um, and yeah, we got a lot of comments saying like Data Wrangler is awesome. Um, Visual Studio Code team is actually working uh, closely with the Data Wrangler extension team to bring that experience into the native notebook experience as well. Um, so tune in for that. It'll probably happen in the next month or two um, to replace the existing kind of data viewing experience, which you can't really like wrangle clean or visualize data with right now. Okay. Um, but you can obviously with the Data Wrangler presentation that we just saw. So we'll be able, you'll be able to do that um, coming very, very soon. Cool, hot yeah. off the press. That's awesome. Yep. Um, all right. And now we have a, a live presentation speaker here, um, Aaron. Um, he will be talking about Fabric for uh, Python developers. Um, very excited to have him here. Hey. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Aaron. Hey. hey, I'm excited to be here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. And you can see my screen. Uh, and we'll Not see your yet. screen soon. There you go. I think so. And we'll get out of the way so you can get your presentation. OK, sounds good. If anything goes wrong, please feel free to jump right in and let me know. Will do. Great. So hi there, everyone, and thanks for having me at this Python Data Science Day. It's exciting to follow Jeffrey. I work with him, and we'll take a look in a little bit at Data Wrangler in another form in Microsoft Fabric, which is the product I work on. 
The topic of the presentation today is Python programming in Microsoft Fabric. Fabric is a new unified data platform that combines multiple Azure solutions into one analytics offering for the era of AI. I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, my name is Aran, and I'm a product manager on the Fabric data science team. So that's one of several workloads that are combined into the product. The focus of this talk is going to be providing an overview of Microsoft Fabric that's geared more toward Python programmers as opposed to Spark developers who are a lot of our audience. I'm going to discuss some features like collaborative code authoring with Fabric Notebooks, custom library management with Fabric Environments, and machine learning with Fabric Experiments and Models, which are standardized on MLflow. One of our main value propositions is a simplified Spark experience, as I said, with you know, session startup times in a matter of seconds. But Fabric also facilitates a lot of Python development with tools like Data Wrangler, built-in, Copilot, Assistance, and more. If you stick with me, you'll get a walk through uh, some common workflows in Fabric uh, and a preview of upcoming features that are geared toward Python developers. So we don't have very long, but I did want to begin just with a brief summary of Microsoft Fabric, which went into public preview last year at Build and became generally available last fall uh, at Ignite. Our CVP, Arun Ulog, likes to say that, you know, in a world awash with data, big data coming from everywhere, our organization is striving to help enterprises turn that data into some sort of competitive advantage. These days, we know AI is driving a lot of innovation in the analytics space. The good news of that is that businesses have tailor-made products for every element of their workflow. If you take something like you know, data ingestion, data preparation, data warehousing, there are so many tools that are cropping up to address those needs. The bad news of all this innovation coming with AI is that there's fragmentation that results from so much different tooling. Different products have different subsystems, there are different classes of products, different vendors, and integration for businesses can be really complex, fragile, and expensive. So that's where Fabric comes in. Our goal is to provide one unified data platform with best of breed capabilities across all of these analytics workloads. So we want to reduce the fragmentation of the modern data stack and make it easier within business organizations for different people, different roles to collaborate. We combine a range of workloads in Fabric for everything from data ingestion to data engineering and data science to business intelligence and visualizations with Power BI. And this is all one AI powered platform built atop of one lake and purview with a single sign on, a single navigation model, a single security model, and so forth. So we've brought Power BI, Synapse uh, Data Engineering, Data Science, you know, Data Factory the next generation of all these experiences into one price performant and easy to manage modern analytics solution. Fabric is open at every layer with no proprietary lock-ins. We empower business users with deeply integrated office and teams experiences. So, you know, it feels kind of like you're working together on a you know, PowerPoint presentation or on a Word document, but instead of one drive, it's one lake that you're working atop of, bringing users with different roles and experiences into one place. And we deliver AI co-pilots to accelerate productivity across analytics so that you can discover insights and create you know, custom solutions with your own data. One part of this is data science. So that's what my team within Fabric focuses on. We're working to make machine learning more accessible to more users and particularly business users. So our goal is really for data scientists and developers to work alongside data engineers, but also business experts and, and domain experts, the people who really sort of need to analyze that data and then you know, present it to their own teams uh, within enterprises. During the next part of the session, I'm gonna show off some of the features in Fabric that are most relevant to Python programmers from that co-authoring experience in notebooks to our machine learning uh, and model and experiment tracking solutions that are built on top of MLflow. Data science in Fabric overall is designed to provide easy and secure access to lake-centric data uh, it's designed to be developer friendly, so to have you know rich, uh, easy experiences for you to work in a notebook, in a cloud-based environment, or you know locally in the IDE of your choice. We want to have rich ML tools like our Synapse ML library, and we want to promote collaboration again. So the ideal is that it's easy for different members of an organization to hand off work from one to another, uh, and for businesses to collaborate in that way. So unified data access, secure sharing of code and models and experiments—that's all really key to what we do. 
Uh, before I take a look through a kind of tasting menu of different features for Python programmers, I wanted to pop into the live product for a moment, if you'll come with me. So I'm going to switch screens one sec uh, and take you into Fabric. So this is the view you'd see as a data scientist. We have these persona optimized experiences where, you know, in bringing together all these different tools, we still want to allow people to personalize. So in this case, the data science view is really optimized for the ML model and experiment artifacts, which are dedicated items that live inside a Fabric workspace. Uh, and also the notebook, which is its own artifact for code authoring and filling in these ML models and experiments. We also have an environment artifact, which I'll talk more about, uh, and some other artifacts that are coming into play. So you'd address this by working on a data science project within Microsoft, and, and you'd have a workspace for that. This is a pretty lightweight concept. So on the side of the Fabric screen, you can navigate between different workspaces for different projects. Uh, as you see, you can have different artifacts live in that workspace. So we have a notebook, an ML experiment, and an ML model. It's easy to get started with new artifacts, uh, to upload you know, data uh, browse from different places, to create deployment pipelines, manage access, and sort of configure your workspace settings. Uh, and then from there, you, know, you can go into, say, a given notebook where you might be training a model, accessing data you know, from an attached lake house, again, all unified, all within Fabric. Uh, you might be deploying that model or generating batch predictions with the model. You can write those predictions back to the lake house, and then you can read them you know, from Power BI or have them served to a visualization uh, layer. In this view, we have a machine learning experiment. So this is kind of the logical container for a lot of the work that data scientists do. You're going to be familiar with this if you use MLflow, uh, an open source platform for managing the machine learning lifecycle. We have a lot of those you know, metrics and parameters logged here visually to make it easier to work on that process. Uh, you can view a run list for your experiment, and you can save uh, any run of an experiment as a model version. And so then in your model, you would be able to look at both the underlying files of any version, uh, see the parameters and the details, and also embark on a series of you know, pretty quick steps to do things like deploying the model um, you know, or copying code for a batch job. So I'm going to hop back to my deck uh, and show you some of the features sort of uh, tailored more specifically to data scientists. The first is our notebooks. So our notebooks and Fabric are going to be familiar to anyone who's worked with Jupyter, but here they're optimized for collaboration and data connectivity. So we have real-time co-authoring experiences that let you collaborate with your team members uh, on things like machine learning workflows the same way you would on you know, a shared Word document or a PowerPoint deck. So there's you know, authoring uh, at the same time, but there's also commenting and, and tagging with review and, and comments. It's really kind of similar to Office in that sense. Our notebooks are also seamlessly integrated with the rest of the data and fabric, the data sources, so that you can connect to more than 100 sources really in a matter of clicks, browsing data you know, in the cloud or from different places. You can attach lake houses, as I showed to a given notebook, uh, and drag and drop in code snippets really simply that let you explore that data. Uh, and our notebooks are also hooked up with source control and Git, so you, know, you can back up and version your work, revert to previous versions uh, or stages of that work, and collaborate you know, on Git branches as well. Uh, and that's all kind of wrapped up in this artifact, which is the sort of first stop for developers you know, writing code to populate things like experiments or models or uh, you know, other machine learning artifacts in the workspace. Now, I hope you'll forgive me during a Python session for doing a little plug for Spark, but I did want to talk about our Spark experiences briefly because in Fabric, they're designed to be really easy. So this is a Python session, but you know I did just want to call out that in Fabric, you can get started with Spark in a matter of seconds. Our starter pools come pre-wired, so that spares you the work of having to set up clusters or do a lot of the work that you might have to do in a you kind of platform as a service product. Uh, and for more complex use cases, you can still go and create new pools with customized settings. Uh, and take advantage of things like our high concurrency mode to uh, have Spark sessions kind of span multiple notebooks. And again, although much of Fabric is geared toward those Spark use cases, we're going to soon offer a lighter weight native Python notebook that more closely resembles the kind of experience you have working in Jupyter. So you'll be able to switch between built-in kernels and Python versions in Fabric and to transition seamlessly from small scale explorations in you know, a Python notebook to larger scale operations in Spark. And all the while, you can maintain a really uh, tight integration with you know, your business intelligence ecosystem.
Alrighty, the next topic that I wanted to just take a look at was the fabric environment artifact, which I showed a little bit in the live tool. So in a fabric notebook, you can manage Python and R libraries the same way you would, you know, in another place with inline installation using commands like pip install. But you can also customize and configure your workspace with the use of these dedicated environment artifacts. So there's a UI that allows you to kind of track the different uh, installations, uh, consolidate all of your settings for development in a single place, and then attach these environments as their own artifacts to different notebooks. The environments are integrated with CICD and uh, our APIs for tracking and management is really just a way to kind of unlock additional flexibility for your projects and also define it in a way that, you know, persists in the UI and is visible as its own sort of thing, you know, an artifact that kind of spans the different development environments in Fabric. Now, the features I'm showing off live inside of Fabric, as you've seen, but if you prefer to work in VS Code dark mode, as a lot of people do, uh, we've got you covered. From a Fabric notebook, you can easily launch the VS Code extension and take advantage of just that amazing IDE uh, to explore your Fabric workspaces and your Fabric notebooks and Spark jobs and lake houses. So, you know, you can work in the browser or locally, and soon we'll be offering debugging support for the remote VS Code experience as well. Uh, we're big fans of, of VS Code and we really benefit so much from the work that DevDiv does. Uh, you know, it's crucial to us to be able to let our customers use the tooling they prefer, and, and VS Code is really state-of-the-art there, of course. While I'm talking about VS Code, I do want to give another shout-out to Data Wrangler, which uh, if you caught Jeffrey Mew's session just before this, you'll be familiar with. Data Wrangler is a VS Code extension from the geniuses at Microsoft's developer division. It allows you to seamlessly explore uh, and clean data in an Excel-like environment that is really immersive and visually friendly. So it's designed in part for newer data scientists and developers to kind of get onboarded to the work of data preparation, but it's also designed to facilitate you know, work for even experienced developers because data preparation and exploration really can be a hassle and, and a drag. So there are a range of features here, as Jeffrey demonstrated, to help users identify and address errors or inconsistencies, fill in missing values, you know, create new columns, one hot encoding, you name it. There are built in visualizations uh, in the headers of these columns. Uh, and there's a library of code operations that can be applied in a couple of clicks. So that's all done from the UI, but crucially, as you're transforming the data, you're getting steps in Python. You're getting the code that corresponds to those steps. So everything is transparent and reproducible, and you can land it back in the notebook afterward as this uh, animation is showing. So really what we're doing here is streamlining data preparation without sacrificing the reliability and the familiarity of Python. And we're very lucky to have been able to collaborate with Jeffrey's team and DevDiv to make Data Regular available inside of Fabric, where I also want to point out you can open both Pandas data frames and Spark data frames. So we give you the ability to take a larger data frame and sample it down uh, and really produce both Python code and Spark code. You can do kind of translations seamlessly. So Data Wrangler in Fabric will translate your Pandas steps to PySpark if you're working on a PySpark you know, scenario on a Spark data frame. And this makes it much easier to handle a very familiar problem of kind of uh, switching between Pandas and Spark, like scaling up from one to another when you're working on data transformation. A lot of customers have talked to us about that being a kind of familiar hassle, you know, sampling down to do your analysis, but then you need to scale back up to apply, you know, whatever steps you finalize to the larger data set. Data Wrangler tries to make it easier to do that uh, and to switch from those sort of lighter weight exploratory analysis tasks to heavyweight transformation on PySpark. Uh, so there's support for custom operations, so we handle a lot of translation. And we're also going to have new features coming in including the ability to translate natural language into pandas or PySpark code. So really taking advantage of AI to just make things easier and more seamless for data scientists working in Fabric. Once you've done that, cleaned and prepared your data, Fabric makes it easy to build machine learning models too. So this is really a lot of the, the crux of my work and, and where we get excited. Uh, the, the data science product is built on top of MLflow. So that's a versatile, you know, open source platform for managing workflows and artifacts across the ML lifecycle. You can get started in Fabric from a set of uh, data science samples that we have, which are end-to-end -end for you know common use cases across Python and R. Uh, you can manage ML experiments and models as dedicated artifacts in that Fabric workspace. So there's a UI that goes along with each of them, uh, and you can manage and, and manipulate those artifacts using the UI or using your notebook. 
Uh, we have experiences to compare experiment runs and register model versions from experiment runs. And we have support for auto logging too. So if you're writing code in a notebook, uh, MLflow is going to really just track those metrics and parameters for you and will land them in your artifact without much hassle. Uh, and then once you've trained and registered a model, you can use it for batch inferencing from your notebook or from the UI. There's a code first application, you know, where you use our predict function to, you know, basically apply your MLflow packaged model for batch predictions, just, you know, with a few different parameters. Then you can write those predictions to your lake house or, you know, place them wherever you need to. There's a low code counterpart for predict our function where you can kind of just go through a wizard in the UI and specify where you want to take data from to put it into your model, how you want to map it from your source data to your model, and then where you want to land the destination data. And then very soon in Fabric, we're also going to be allowing you to deploy Fabric models to real-time endpoints uh, in a matter of clicks. So we built a solution on top of uh, you know, a container service that lets you prop up these models basically to just be accessed via simple you know, REST API calls, and we'll have a UI component for that too. So taking things like deployment uh, in real-time scenarios and stripping away a lot of the configuration so it's very easy to get started out of the box once you train the model. It shouldn't take very long. I would be remiss not to talk about AI. So let me just switch the slide. It looks like it's getting stuck. Give me one moment. I think my screen is freezing, but uh, there we go. This is a big topic, so maybe just adding a little anticipation. Uh, across Fabric, we're building in experiences that allow users to take advantage of next generation AI with their data. So for my team, you know, thinking about data science and data engineering, we want to accelerate tasks like data exploration and prep and ML modeling. This starts with co-pilots that are built into Fabric experiences to accelerate your productivity and help you take advantage of your data. We're also enabling users to tap into Azure OpenAI models and AI plugins to deliver you know, those experiences. Um, so again, AI-powered insights that help you understand business data, but also help you bridge the gap between insights related to that data and then you know, the corresponding actions. Alrighty, my, I think I'm getting a little bit of lag, but just bear with me while I get the next slide up. There we go. So co-pilots in Fabric take the look of, you know, a kind of chat-based assistant by your side at every stage, but you can also leverage co-pilot directly in the notebook. So here, the idea is, you know, you can have a chat pane that you sort of talk to, uh, or in the context of a code cell, you know, you can generate code using the AI connection and, and count on the AI to be aware of the data in your lake house as well as the data in your data frame. So, you know, magic commands for natural language answers is, is one like obvious benefit of this, but there's also that kind of more familiar chat-based experience. I wanted to show off a little bit of a demo prepared by one of my teammates for how Copilot can help accelerate data science and data engineering. So I'm gonna to switch to that now and hope that the audio takes over. Let's take a look to see how we're integrating Copilot for data science. Here I am in a notebook with the same e-bike rental data that we've been working with. I've loaded some data frames and I could start writing code manually but let's see how Copilot can help. Let's open up the Copilot task pane. I'm going to collapse this pane over here so we can see more of the notebook. And let's get started. Right away, I have some suggested prompts to help me understand my data and how to analyze it. Let's ask to see some just suggestions of how to visualize things. I get a good list of options and I could ask Copilot to help with any of these. First, I want to just get a basic column chart of trips by station. All I need to do is ask Copilot for help. I can answer my prompt and Copilot looks at my data and generates the code for me. This lets even someone who's just getting started with Python to get up and running quickly. Now that I have the code, I can insert it into the notebook and run it. Right away, I see that the San Francisco Caltrain station has the most trips starting from it. That's interesting. 
But now let's ask to get a heat map of trip duration between start and end stations. Again, Copilot is going to take my prompt and generate the code for me. Let's insert it into the notebook and run it. And now I have a pretty interesting heat map. There are a few outliers, which we can zoom in on. And it looks like San Jose State University has more long trips starting there than on average. And as you can see, Copilot is doing a great job of just letting me ask questions and taking care of providing me the code so I can, so I can just play with, play with my data. data. Now, now asking, asking questions from the task pane is okay, but I'd rather work directly in the notebook. Fortunately, I can use Copilot in a notebook cell just by typing percent percent code. Let's ask for help creating a forecast for next month using the profit forecasting library. Copilot has generated the code. And you can see it takes quite a bit of know-how to know how to use this library, but Copilot has taken care of figuring out how to use it with my data. So now I can just run the code. And just like that, we have our forecast. Let's look at the shape of the data by asking Copilot for some visualizations of the output. And now we have a line chart of our new forecast. I could keep iterating and playing, which is really fun using Copilot, but let's finish off by writing the results back to my lake house. Copilot is going to truly democratize the ability for everyone to be able to work with data in advanced ways. And as you can see, Copilot gives everyone a bit of data science superpowers with Microsoft Fabric. Alrighty, so with that, I did want to wrap up. I, I know that it's a busy program and we might be a little bit over. So uh, I want to thank you all for listening. There are so many experiences that I wish I could get to or talk about in greater detail, but I would love for you to take a look at our documentation to learn more and try out Fabric yourself. Uh, and thank you again for, for having me at this session. I don't think you was on stage. Oh, sorry. I was not on. I, I think maybe it was just my side, but I think maybe you two were, were muted. No, I think it was everyone. We Sujan had a whole great <laughs> thank you to you. And we'll do it again. We had a we had a question we wanted to ask you that came from the chat. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so Spark Notebooks, currently you have to use keys to auth to most Azure services. So will you be adding the managed key support in, for Spark Notebooks? You know, that's, that's a great question and, and not one that I directly work on. I would love to route you into one of my colleagues uh, on the DE team to take a look at that. Can you give out my, my email or help me sort of connect the question sure. for, of for that particular feature? Yeah, yeah, we could totally do that. Okay, sweet. Um, and then another question is, do you support DuckDB to query and process data in Fabric? That's also a question I'm, I'm going to have to punt off. Uh, I. I am sort of here as an ambassador of my team and I work sort of on a, a limited, you know, portion of the fabric data engineering and data science features. I wouldn't want to, you know, misrepresent that, but I can connect. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. also really interesting how much fabric will do and how many different components it has. And they, by definition of the, of the power platform, it really does try to have so many different parts to maneuver. So mm -hmm. I understand it and we're really excited to hear from your, your teammates. So yeah. we'll make sure we, we wrap I'm sorry, that's number three, but if you have questions, uh, Anything that I can address more related to you know data preparation, model deployment, training, I'm, I'm happy to take a swing at those. Otherwise, we can just were those the ones in the chat? Did we they have were, any more? Yep, they were in the chat. We did have one more. Um, do you support building Python apps in Fabric like Panel and Dash? Uh, not yet, but if that's something that you're interested in. I'd love to sort of talk offline and see about getting that on our roadmap. Cool. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris. Uh, for Christoph for asking that one. I do have contact information for Pamela, but we'll uh, chat off. I'll figure out a way to chat with you to yeah. be able to get you in contact with you. Also, if it's, okay, if it's okay, I mean, I'm seeing Pamela and Christoph's questions in the chat. If you want to shoot me an email, is it okay for me to 
give out. Sure. My, if you're comfortable with that, that's cool. Yeah. So it'll just be first name, last name at Microsoft.com, which you can probably figure out in any case. So hopefully I, <laughs> hopefully I won't be saying that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you do. Cool. All righty. Thanks so much, Aaron. Yeah, totally my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Have a good one. Thanks. Uh, now we'll have Pamela uh, up um, for her next session. Yeah, so excited to get you live, Pamela. Hello, hello. Hi. Hey. Yeah, let's just get out of the yeah, way. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's always fun to get to be on these live events. So I'm going to be talking about automated evaluation of LLM apps, or you can think of AI apps, RAG apps, like all these new kinds of apps that are using large language models like the OpenAI chat completion uh, API, right? And I'm going to show a tool that I have built that uses the Azure AI generative SDK and you know has a lot of more tools on top of it to give you an idea for what kind of workflow we could use to do this automated evaluation. Uh, so if you want the slides, I went ahead and already uploaded them because I know that people often want the slides. So you can get the slides at aka.ms slash rag slash eval slash slides. And yeah, then we'll keep going with it. There you go. There's that link. Okay, so first, let's just talk generally about types of LLM apps. This is a really, really, really broad. And I just you know made up these types today. But uh, I want to distinguish between what I'm calling prompt only and then rag apps. So prompt only kind of LLM app is mostly relying on customizing the prompt. Uh, I think you might also call these like custom GPTs. So really just customizing the prompt, maybe also providing some examples, which is what's known as a few shot. When you do few shot prompting, it's you give the prompt and you give some examples of the kind of output you want. And the goal is to get answers in, you know, in a certain tone. And I found there's this GitHub repo, awesome GP, chat GPT prompts, where people have lots of cool ideas for prompts. And I actually have one in, this is in the Azure OpenAI Studio chat playground, which is a really great tool for just doing experimentation, um, you know, with these, with these prompts. So I actually put the interviewer prompt in here. So it was like, I want you to act as an interviewer. And this I think is a really interesting one because it actually flips the script and has chat, you know, the chat, um, the bot actually asking me the questions. Uh, and usually I'm the one asking the bot the question. So here I can say like, oh, I'm interviewing for a Python programmer position, right? And and there you can see, okay, let's start the interview. And can you tell me about your experience with Python programming? I've coded Python since uh, college. It wasn't even invented that long before then. And projects, I wrote a lot of the Khan Academy code and Coursera code and stuff. <laughs> but this is really cool. I'm basically having a mock interview. And this is purely based off of the system message. So we're able to use just a system message to get this customized experience uh, you know, with the large language model. We could also add few shots here if we wanted to give examples of the kinds of questions we wanted to ask and, and what answers you know, we might give. Um, but we can get really far with just a system message. So you can do quite a lot with just system message and few prompts. And you can see lots more examples in that repo. The other kind of app, and this is the one I actually spend most of my time working on, this is a, these apps that use RAG, which stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. So this is combining a prompt with domain data from some knowledge base, often like an internal knowledge base or just some specific knowledge base in order to get answers that are grounded in that knowledge base. So this is the kind of app you're building if you, you know, if you're trying to have a chatbot respond accurately about some, you know, some information, right? So we have so many people deploying these sort of uh, rag apps these days, and it's an incredibly popular thing to do because it can make information much more accessible, right? Like the classic example we give um, is an HR handbook, and it might seem kind of boring, but it's also really helpful because you know nobody likes to look through HR PDFs for the, their company, right? It's it's just not fun, especially when you're like trying to figure out medical insurance and stuff like that. So you can build a rag app that uses LLM plus a knowledge base. So in this case, I'm using Azure OpenAI plus Azure AI search. And here, 
<clears throat> I can ask any questions about, you know, stuff that's in there. So what, uh, what does a product manager do? So I'll ask, I'll ask that question. And this is all using uh, this repo here. This is an open source repo. So if you do want to develop a RAG application, I recommend our, our repo. It's got quite a few features and it's been uh, it's been deployed thousands of times. So we've been learning a lot in this repo about how to develop RAG applications. Uh, so you can you can uh, try to point that yourself if you're interested in a RAG app. Uh, so let's see, here we go. So it's answering the question. And what I can do is actually click on this light bulb here to see the thought process. So this is the actual RAG flow. Because when you do a, when you do a RAG, it's a multi-step operation. Because first you have to get the right information to answer the question. And then you give that information to LLM and say, hey, here's the information we think is relevant. Can you answer the question based off of this information? So what we do is we take the user query, we figure out a good search query based off of that. We use that to search Azure AI search and we get back, these are all these Azure AI search results. Uh, so these are chunks of text from our HR documents. And then we send the you know that information to the LLM. So we say, hey, you need to help employees and you need to cite your sources and here's the question and here's the sources. And then we get back this answer that's grounded. And we know it's grounded because it has a citation and we can click that citation and actually see where it came from. So it's really important that the answer is tied to the citation and that it doesn't answer if there's no valid citation. Uh, and we can also see the supporting content here. <clears throat> and we should also be able to click on this PDF and load this PDF as well. Sometimes PDFs take a little bit of time to load in the browser. So there you go. So that is a RAG, um, you know, a RAG application. And these I think can be really, really compelling, but we also need to, you know, be really thoughtful when we make RAG applications because we're trying to answer questions accurately. And as we know, LLMs can be very creative and uh, you know, they can they can make stuff up. They're just they're they're next word predictors, and sometimes the next word they predict could be a made up word. So we really want to make sure when we're using this RAG technique that, um, you know, that it's well-grounded answer. Uh, so here's a, you know, visualization of the RAG flow, right? And we just saw this in that thought process tab, but we get the user question. We use that to search the Azure AI search um, document database or whatever database you have. You do a search in it where right? you might be using Postgres, MySQL, whatever. Then we take those results and send them to the large language model with the original question. And we get back the result with the citation. And there we go. Here we go. Hey, John. So John gave a great talk earlier today about RAG with uh, Cosmos Mongo V Core. So this is a, I'm glad that he did it earlier in the day because this is basically like a follow-up. Like once you have a RAG app, how do you evaluate it? And John has also done a ton of good work on the repo that I just showed. He's been sending all these pull requests that I need to review soon. Uh, so thank you, John, and great talk on RAG earlier today. So if you missed John's talk on RAG and you want to see how to build a RAG on Cosmos Mongo DB V Core, uh, you can watch his session later because they're all recorded. So when we're, you know, when we're developing these apps, we want to know, are the answers high quality? Now, what does it mean to be high quality for a RAG app? It means uh, that they're correct for that knowledge base, not just globally correct, but correct for that knowledge base. So for example, when I asked in this one, what does a product manager do? That should actually be according to this HR handbook. Like what does a product manager do at this company? Not just what does any product manager do? Right. So it's a really subtle form of correctness, especially for things where you could have a valid answer in the kind of the global knowledge space. Right. So are they correct? Are they clear and understandable? Generally, that's, you know, that's usually the case with LLMs. They're usually pretty good at being clear, but it's good to check. And are they formatted in the desired manner? This is actually really crucial if you asked your if you've asked your LLM to respond in a particular way, like with a particular syntax, like we ask it like, hey, put the file names in brackets. And it's really important that we get those file names in brackets because that's how we know how to do the linking here. And if we don't get in the brackets, then we don't know it's a citation. So that's the sort of stuff we look for, right? And you can see some sample outputs here. Like this one's got the correct answer and the correct citation. 
Um, this one, these are both correct, but one of them is like longer than the other. So you, you know, have to think like which of these is the most high quality answer for your use case. And it's going to depend on your use case and on your domain. And lots and lots of things can affect the quality. So it's not just a matter of, you know, tuning, you know, changing one dial. There are so many different dials that you can change to affect the quality, especially for a RAG app, right? Uh, so I, I am focusing on RAG here because that's what I tend to value the most. And that's where accuracy is just so, so important. But a lot of this, you know, is also relevant for non-RAG LLM apps as well. But when you're doing a RAG application, you know, there's the things that affect your large language model completion. Uh, and that's true for all LLM apps. So the prompt, the few shots, uh, the language of your prompt, is it English or not English? Um, any history you send in, if you do send in message history, what model you're using, huge differences between three, five and four, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, what temperature you're using, zero to one, controls the creativity, uh, how many tokens you max it out at. So lots of different things you can parameterize in your LLM call. And then if you're doing RAG and you're searching a document database, well, then it matters like, you know, what search engine are you using? Are you doing a hybrid search, a vector search, a simple text search? Are you cleaning up the user query before you send it in? Uh, how big are your chunks? Like when you take documents, you have to chunk them up before you put them in a database because you can't send it like the whole huge novel to the large language model. You got to chunk it up. So how big are your chunks? How much do they overlap with each other? How many search results do you get back? Just so many things that can affect the quality. Oh, and I see another contributor, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, for your PRs as well. It's so great to see so many um, community contributed PRs to our uh, open source RAG repo. It's very exciting. I wake up each morning and see the PRs. Uh, so when you're, you know, this is like this LLM ops diagram, right? You're developing an LLM app. What does it look like? So you start with like your brainstorming, right? You get it going, you get it working. That's, that's the you know important thing to see that it can be done and be like, okay, cool. I've got, you know, something that's answering, answering questions the way I want it to answer. And then you start, you know, developing like your standard sample questions that you're, you know, you're testing to see how well they work and you can, you know, tweak the parameters and see, oh, that worked good. That worked good. And you come up with your defaults. Then you really, uh, once you think you have a good set of defaults, then that's when you do the automated evaluation. And that's, you know, that's what I'm going to show is how do we do that automated evaluation step? Because when you do the automated evaluation, then you can start to have more confidence that, oh, okay, yeah, even with a larger data set, these parameters are actually working really well. And when you're feeling confident, then you can deploy apps, you know, the app to users and at that point, you still need to be monitoring and getting user feedback, seeing which questions aren't, uh, you know, which questions and answers aren't working for users and continuing to improve and evaluate. That's why this is, you know, it's a flow. It's, you know, when we're making stuff for users, it's always a matter of improving, 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 uh, especially with this very new technology where we're still learning how do we really optimize the quality of the answers from these LLM apps. Uh, so manual experimentation. So uh, you, first thing you want to do is just have some manual way of experimenting with these quality factors just so you can see, you know, just for yourself what the changes are. So, for example, in, uh, you know, in AI's uh, playground here, uh, there is the um, customization, the parameters one here. So you click here and you can see you can change the temperature right? So zero is not creative and one is most creative. And then you've got everything in the middle. Top is also related to creativity. I actually never use that one myself. Max response caps the number of tokens. So those are all the sort of parameters that you can send to the chat completion call with the open AI, uh, you know, the opening AI APIs. Now in our RAG application, we have something similar here where we can change the temperature. Uh, we usually do 0 0.3, but you could try higher, you could try lower. Uh, how many search results we want to get, uh, whether we're using the semantic ranker, whether we want follow-up, whether we're doing hybrid search or one of the other ones. Generally, we want hybrid, but this is all stuff that we can play with. So wherever it is that you're making your LLM application, make sure you do have a way of easily tweaking parameters and you know being able to see the results. Now, one thing that you also should do that I need to add to our repo very soon is the seed parameter. This is something that we they added to the OpenAI um, APIs a few months ago, where you could add a seed parameter. And then if you do the seed parameter and you hold everything else constant, 
then you should have repl replicable output. So this is really helpful when you're doing evaluation because LLMs are non-deterministic, so they can have different output each time. But if you do that seed parameter, they, they try to get rid of that non-determinism so that if everything else is the same, you should see the same result. Uh, it's a little more detailed than that. They've got a nice cookbook article about it, but uh, I've been adding seed for all my evaluations today, and it's really, really helpful to do it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, experimentation. And now let's get to automated evaluation. That's the promise of this talk. So I have this repo AI rag chat evaluator, and here's the ACA for it, ACA.ms slash rag slash eval. Uh, so let's go, let me just go to that to prove that that works. Oh, there we go, it opened. Okay, so this is a, a tool a repo that I built that has a bunch of tools and they're des I designed them to work really well with this, you know, this RAG app, but I'm also trying to make them so that they'd work with other RAG apps as well. It's hard to make tools that are super generic because everybody does things slightly different ways. Um, but all the code is open here. So, you know, hopefully it's fairly tweakable and you can adjust it for your use cases. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a long readme here. So I recommend reading through that because I won't be able to talk about all of that today. Uh, so what this, uh, what this repo can do is it can help you to generate ground truth data, to evaluate with different parameters, and then to compare lots of tools for comparing metrics and answers across evaluations. So the first step is to have ground truth data. That's the ideal answer for a question. And we typically want like at least 200 question answer pairs. Uh, so here we're, we're really talking about doing like a bulk evaluation. Because if you only evaluate a few questions and answers, you know, there's a lot of variability in terms of how an LLM is going to respond to a certain question. So you really want to have a fairly large ground truth data set. So I usually go for 200. Uh, so we do have a tool here that you can use uh, is the, you can use this generate command and it will generate ground truth data and you just have to tell it, you configure it with an Azure AI search index. Uh, so it'll check to look at the stuff that's already in the index and it'll use GPT-4 in order to generate questions and answers for you. So, uh, here we go. Uh, so this is the actual code here. And so this is what it's using in the Azure AI Generative SDK. Uh, there's this QA de data generator class. And we tell it, oh, we want it to generate a long answer. You can also do short answer. I think you can do multiple choice, maybe summary. So they have various types of things you can ask it to generate. We tell it how many questions and we give it the text. Uh, and so in this code here is just connecting to the search. So that's what it does. And then what you get out is this JSON lines file here that has, you know, however many questions. So this one's got like 200 questions and we can see the question, we can see the truth, right? So this is what it thinks the right answer is according to the document that it read. And we see the citation. So this is the expected citation. So this is our ideal answer. Now, if you're gonna use this tool in order to generate ground truth data, you really need to look through that ground truth data and make sure that it is good. So you need to manually curate if you're gonna automatically generate this stuff. So you look through it, you say like, is that a reasonable question? Do I want to change that question? Do I want to change the answer? Um, and then, you know, so I ended up removing like, I think like 10 questions from it just because I thought they were kind of too, too uh, wishy-washy, like too generic of questions that they weren't reasonable to, to be asked. Okay, so we generate that ground truth data. So we've got that, it's got a question and it's got the ideal answer. The next step is to do the evaluation. So this evaluation is going to evaluate using both GPT metrics and also some custom code metrics. So the GPT metrics are literally sending, um, so you know, it sends off a request to our app and gets back the, you know, the current answer from our app. And then it sends both, you know, the ground truth and the current answer to GPT-4 and says, hey, here's the ground truth and answer. Please evaluate it according to these, uh, this criteria. So I can actually show you the, the prompt, right? So for the groundedness metric, we have a bunch of metrics, but you know, this is the groundedness metric. So it says you'll be presented with a context and an answer about that context. So you need to rate it from one to five. So what we do is we ask GPT-4 to rate something from one to five. 
based off of whether it meets, you know, whether it matches the criteria in this prompt. So that's groundedness. We also have relevance. Uh, so here you can see like one star means the answer lacks relevance. Five stars is the answer is perfect relevance. And we have some few shots here as well. So you can see in the few shots, some examples of that. And then we also have coherence, right? Uh, and you can make your own. So if you have something that you want, you want GPT-4 to evaluate your answers in a particular way, you can make your own and you just have to, you know, make a new template like this and then add a bit of code for defining it. So those GPT metrics and those use GPT-4, I also have a bunch of code, I guess I call them code metrics because it's just Python code, <laughs> right? So these ones, uh, you know, I, I look at the length of the answer because it's interesting to see like sometimes your LLMs get really verbose and it's like, dang, this answer is a little long. <laughs> I, I look at a lot of citation stuff. So like first, does it have a citation at all? And then does the citation match? So does the answer contain uh, the at least the citation that was in the truth? It could also have other citations, but does it at least contain the citation that was in that ground truth data? So this is actually my new favorite metric. This is the one I've been looking at really heavily uh, this week. Uh, and then I, you know, I've got ways of aggregating the stats doing some pandas code. Uh, and then we've got latency, which is just how long the actual request took. So you can add, you can also add your own custom code metrics, right? So the, my goal is that that it's fairly easy for you to to customize this repo for what you need to do as well. All right, so we get that, and then we actually run the evaluate thing with a um, a config here. So <laughs> so here's my configuration. Uh, what I do is say like, okay, this is where you're going to get that ground truth data from. Here's where you're going to store it. Here are the metrics you're going to measure. So I don't always measure every metric, especially the GPT ones, because they take more time. So here I'm doing groundedness, relevance, and then the rest of these are pretty fast because they're just code metrics. Uh, here's the where the app is. So this could be running locally. This could be on a deployed endpoint. Here I'm using a local one. And then these are parameters I'm just sending in my you know, in my chat request to the app. So these are parameters that the app understands. So we have a lot of parameters that we can customize just via posts. So I've been like, today I've been messing with like how many search results, uh, I've been messing with temperature, um, you know, I just change things and then I do a new evaluation. Uh, so for example, uh, I know I, uh, <laughs> there's so much to talk about. Okay, okay. So imagine that I did that, right? So I did that evaluation. It takes time. So I can just show you from a previous thing, right? It takes a lot of time because it has to hit up your app for every question. And here there's 200 questions. And then it has to hit up GPT-4 for each of the GPT metrics for each question. So that can take a fair, a fair bit of time, maybe like 30 minutes or so for 200 questions. Uh, so, so yeah, so once that finishes, then I can use my review tools. So I've got lots of, um, example results here. So I can show you like, so here's, this is the summary tool. So with the summary tool, I can go ahead and see, uh, you know, these are a bunch of runs I've done, right? So these were all with different parameters and I can click on them and see on the parameters. This is one where I tried to make it as bad as possible <laughs> just to see how interesting the results would be. And what I learned is even if you do a really weak prompt, it actually does decently well. Uh, and then these were ones where I was trying to refine the prompt. And for each of them, I see the metrics, I see, you know, averages, pass rates, uh, answer length can really vary a lot. Um, and and yeah, and that's one set of them. I've today I've been doing that, running it a bunch on another rag that's uh, on my, uh, you know, on my blog. So here, this is actually a rag where I can ask questions about anything I've written about on my blog, and it's it's pretty fun to to see everything I've talked about on my blog for the last fifteen years. Uh, so I was running that a bunch today. So I've got another folder with those results because you know it's a whole different uh, set of data. And here I was messing with, you know, how many search results. So this is the general idea is that we run these things and then we can, you know, review them. Uh, I also have a tool where we can just like look at the answers here. So I can uh, see like, okay, here's, you know, here is, here are all the answers for that run. And I could sort it and say, uh, you know, um, let me show, see everything where it didn't match the citation, right? Because I want to know why, where is it doing badly, right? Uh, and yeah, this one down here, this is textual. So most of the tools are written using textual. So I'll show you another tool. So blog results. Um, so the one I just did was like top 10, right? 
so this tool compares, uh, if you, you can compare, you know, two different answers. So in this case, I'm comparing my latest run where I was getting 10 results to the ground truth answer. And we can look at the, you know, the scores and all that stuff. Uh, we could also compare two runs to each other and compare those questions. And these, this is all with uh, textual, textualize, which is a way to make command line Python apps. So here I can compare the answers across these two runs. And then what I added today in preparation for, for today's talk uh, was the ability to say, between these two runs, only show me the questions where a particular uh, metric changed. Let's see if this is going to work. Yeah. So these are ones where the citation match metric changed. Because that's what I actually find the most interesting is for the ones where some metric changed, let me see those and let me compare those to try and get an idea for what it is that is going wrong. Uh, so, so yeah, so lots of tools. Um, you know, with the hope that one of these will be the tool that you need. But I'm also would love to hear what tools you all are interested in that um, would help you. Also, pull requests, as always, are great. Uh, so yeah, use those tools and do evaluation. You know, make sure you have good ground truth data. Do lots of parameters. Use the seed parameter. Track those evaluation results. And you keep improving those ground truth data sets once you go live so that your ground truth data is reflecting what users are actually asking. This is really important. I don't have any users for my um, sample data sets, but once you have users, you should be updating that ground truth data, uh, especially with the problematic questions like ones that are getting thumbs down in your UI. Next steps is if you haven't made an app yet, create, a, create an LLM RAG app. You could do it with our repo. You could do John's from earlier. Uh, run the tools and see what you learn from them and and uh, join the community. Let us know if there's any issues or if you have ideas for how to make it better. All right. I should stop talking now because I'm probably over, but this is a really big space, so it's very it's really exciting to talk about. You are muted again. Ha ha. There you go. I keep doing that. Um, these are really, really cool use cases. I loved how you like mapped them next to next to each other. They were incredibly practical. Um, we probably have time for maybe one question. So either we can get the chat to ask really quickly, or I have one. I have plenty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Chat's not fast enough. So I am curious about the um, the citation par portion. Like that's a really big deal for me. And this is the first presentation that I've seen anyone like uncover like what the data is going to return and how to measure the citation. And then even comparing them, you went two steps beyond what I what I was even thinking. Can you talk a little bit more about the like maybe the difficulties you faced it, faced uh, like either doing it or trying to like create this project around it? Yeah, so citations are interesting. When I was looking at that a lot today, because we just had a, a customer reporting in the repo that they were getting wrong citations. Okay. And uh, I wanted to see like if I could replicate that, um, you know, with my own data set. The, the hard thing is that, of course, it's going to vary, um, vary across data. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, like when it comes to citations, we tell the LLM in our prompt, like, hey, make sure you format it, you know, this particular way. And, and then hopefully, the LLM, uh, you know, both figures out that part of its answer is from a particular citation and formats the right way. Because those are kind of the maybe there's two or three big things can go wrong. Like one is that like it totally knew which file it was, but it did the syntax funny. Like it did like source colon instead of bracket. That actually I saw that a few times today. Um, yeah. But the other issue is that it like answered it. And it connected it to a file name where the answer wasn't there. And that's super problematic. When yeah. I see that, that's something that can be like that, something that maybe, you know, you want to look into like, well, was that just not even a good search result? Like, should we change like our scores for what we get back? Like have a score threshold for what we get back mm -hmm. from the um, search index to make sure that we're not giving it anything that mm -hmm. it doesn't actually answer the question. Uh, you can also try using GPT-4. Generally, GPT-4 does a, a bit better with, um, you know, accurately tying in citations. Okay. 
Cool. And is that something that like fine tuning would be able to improve or is that fine tuning is a different uh, different way of improving your data? Oh, but I think that this is actually something that I do think fine tuning would okay. would improve specifically because, you know, fine tuning can not help with like getting an LLM to respond with a particular syntax. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's more expensive to do a fine tuning and to use a fine tune model. So what I'm hoping happens is that like we develop like a site or somebody develops a citation oriented model that has been fine tuned to be really good at providing, you know, citations in the right format, uh, because we shouldn't all have to do that, do that ourselves. Right. So fine tuning yeah. in this case would be focused on the syntax versus fine tuning on the actual like domain data. Right. Okay. So in this case, I would just say like it'd be really cool if there, um, you know, was an LLM that came out or a version of an LLM that was fine tuned to be very, very good at outputting citations. Yeah, that's why it's so cool that you and your team and John and Aaron, who've been in the chat, are working in the space because there's so much that the community can continue to do. Um, and a lot of it is open source and a lot of it is collaborative. So that's really, really fun. Uh, cool. Yeah. Can I ask a follow up question on that? Actually, mm -hmm. would type chat be something that would be useful in that situation as well? Yeah, so type chat is really interesting. Type chat uh, is started off in JavaScript, but they're coming out with the Python version. Type mm -hmm. chat helps you get structured output from an LLM. And we can do something similar with OpenAI function calling. Mm -hmm. And we do actually do that uh, at, at one stage in our app. However, it's very hard to do it with streaming output because you notice our mm -hmm. answer was streaming. Yep. And mm -hmm. it, you can stream text pretty easily. But if you try to stream, JSON, because basically you're going to get back JSON and mm -hmm. streaming JSON and then extracting citations from it is like pretty painful. I know yeah. because I have a branch that does it and it is like the nastiest code uh, that I've written in a long time. So, yeah, I think there's something there where we could um, you, we could force the structure either via open AI function calling or something like type chat. But we need to be able to parse that you know, structured output, the JSON output, we need to be able to parse it while it's streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more question and then we can move on to maybe some announcements, but can this work in Cosmos DB? Yeah, so I mean, the thing about this, the evaluator tool is that uh, it just hits up an endpoint. So mm -hmm. you can, you know, as long as you can hit up an endpoint that responds with the answer and the um, supporting context, then you can then you can use this. Uh, so yeah. you know, so if your endpoint looks a little different from mine, then you're gonna have to change the evaluate.py code. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's really designed just around an endpoint. So if you've got an endpoint that you can hit up, you should hopefully be able to use it uh, like with the the Cosmos DB app. Awesome. Well, we have some news hot off the press as well. A uh, build announcement just dropped while we were streaming. It'll be uh, May 21st through 23rd. Pamela, are you planning on being in build? It'll be in Seattle and online. Well, I did submit like four different proposals. So, you know, if they say yes to one of them, I'll come. We'll see. If they don't. Were you in build last year? No, I tend not to leave my house, but you know, if they, if <laughs> I love it, you have a great background. I love your little sloth in the back. I, why would you want to leave your sloth? That's uh, right. It's a sloth, right? That's a sloth. And there's a Tarsier over here. Oh, I don't even know what a Tarsier is, but it's so cute. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Pamela. It's always a pleasure. Um, and we're going to jump into two more lightning talks. Bye. Bye. So I mentioned before the Fabric Hackathon was uh, just ended on March 4th is an opportunity to get involved with Microsoft and to do a, hack a hackathon. They're called Hack Togethers. It is a hackathon um, and it lasts for a couple of weeks. You get to hang out with experts. You get on live streams. Many times you get super cool exclusive access for free. We gave you some Azure credits and OpenAI credits. Um, and we had four finalists submit their uh, presentation for uh, Data Science Day. And we're going to go into the last two. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my submission for the Microsoft Fabric Global AI Hackathon. 
Here we'll be using Microsoft Fabric and Azure OpenAI together to analyze text-based data, in this case, eBooks. Microsoft Fabric is wonderful for this solution because it leverages the one lake so it can store any kind of data, including unstructured text-based data. And Azure OpenAI thrives on text-based data and will be a core component to this solution. So using Azure OpenAI, we'll actually be doing entity extraction of the text, summarization, classification, and getting the semantic meaning through embeddings to find the similarity between the text. Please note that all of this data comes from Project Gutenberg, which is the first provider of free ebooks, so please consider donating if possible. When looking at this architecture, our data source is Project Gutenberg ebooks. We actually ingest that data through Spark Notebooks. We store the data in the lake house. We transform the data with Spark Notebooks again and Azure OpenAI. We'll see how those seamlessly can work together. Then we store our enriched data back into the lake house and analyze it using Power BI and notebooks. In this repo, it goes through all the steps on how to do this, but I'll actually walk into what the solution looks like here. So in our first notebook, it actually goes in, goes all the way to the source and gets the data as raw as possible and puts it into our lake house. So the data looks something like this when it starts out. So, so there's a little bit of metadata at the beginning and then the actual book itself, but not super useful, right? Um, if I wanted to, to understand this more, it's a lot of, of text that I have to go through to get a deeper meaning from it. So that's why we're going to use Azure OpenAI to enrich the text from that. So because we're using an F64 SKU, we actually don't need an API key. Um, the nice part about that is all of the use of Azure OpenAI actually gets charged against our capacity units and does not get charged um, through an API key. So that makes it super nice and seamless to work with on uh, makes a better together story between Microsoft Fabric and Azure OpenAI. So the first thing we're doing is actually doing extracting entities. So given a text and some entities, builds this prompt and delivers that to OpenAI um, to get a response from it. So we've actually made a um, system that will return JSON format given text and entities to extract. As you can see, I've gone through and extracted all from the 32 books. However, I'll show you an example here. We're actually looking at Aladdin in the magic lamp and just the text from it, we've been able to extract these entities in JSON format and we'll actually put that into our enriched data. Then we'll be doing text summarization. So again, building a prompt to summarize text. And we'll be leveraging chunking here. So we've actually broken up our long text into smaller chunks to fit into the token window of the GPT-35 Turbo token window. Um, so that's what we're doing here. Uh, so actually what the methodology of this is, is to summarize each of those chunks to build uh, overall summary. Um, so we're actually going to summarize each of the four chunks, put them together, and then summarize that text um, to make an overall summary. So for Aladdin, the magic lamp, summarize four different chunks, and then put those together um, to give the output that you see here. So a boy named Aladdin who discovers a magic lamp containing a genie that grants him wishes. Sounds pretty accurate to me for Aladdin. Next, we'll be doing text classification. So actually leveraging that summary we just built with Azure OpenAI, we're going to go in and classify it. So based on these categories that I've given here, fit the summary into one of those categories. So fantasy, sci-fi, history, biography, so on and so forth. So here's what Azure OpenAI thought of, of the prompt we gave them. So for Aladdin, the magic lamp, and that summary we looked at before, it thought that it would fit into fantasy sci-fi, and I actually tend to agree with that. Next, we'll be actually generating embeddings to, to get the semantic similarity later on um, for this. So these embeddings actually a numeric representation of the semantic meaning of the text, which is pretty powerful to use. And so what we're going to be doing is actually going in and in a similar method to before, we'll be getting the embedding of each of the chunks 
than actually taking the average of the embeddings for the entire book. So this way we get the average meaning of Aladdin the magic lamp based on all of those chunks that it thought of before. So then we go back, save this in rich data. We'll post it back to the lake house using Spark and Delta, and then we can actually go and analyze it further, take the next step with our data. Here we're doing T-SNE, uh, where we're actually getting the T-SNE and cosine similarity. So we're actually getting the how similar these texts are using cosine similarity and the embeddings that we built before. And then using T-SNE um, actually reduces the amount of dimensions. So with embeddings, there's actually 1,536 dimensions that we would be looking at, uh, which is way too many for a human to comprehend. So what T-SNE does is actually maps it um, to be only two dimensions, which is a little bit easier for humans to understand. So it's an estimate um, for human visualization on how close these, these documents are based on those semantic embeddings that we built before. As you can see, there's some outliers and we actually have some pretty decent sized groupings here as well, which is very interesting. Uh, we could analyze this further with Python and Spark notebooks. Um, however, we're going to take the next step and actually take this data, put it back into our lake house so that we can use Power BI to, to analyze it further. So here in this Power BI report, it pulls everything that we just did together and gives us an anal analytic tool on top of a document repo based on the steps we just did. So here's all the 32 books that we looked at and that are categorized. So if we look at fantasy sci-fi, We'll see the Aladdin that we were looking at before, but we can also start to examine much more on top of this as well. So looking at poetry, looking at technology, fantasy sci-fi, so on and so forth. Next, we did entity, well, we did entity extraction. So we got the title, the author, um, and all of that from our, our text. So we extracted those entities so we wouldn't have this in a structured format before we also generated a summary from that text so using that summarization technique uh, we can actually have a summary that can fit into um, our delta tables so that it can be used in analysis here into a, a smaller size and then as well we did the semantic similarities between our text using t -SNE, and we actually can examine it further um, using Power BI in this visualization here. So if I wanted to see these three texts, what were those that are pretty similar? I can do that. Look at this grouping here. Or I can go the reverse way. Uh, and if I want to examine Aladdin, you can see where that is. And then look at the texts that are very similar in meaning to Aladdin. So even though they don't have the same category, um, it Azure OpenAI thinks that the embeddings here and the semantic meaning of the text is actually pretty similar, which is interesting. Um, so if I wanted to examine Aladdin more, I could actually see that there's actually two other books that are pretty semantically similar that might be of interest there. So that's my solution. It goes all the way from this text-based data, very difficult to use and get insights from, to actually a complete analytic tool on top of um, that data through the enrichment of Azure OpenAI. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon. PI Innovators is a cloud-native data solution developed in Microsoft Fabric, integrating OpenAI for document analysis, particularly for detecting personal identification information, PI, in files and images. The solution classifies documents into complaint and non-complaint categories, further categorizing them based on predefined types, delivery, personnel, online, continual, communication. The solution is based on a medallion architecture where data is stored in three zones, bronze, silver, gold, within Microsoft Fabric Lakehouse. Subsequently, the data is prepared for analytical use in Power BI reports. Now we are going to demo the solution. This is the data pipeline that we are going to run manually.
Since between each call of an open AI model we are using a pause of 90 seconds, the pipeline takes longer time to execute, due to that we are going to show an already ran pipeline with the same examples. The pipeline starts with get metadata activity that provides a list of child items from the external source. Next activity is for each activity which takes child items one by one from the get metadata activity. Inside the for each activity are defined five variables used for managing the workflow. One defines the document name without extension. The next one is for the extension. The third one concatenates document name with a timestamp for the current UTC date. The next one indicates if the document is a file or an image for document path. And the last one creates the document ID. The next activity is copy data activity used to copy data from the external source to the bronze zone. Next is a notebook activity that executes the notebook, insert documents for analysis, which stores the metadata for the document. The next activity is the if condition activity that checks the file extension and runs the corresponding notebook for files or images. If the extension is for a file, it will go to the next notebook activity that executes the notebook, ingestion data from text documents and PI analysis. Let's see the code for this notebook. This notebook reads, detects, and stores PI data from text into corresponding delta tables in the silver zone. First, a cell is generated from the runtime parameters, which enables dynamical processing of all the files in the source. After importing the required libraries, we connect with the key vault previously created on the Azure portal which hides the information for key and endpoint of the model instance. For analyzing text documents, we are using the GPT-4 model, version 1106 preview, by defining a function for customized usage of the model to return answers only in JSON format. Using that function, the GPT-4 model is extracting and masking the necessary information in accordance with the given text and prompt, and afterwards those returned results are stored into a fixed schema structure delta table in the gold zone. After that, continue to the next copy data activity that moves the file from unprocessed to processed folder in the bronze zone. The last one will be notebook activity that executes the notebook load, and prepare data in gold zone. Let's see the code for this notebook. The notebook parses stored JSON strings from silver delta tables into a fixed schema structure delta table in the gold zone. Optionally, in case of any processing error occurring, it will call copy data activity that moves data from unprocessed to failed folder into bronze zone. If the extension is for an image, the similar process will be executed only using the notebook activity that executes the notebook, ingestion data from image documents and PI analysis, which extracts text from images, reads, detects and stores PI data from text into delta tables in the silver zone. Let's see the code for this notebook as well. For analyzing image documents in addition to the GPT-4 model, version vision preview, a Microsoft cognitive service is used in combination with OpenCV. For this notebook, we are also using a customized environment in which are installed required libraries for the Azure Computer Vision Service. Here we have one more defined function which specifies the results from the model to be returned in an array. That array response will later be used for masking the image. The Azure AI Vision uses optical character recognition, OCR, and detects only the specified PI which are returned as response from OpenAI. Afterwards, the specified words are blurred using OpenCV. The data from the model's responses is stored in the gold zone and used for reporting.
This is the report generated in Power BI. According to user roles, user will be seeing the report data with or without PI data. The data pipeline will be started with scheduled trigger that for the time being is stopped. Additionally, it is planned to be used an event trigger on the source side when it will be available in Microsoft Fabric. According to GDPR, companies that collect personal identification information of their customers, employees, and third-party vendors must protect the data from internal and external threats. Every company that stores and processes the PI of European citizens within EU states must comply with GDPR, even when a company does not have a business presence inside EU or AA. So, this solution can be used for GDPR compliance for securing PI data, and as such can be implemented in different use cases for document management systems and other systems that need to manipulate with personal identification information in different domains. This video was supported by the Azure AI Speech Studio. Thank you for your attention. PS2. True. So hi, uh, my name is Theophilus, and I'm going to lead you through the session on application of Azure Computer Vision for Optical Character Recognition Service in extracting uh, text for natural language processing. So in context, uh, let me just start off by some few introductions. Uh, as I said, uh, my name is Theophila Zawiti and I'm currently a machine learning practitioner and also I um, also a Microsoft Plant Gold Student Ambassador. And uh, Moving on straight to the session today, I just want to look at some of the tools that we'll be utilizing for this particular session. <clears throat> so we'll be using numerical Python for obviously numerical calculations and handling some few arrays. We'll also be using tools on Azure, tools such as um, Azure AI Vision, and in particular, we'll be using the optical character recognition. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we'll also be using Pandas, which is a library that is really, uh, is really useful when it comes to handling different uh, data frames of the same source without actually uh, affecting the original source of the data. So together with Pandas, I'll be uh, using MongoDB. And in this case, MongoDB is a NoSQL uh, database that provides um, storage for, um, it's mostly used for big data. And it's good tool. It's a good tool for even time series and um, other uh, tasks involved around um, databases or uh, data science. So other tools such as uh, Visual Studio Code, Matplotlib, and Scikit-Learn will be used. And especially Jupyter Books is the main tool that we're going to use for uh, this particular session today. I just want to demonstrate some things, and it would be mainly uh, revolving around the k-means clustering algorithm. In this case, we'll try to identify texts that are related to a different cluster of um, a different cluster of texts that uh, make up a group. Maybe it's a text related to a particular city, and we'll see this for one city that I'm going to apply for this uh, example that we have today. So the tool that I'm going, or going to uh, use today is uh, Scikit-Learn that is going to provide us with the k-means algorithm under the clustering algorithms uh, library uh, library uh, contained in Scikit-Learn. So moving along to the next thing, <coughs> let's get into perspective and talk about what um, Azure Computer Vision is. Obviously, Azure comes with several services. And we need to talk about um, Azure in terms of uh, services that are related to machine learning. It is usually a really, really, really um, tiring task to get data from different or disparate sources and try to extract data from them. That's the text data from them. So it's important to use some of these um, tools provided by Azure, such as the Azure Computer Vision, uh, which is part of the AI vision service. And 
in particular, Azure AI Visual Service uh, gives you access to advanced algorithms that uh, help you uh, extract uh, text from images. And as we can see in the example, it talks about um, helping you uh, use advanced algorithms that uh, process images and return information based on the visual features uh, that someone is interested in. For in this case, uh, we are interested in the handwritten text and uh, the printed text from the PDFs. So to put this in perspective, we're not going to only use images, but we are only we are also going to use um, PDFs in this particular section. And uh, what um, Azure AI Visual gives you is the OCR uh, image analysis uh, phase and uh, OCR, OCR actually, right? Now, um, under the optical character recognition, uh, under Azure Computer Vision, we talk about the optical character service that extracts um, text from images. And uh, PDFs mainly rely, uh, mainly rely in the category of images in this case. You can use it, um, uh, you can use uh, the read API to extract printed and uh, handwritten text from photos that is. And the particular algorithm used for this specific um, uh, service is uh, deep learning. And uh, these algorithms are deep learning uh, based models and work with text on various surfaces and uh, backgrounds. And, <coughs> sorry about that. And uh, we can talk about image analysis. Other image analysis, um, it does the work of extracting uh, visual features from images that we have. Uh, for example, such as objects, faces, and uh, things to do with maybe adult content that needs to be uh, detected in different materials that we have. And when you talk about uh, the first um, service that we have under Azure Computer Vision, um, the first service provides an AI algorithm that detects, recognizes, and uh, you know analyzes the faces in images uh, that are available, the faces of humans in images that are available. And facial recognition software is important in many uh, applications, and Azure offers this um, for free. Um, if we get another session, I'll talk about this um, in depth. But today we are focusing on using the optical character recognition. So, yeah, so the goal of today is uh, to create a K means um, clustering algorithm. And in the intent of this exercise is to group related texts from various. Um, um, various uh, bases of text that we have or the database that we're going to have in this case. And our database in this case for persistent storage will be MongoDB. And we'll use and uh, discover several other libraries that we've talked about. NLTK, we've not talked about NLTK, but you'll see how to use NLTK today. And so um, the particular libraries uh, will help us to create, um, actually perform stemming and corpus and this comes from the needed vocabularies that we have and the root words that um, are created during nlp processes and so for stemming itself we're talking about uh, finding the root of different words that we have and you'll see this in action as we uh, go on and for the corpus it usually uh, always consists of the vocabulary of words or the bag of words that we have and we want to use for a particular natural language processing task. Okay, um, switching on to the notebook that we have, um, the important libraries that we will need to um, import in order to, there are important libraries that uh, we'd have to import in order to um, use them. And Python gives us the ability to do this in um, uh, VS Code. So some extensions that you'd want to consider when uh, starting your journey into creating notebooks in, um, you know, in uh, VS Code itself, you'd go ahead and um, go to extensions. And under extensions, you'd want to go ahead and uh, look for something like uh, Jupyter uh, Notebook. 
So um, if you look at this, um, you just go ahead and uh, type in uh, Jupiter. And it's supposed to bring, yeah, it's supposed to bring the official version that uh, is used by Microsoft. And this is the particular version that uh, I tend to talk about mostly. And maybe if I click on it, yeah. So this is the official version for Jupyter Notebooks on VS Code. And so you want to go ahead and uh, put this in. And for MongoDB today, we are going to use the extension to connect to our local instance. And so you go ahead and search for MongoDB and go for this particular extension uh, officially blue ticked by uh, MongoDB. So you go ahead and just download this and uh, it will be part of your extensions in VS Code. Okay. Okay, so um, if we go further um, now into the real work that we have. So um, <clears throat> first of all, let me talk about the structure of uh, my files. And if you look at the Explorer on the left side of uh, my VS Code, let me just increase the size. Okay, so on this left side, I have different PDFs that I tested for this. And the particular notebook that you're going to use is um, this notebook. Make sure you have Python installed. And uh, <clears throat> let me just shift over to the notebook. Uh, to reduce this, you can do that. And make sure you have Python installed. Because I'm using um, Windows, um, it will be advisable for someone using uh, Linux, or in this case, uh, if you're using other platforms uh, that are not mentioned for obvious reasons, other platforms, maybe uh, you're using um, Azure and uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio and you're in the notebook. You do want to go ahead and replace the percentage sign with this exclamation uh, mark. And because we are using Windows, we do want to go ahead and uh, put this um, percentage sign. Okay, so that's that's that, and uh, you want to go ahead and hit this play button after choosing the particular um, Python version that you're going to use for this particular notebook. So the libraries that we're going to use for this session is Pandas, NumPy, PyMongo, uh, Azure Cognitive Services Vision, Computer for Computer Vision, then Pilo, uh, NLTK, and Scikit-Learn. So we talked about this uh, previously. So the important thing that we want to look at is uh, detecting the text first of all. So how to detect this text? You'd want to go over to your browser and in your browser um, open up um, portal.azure.com. So if you don't have um, access to Azure right now, um, you'll check uh, in the link in the description below uh, for Azure for students in case you're a student and get $100 free to use on Azure. Um, if you are someone who is not currently a student, uh, you can opt for uh, the subscription and uh, put in your credit card and start using Azure for free for the next, I think about six to 12 months. Okay, let's get into it. So I'm going to go to my actual email and uh, <clears throat> pop this up and uh, yeah, now we are in the Azure portal. So you'd want to go ahead and uh, look for custom vision. So your dashboard will not be the same as mine and uh, not actually custom vision, but uh, computer vision. So you're going to go ahead and say computer vision. And uh, when you look at uh, the choices that are given, the particular choice for the service computer vision pops up. <coughs> Sorry about that. And uh, I already created um, a service for this, but I'm going to show you how to quickly create uh, a service that uh, you can use also. So let's wait for this to load a little bit. And yeah, it's done. So you're going to go ahead and uh, maybe you can create a new resource group. So resource groups helps you to uh, track all the resources that you're going to use for uh, this particular, um, actually the resources that you use for different services. You know, you might have different services, but resource groups helps you uh, track the related services or uh, a group of services that you have. So you'd want to go ahead and choose a relevant resource that uh, links up to what you're doing. And in this case, I had the resource NLP Python chosen. 
then I'm going to go ahead and put a unique name, maybe escalator status or something like that, and uh, choose the pricing tier. So I'm going to go ahead, maybe you can get the um, free tier. You can choose the free tier in your case, but I'm going to choose the standard one because I, I ha currently have access to the standard. So I'm going to tick that in and uh, make sure you tick this box before pressing on review and create. And when you reach the point of review and creating, um, as you can see below, it's going to uh, validate this and give us the create version. So let's wait a minute for it to complete. Yeah, so um, it's completed and you want to go ahead and uh, click on create. And after clicking on create, so I created this, I don't want to repeat the same thing. I'm just going to go back to, um, I don't know, uh, maybe two steps back. <coughs> okay, that's a little bit slow, but yeah, this is the resource for computer vision that I have. So I'm just going to click on that and uh, <coughs> wait for it to load. So what we are actually doing, we are creating a resource in order to get the different um, API keys. So the API keys that we have here um, I'm go are, are going to be used, which are going to be used um, are this particular API keys. So we have the key here. You'd want to go ahead and uh, take this and copy this and also copy the endpoint that you have. So after copying the endpoint that you have, <clears throat> after copying the endpoint that you have, um, you'd want to go ahead and uh, start using the Python um, SDK for this particular section. So let me go ahead and uh, pop up back to you know uh, this section of uh, this uh, small showcase. So we want to detect stuff, and uh, we are going to use the Python SDK for a computer vision under uh, Azure. So um, you'd want to go ahead and import the necessary libraries that we have already uh, installed using pip package manager for Python. And uh, <clears throat> these are the particular um, packages that we are going to um, employ in this uh, case of computer vision. And this is the computer vision client, the operation status codes just to get the status, status of our process. And we are also going to use the visual feature types and the cognitive services credentials just to authenticate us. So this is where the authentication comes in. So all these documents uh, will be provided, I believe, in the link in the description. And uh, <clears throat> they are part of the Azure AI uh, vision um, documentation under OCR. You can look at this uh, specific code for um, local um, file usage, local file usage. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, just paste in the API key that um, is available. So uh, yeah, paste in the API key. And also go ahead and uh, paste in the endpoint that is from the resource, uh, the endpoint that you copied from uh, the particular resource. So all this code will go ahead and read the local files that we have. Remember, we have the local files under images. And so we're going to go ahead and go into images in, the, in our root folder and get uh, the specific image name. So this is a, a function itself. I just created this function to extract images. So the image name and stuff, and we're gonna go ahead <clears throat> and um, read the response and uh, read, uh, also get the operation ID for this particular operation that we are conducting and also uh, get the sentence list and uh, append this uh, different text that we have and uh, give out the detected text in terms of the sentence list that we have. So this is a really cool way of, uh, you know, extracting text and getting text as an array from a document that initially you had to maybe convert it to a TXT or something, right? So <clears throat> follow along and uh, I want to uh, show you something important. So before we continue with that, uh, I'd, I'd suggest that you have a MongoDB um, uh, compass installed on your computer. It is a GUI for MongoDB that will come together with MongoDB installed with it. So um, you'd want to go ahead and uh, 
first of all connect to mongodb and i have the extension for mongodb so i'm just going to go ahead and uh, press that and the local connection is supposed to be this and so yeah it's going to tell me i'm connected so i want to show you something really important uh when we are uh, using we are, when we are conducting this session so let's go ahead and um go further into the code so i have this particular pdf it extracted the different um sets of data that i had here so i want to go ahead and also select another document and this is uh the hci group work one document this is a pdf it's actually one of the assignments that I've actually done, um, I did it a long time ago, and I loved the concept behind it and everything else. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, do that. Okay, so let's uh, press on this button and wait for it to um, extract the, uh, the particular text from this data. Okay, so that's the particular um, text that we have, and etc, etc, and uh, maybe we can get the length of the text. I just want to go ahead and uh, do a length, maybe print uh, the length of this text that we have extracted, right, and do a length for it, and then, then say text list, right, okay, cool, and press on that. And we have 47 uh, identified uh, texts. And you don't want to go ahead and uh, we installed PyMongo. So you'd go ahead and import the driver for MongoDB. That's the PyMongo. And uh, put in this um, uh, uh, URL that you had here, this uh, connection stream. So if you look at this, I already connected this connection stream just to look at whatever is happening. <clears throat> and so uh, under this client, we have uh, the client being created uh, using the class from PyMongo, that's the Mongo client class. And we pass in this URI to create the particular um, client. So this client does the job of creating um, a database based on whatever is specified in the square brackets that we have. <coughs> so under this, we'd go ahead and uh, do um, the database creation and also do um, something like, you know, the collection for this and uh, the data set and uh, create uh, uh, the data the, the database itself so this particular task uh, checks if we have the database and creates the collection and puts out outputs the data set that we have right so just to show you what i'm talking about we have the text db that was created and the detect text document that has uh, different uh, collections the collection for the documents that we have and so yeah these are the 40 documents that we have here and they are just listed based on their ids so i'm going to go ahead and import numpy and pandas and get the data frame and uh, put the data set into this and you know get all this data that we have in our database use we are going to import nltk the natural language toolkit for python and use it here to create a stem import the stemmer and uh, the the corpus uh, that helps us uh, identify stop words and go ahead and append this uh, stemmed uh, text data set um, items into the uh, the list that we have and as you can see some of the items that we have in this new list that uh, contains the stemmed uh, words are uh, things like I am human too and I believe and happy and stuff like that so we're going to go ahead and uh go into site learn and get the feature extraction um, uh, library to help us uh, bring in counter vectorizer which is a vectorizer that will help us transform all the text data that we have and we go ahead and now get the actual clustering algorithm from k-means and so k-means will help us uh use multiple will help us um get the centroids that we have <coughs> And fit in uh, the x value that we have here and append um, the, the k means inertia that we have for this particular section and you'd want to go ahead <clears throat> after running that and um, look at the particular output for the centers that we have and the number of clusters that is available right and so 
you create uh, the particular model that you want to use and go ahead and um, get the top uh, terms for each group in this case. And you can see in different uh, clusters that we have, we have the first cluster, the second cluster with different um, related, related groups of uh, data. And so in this section that you have here, um, I want to test um, a particular um, item. So I'm going to go ahead and maybe detect the group that this belongs to. And this is, uh, it belongs to um, group 5. So this is how group 5 looks like. And I talked about uh, there's an item for, uh, you know, Kisumu and stuff. And uh, this city called Kisumu, the most related group to it, or the group of text that is related to it, is the text that um, relates to the PDF. Uh, for, is, is the data uh, get gotten from um, PDF that are stated in Kisumu directly and it clustered it with other items and this is the specific group that it mostly relates to and so even if I go ahead and uh, maybe change this and it may give us a group near it or a group that is the same and so you find that it's still group number five and what does group number five entail? It actually starts with Kisumu or Ginga Odinga. So this is a street in Kisumu. This is uh, uh, there's something like a plaza. Yeah, there's a plaza here and also other places that um, relate to Kisumu so much. So this is uh, an example of how to use uh, Python in clustering and in particular use um, Azure to get all your data in uh, all your data from PDFs, images extracted for you, put into the database for example, the database I have here and <clears throat> use this um, to create, you know, something like um, a continuous uh, integration and continuous delivery for your data for persistence. If you are testing something or in the initial uh, stages of trying to create a model. So thank you so much for this session and I'd really love to welcome some, some uh, questions. Thank you so much. That was awesome talk. Yeah, it was. It, it was probably the first and the only one that had computer vision and content in it. Um, learned a lot yeah. <laughs> through that session. Actually, I've, I've never experienced um, uh, firsthand uh, using computer vision work. So that was really cool. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, we are nearing the end of the schedule today. It's been a really awesome ride. Yeah. It's been wonderful hanging out with you, Sujin. Oh, of course. Always great to see you here. <laughs> yeah. So we have two recorded talks and then one live one. Um, and our next one, what's the title of our next one? Uh, Empowering Data-Driven Innovation, A Journey Through Real-World Applications. I actually have not seen this recording yet, so I'm very excited to find out what this one's about. Yeah, and you sounds said something. Very, it sounds very Disney. -y. Yeah, it so does. I'm very excited for it. We're going to go on an adventure. Yes. Um, just to remind everyone all of the things that we're doing for Python and data science, if you want to join in on the Python Fund, we have a new landing page for Python and all of the things that we're doing with Python is aka dot ms forward slash python and you can also visit these talks and the on-demand talks and everything about it at aka.ms forward slash python forward slash data science day we also have a cloud skills challenge that's running until april 15th mm -hmm. we're gonna be at pi cascades mm -hmm. PyCon. so we're doing a lot with python community these days yep uh, and we also have, I, earlier we mentioned build as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have some build presence there. Um, exactly what content, we don't know yet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> stay tuned. Yeah. It's probably blue top secret at this point. So, uh, <laughs> so yep. wait till uh, build. But speaking of top secret, I'm going off the cuff here. It is uh, MVP summit right now. So if yes. you want to know the top secret stuff that Microsoft is doing, we do have a Python MVP program. So if you're interested, join the Python MVP program. You get an NDA access. You can come and hang out for a few days on the Microsoft campus, get a bunch of cool sessions. And then we take that feedback that you give us as experts in the industry and we apply them to our products and you get all the cool stuff that we have to offer. We also have like swag and Azure credits and some other stuff. So mm -hmm. it's a good time. Uh, join that in the top secret things. But now we get to go on our little, our journey. 
one more thing that I wanted to mention mm -hmm. is a lot of people were asking if these sessions will be uploaded later mm -hmm. on. It will be uploaded next week, I believe. Um, if you go to youtube.com slash code, um, it will be, they, they will all be uploaded there. Oh, and we have one of our MVPs just already say count me in. Uh, that's great. You're, you're awesome, John. <laughs> all right, let's uh, move into the next talk. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Abdullah Wan, and I am doing Bachelor's in Data Science from Pass National University, Lahore, which is in Pakistan. And I am the student ambassador for Microsoft as well in my university. And I am the founder of that community in my university. So moving on towards the topic, which we are going to discuss today is basically empowering data-driven innovation, a journey through real world applications. Now, Basically, the question arrived in everyone's mind is what data is. So basically, data is the statistics and facts on which your daily life process is being based on, the activities you perform daily, and all that activities. And now what basically is data science? Basically, data science is the study in which we use technology, AI, machine learning, deep learning, and different technologies with the things of data so that we can integrate with that and we can create some new things which can help us improve our daily life processes. For example, nowadays, as you all can see that chat GPT, BART, perplexity, all these AI tools are helping people to do different kinds of tasks. For example, you can make slides from an AI tools as well. So yeah, these all are through the advancements in AI technology using different kinds of data. And yeah, for that data is a very basic tool, which is required to advance in such kind of investment as well. Now moving on to the introduction. So basically what is data driven innovation? So data driven innovation is basically when we utilize all the data, which we have to drive decision making and for such kind of innovation, for example, in business, we can use data to kind to do some different kind of analysis on our data on our clients like what kind of clients are we going to have in future or what kind of clients we currently have and what kind of products are we selling at our best so yeah these kind of ideas this kind of innovation and decisions are being made using the previous data in the past which we have been stored on different kind of databases and all that now what is being the significance of data driven approaches now it is very important nowadays because data is helping us to predict the future as well. For example, in weather, we predict through the different kind of data from the past. So yeah, data is the key aspect nowadays, whole websites, whole applications, and many further things are working on data. Your different applications are being worked on different kind of huge amount of data. So yeah, it's a basic step which is required to move nowadays now moving on to the medical field how data is helping us can help us to integrate with the ai or machine learning algorithms to move on in the medical field now how we can revolutionize healthcare with data basically we can do predictive analysis in healthcare this is what we can use past data of the patients or some other aspects of the patients which can help us predict their future outcomes like how they are going to receive different kind of diseases and how they are going to act for that as well for example if we would know about the COVID now so we can predict that how that kind of pandemic would come in future or what we can do what kind of precautionary measures we could take to we avoid that kind of major pandemic measures as well so what we can do is we can also forecast patient outcome for resource allocation is what we can see from the data that how many patients or how many people are in that specific area and we can design different kind of algorithms that would tell us about the result that if any kind of pandemic such a pandemic happens again we can allocate some amount of people to that hospital some amount of people to that other hospital and all that so that it will help us divide all the workload on different hospitals as well so yeah we can take care of that pandemic gradually now what can be some, some kind of examples as i discussed hospitals can use predictive models for patient admissions for example when a patient comes in 
if we have his past data in all the database so that our hospital can easily connect with that and can access that data and we'll come to know that what kind of patients background is what kind of disease you already have what kind of doctors would he required so yeah our hospital can easily be predictive about that patient as well so that he can guide them where they have to go now tailoring treatment with data data can also help us do treatment for example if i am ill and i have done some blood tests as well for now i have got the reports but now at that time i need a specialist or someone else or doctor to see and analyze the reports because i myself cannot analyze that report that perfectly as a doctor can do so what ai can do is using the data that we can transform a machine learning model which can simply analyze the report and tell me the specs that what i could cover and what i can do is that tell me telling me different kind of specs of the report for example if i am having high blood pressure high sugar level or i am having low platelets and all that so yeah data can help me do that as well now based it can also help treatments based on individual patient characteristics for example if a patient have different kind of diseases what data based ml model can do is it can help you tailor different kind of solutions for that person so that it can help them to predict their future outcomes of their diseases what they can cause or what kind of things they could utilize and can cause that kind of diseases as well now beyond the hospital walls obviously some of the people can not visit the hospital all the time it's all about the rushy times and all that so what we can do is we can make different kind of monitoring devices that will be based on total on data and we will train them on the previous data so that it can be doing perfect analysis for it because it's important that the model have 99% or 99% plus precision or accuracy in it models because in healthcare we can not take any kind of risk because it's all about the life so yeah it should be perfectly accurate so what we can do is we can guide different kind of machine learning models so that it can help us explain monitoring different kind of patients from their home and they can basically buzz alarm when they are in the kind of emergency or anything else for example if you are getting to some if you are having going to market and you got something to eat or something else so they have mentioned any kind of ingredients what they have what we can do is we can make a scanner which will scan the ingredients and that application will show you the results that is it good for you can you consume it or not so yeah we can do that as well on the basis of data now moving on to the agriculture field we know that agriculture is one of the most important field or things which most of the countries knew knew that they can earn from it as well so in agriculture field how we can use data is we can do precision about the agriculture for example in a specific area we can get to know about how much fertile that soil is by training different kind of models by putting different kind of drones around that area now many people thinks that farmers are not that literate or they cannot get to know about that kind of models applications drone system and all that but yeah what we can do is we can provide them with the data consultancy firms with the data consultancy people who will provide them and guide them on a daily basis and what we can do is we can build different kind of models different kind of products based on the data which can help us analyze the soil weather effects and different kind of insects that attacks on the crops for example locust which attacks on the crops on a huge amount and which can destroy the crops in a very less time so what we can do is we can plant different kind of drones different kind of cameras that would detect if what kind of diseases that plants are going to have what kind of soil is, is it is and what are the basic requirements that that area need for example how much water is it required for that soil or anything else now protecting the harvest as i said crop diseases which can be detected using different data driven approaches and also the early detection of proactive measures to protect crops for example if there is any kind of disease this is, that is going to approach your crops we can do its early detection so that we can take any proactive measures to protect our crops 
and for that we can use machine learning algorithms for disease detection in crops now from farm to table supply chain efficiency now what we can do is basically we can create some other models which will monitor all our supply chain for example moving from agriculture to the person who takes that crop into the market we can analyze all that during the data that how much sale that area specifically gives how much data or how much crops is being sold by that specific farmer so that can help you optimize your transportation routes to reduce your food wastage and every other fuel cost and all that so that it would become very efficient for every kind of farmer to afford it now what's basically it's about retail industry as you know that retail industry is also a crucial part of our life as we do take different kind of our items from our daily life as well now what we can do is we can decode consumer behavior for example on the basis of our data we can create a machine learning models or different kind of softwares that will tell us about the customer segmentation and target marketing for example if a customer is buying that product with another product as well so our model will predict us and tell us that you have to put that those products all together so that everyone can buy it and you can get more sale and now what about targeted marketing a data driven approach can help us know that what is our target marketing like what is our targeting people or consumers that like how we are going to target them the customers which are going to buy our products like what are our strategies to follow up so that we can get more sales daily basis for example we get to know and interact with different marketing agencies for our products to get some sales but what we can do is simply train different kind of machine learning algorithms on the basis of data so that there is no need for marketing agencies and we can simply move smoother with such kind of small machine learning algorithms for example analyzing purchase history and demographics for targeted promotions now what is optimizing retail operations we can do inventory management in retail using machine learning algorithms on the basis of data for example how many products were sale last year in that specific month and in specific season because there are many products which are seasonal and which are occasional for example on halloween we take to buy we used to buy some halloween mask and all that so our model will predict that you should buy this inventory for this month specifically so, we, so that we are not short of the inventory at that time of the sale so for example forecasting demand to prevent stock out and overstake situations so that we will not get out of the stock at the time of our peak season now in finance structure for for every section we the finance is very important because everything is related to finance and what we do is related to money obviously if an, a person is doing agriculture or something it is for some simply for earning something if a person is in healthcare sector or a doctor he is simply earning for his family or anything else so finance sector is also a major growing in all over the world so what we can do is we can differently use data to safeguard our transactions for example we can build a fraud detection in the finance sector that can help us detect fraud on the basis of the past for example what are the transactions history of that customer how is its trends or what we can do is we can simply bug out the anomaly that how that person is differently doing transactions so that it can help us detect any kind of fraud that is going to happen in future or that is going to harm your whole institution or your organization we can use for that we can different utilize machine learning for anomaly detection for example real time monitoring of transaction patterns to detect fraudulent activities now writing the data where we can do algorithmic trading using data driven strategies for example as we don't know about the stock as much as a person knows who is daily or whose daily work is to deal with the stock as well now what we can do is we can take the huge amount of data from the past and we can learn different kind of machine learning algorithms which will guide us about the riding waves of the algorithmic trading of the data driven strategies which will help us introduce about the stock exchange and market details of daily life schedules so that no one can get harm about the stocks for example if a person is investing in stock and he wants to predict that how it's going to end up he will simply do it through that software which we will be 
running through our machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms based on the data so it would help him predict in future that this is stock is going to be in loss or it will provide you a profit for example high frequency trading algorithms for rapid decision making now what are some key benefits of data driven innovation basically we can use efficiency we can increase efficiency in any kind of work for example nowadays if there were not chat gpt for example or bard any ai tool what you people do is you sim simply go and think about the errors or the bugs which you get into codes or anything else but nowadays what everyone is doing is they are simply using this, those ai tools to spot those bugs or errors and what they get is they get their answer and results in few seconds this is all about using your data and training different kind of machine learning algorithms and integrating with ai technologies now what we do is cost saving we can optimize operations and reducing wastage for example in agriculture sector we can train different kind of models which will tell us about the route that is efficient for us which will see that which kind of area is to be targeted for sending that crop so that we can only send that specific amount of crop at one time to that area so that it can help us optimize the cost of the fuel and all that other stuff which would help farmer grow their profit at a very huge rate now what about improved decision making we can also make different kind of informed decisions based on data insights for example what data analysts do is it do decision make decisions for the different kind of organization on the basis of data for example what are their past trends what are their future trends what are what their company are going to do in the future and what their clients are going to buy from them in the future so what we can do is we can make informed decision based on our data insights for example if i am having a market if i am having a retail store of different kind of products now if i am having data of past 5 or 6 years i would come to know easily that in this month my most of the customers will get buy this kind of stuff most of the customers will buy this kind of stuff and in specific season i would come to know that most of the customers will buy this kind of product for example in before christmas eve they would buy some gift wraps and all that so yeah i would do and stock such kind of products which would help me grow my business so what we can do is we can improve our decision making using data of our past now future trends now basically data is already helping us to direct our futures what we are going to do in future for example in weather we can simply direct what kind of weather is going to be in the future we can simply forecast what it is going to be in the future in stocks many of the agencies are doing future prediction about the stock that it will go up or it will go down it will have a bull run or anything else it's all because of ai and the base of data because they do have data of the past 10 20 years obviously so what they do is they train their models they see that how this going to be affect how that kind of disease or the how can that kind of affect any weather effect or anything else can affect that kind of stock so all they know is due to the past amount of data they already have so what is data is doing is it is helping us predicting our future we are making different kind of ai models and different kind of other machine learning models which are helping us in the daily life processes for example in blockchain we can utilize blockchain technology for data security and transparency so that's all about how data can help us drive our innovation and we can simply go through make our life easy in different kind of sectors for example in education sector in hospitals in agriculture sectors in different medical sectors it's all about simply based on data like how we utilize data so yeah basically we should store our data it's the main step we should have data consultancy firm from where we can take data where we can get data where all the data is being assembled in a proper way and all that data could be utilized to make different kind of models different kind of software different kind of algorithm different kind of ai tools which would help us make our life easy thank you so much for your time everyone
Great presentation. Again, we are nearing the end of our day. It's been so great to have all of these talks. Um, one of the things that we wanted to go over, I record um, the release notes for VS Code. This is a new exercise. I think we've only been doing it for a few months, um, but it's been really nice to have the highlights of like the top three features of the VS Code. Um, and it's distilled into like five minutes. So I was gonna bring it on stage and Sujin and I who both work uh, with the VS Code team and on VS Code, we're gonna critique it for you, pick it apart, I guess. We'll just talk a little bit more and give some context. So I'm adding it to stage. The cross-platform code wow. editor that supports Python IntelliSense, debugging, Git integration, extensions galore, and cloud deployments for your applications has some new features this month. Let's get into the latest. By enabling add import heuristics, you can enable the quick fix light bulb icon to not only add imports that may be missing, but also fix your spelling errors. Quick fix can be activated with control comma or by clicking the light bulb icon. Here, I'm testing my session model defined in my Django application. You can see that I have an error squiggly underneath session on line 17. Once I've clicked the offending symbol, a light bulb appears in the left well of my code. Session is a common word in my code, and this quick fix allows me to search for all of the most likely options to fix my missing import. This is a real I click the I correct use, import, uh, with, with and I can keep Brian moving forward building my Python program. application. The quick fix can also help me with this misspelling. I'm using the freeze time method with freeze gun, and as I'm zooming through testing these features so I can go stretch my legs, I make some typos and my code gives me a squiggle to show me my mistake. This yes. symbol is not defined. Yep. Once I click the icon, I get a spelling suggestion or an option to search for additional import matches. This spelling quick fix is exactly what I need to move forward. By enabling auto start browser in my debugger configurations for my Django or Flask apps, a browser will automatically open so I can view my local application while I'm debugging. Here, I'm debugging my Django application. Make sure you have the Python debugger extension installed and Django. enabled Everybody like I do me. here. I love Django. It's like my personality. I'm going to add a Django specific configuration to run in my debugger. I'll pick the Python debugger option, which will then give me more specific Python choices. And Paula is You can see a lot Flask of really good and Django are both options. Paula is one of the engineers. I've set on my project Python. so it is one level deeper than my workspace default, so I'll update where my debugger can find my manage.py which is my Django management command line utility, and it helps me run all sorts of Django commands easily. Now I'll change my auto start browser from the false default to true. When I go to my drop-down menu to choose my debugger configuration, Django is now there. Now I hit the green play button to run my debugger. My local host will now open as I debug my application. So New features added to the WSL extension like allow know, us to use the REPL totally shell integration called by shift enter in order to run absolutely. the command in the terminal. And there's a lot of things that you can put Let's in your configuration. start by checking the WSL extension or is or installed your and enabled. Um, and I Once love it is, we'll share I go down to the remote development just. status bar in the bottom left of my VS Code window. Yes. Whether I want to open remote a dev options. container, tunnel, SSH, or code space, all remote connection options can be found here or by using the command palette. I click to connect WSL. WSL is the Windows subsystem for Linux, and you're now able to develop in a Linux-based environment, WSL use Linux-specific toolchains and utilities from your Windows machine. You can edit files located in WSL or the mounted Windows file system without worrying about pathing issues. I open up my WSL targets and click a project that I've done before, which is the Python sample VS Code Fast API tutorial. Here I'm creating a utility file so I can play with a simple method in my REPL for this example. I'm going to do a little math in this method. I've also added some boilerplate code okay, like, that will let me invoke the method from my REPL. Is something that I, would recommend you to I start from the top of my yeah, file so I can uh, include uh, my inputs with shift enter. Oh, you can see it was successfully evaluated in my REPL yeah, because the blue circles in the left well of my terminal. I step through the method and the boilerplate to execute my code in the terminal. From here, 
I'll continue yeah. to play around with the method yeah. in the terminal yeah. and use the shell integration Actually, as yet another I've been tool in my VS Code toolkit to and write it was and evaluate my code that intuitively. Because I didn't know what I was Check out what everything that do. Microsoft is doing to support Python developers yep. at aka.ms forward slash Python. Happy coding. Yeah, it's the little things, right? Like, I know for, for notebook experiences in VS Code, we've had for the longest time people asking about, oh, I want to copy output images. Mm. And it sounds like such a small thing like you can probably take a screenshot or, or what have you. Um, but just adding that button made so many people happy. <laughs> um, and it's, yeah, so like that's, like we are very, very, where we try to be um, uh, very detail oriented when it comes to like user experiences and like, really dog footing our own um, own products and yep. things like that. So Yep. Um, and listening to suggestions, like, yes. oh, my goodness, we do so many user feedback yep. um, processes. I mean, that's mostly the PM's role, and I just get to reap the benefit when I'm <laughs> recording my videos. But it's so nice to yes. have work with a team that cares so much about the users. For sure. Anyway, we could praise our colleagues all the time. But <laughs> yeah, so maybe this is a good time to bring up the, the link again for oh. feedback. Um, there mm -hmm. is a link. That uh, you can, I mean, it doesn't have to be, it is a notebooks uh, a feedback one, but if you have any other feedback from VS Code or any of the other experiences, we can also route them to the right teams. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Cool. We're, we have two more sessions left. We're going to jump into our last recorded session. It's breaking into data silos with semantic link. And then we'll have our last live session of the day, which will be data, sci data science, the bare necessities. And it's a pun. With bears. Bear. Yeah, bear with real bears. <laughs> so I'm excited to see what real bears we're, we're going to get into today. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. Hello, my name is Sandeep Pawar. Welcome to my session on breaking data silos with semantic link. A little bit about myself before we get into the topic here. I'm a senior Power BI architect at Hitachi Solutions. We are a Microsoft Gold partner and we work with all the entire um, Microsoft data stack. I'm also a Microsoft data platform MVP, and I write blogs at fabric.guru, especially focused on Microsoft Fabric and how Microsoft Fabric can be used to create data analytics solutions, be it data engineering, business intelligence, or data science using Microsoft Fabric uh, uh, platform um, in your organization. My experience is in uh, data analytics, data science, and data engineering. Before we get into what is semantic link, what is Microsoft Fabric, and how it all comes together, um, I want to just first discuss the motivation. Now, I um, have been doing data analytics and I've been in data science uh, industry for the past 15 years, and I have played uh, roles as business in, uh, on the business intelligence teams, on data analytics teams, as well as data science team. My background is in research, uh, so I actually started with data science. Um, but as I straddled these different teams in different positions, one thing that was very common among all of these different teams was these teams operate in their own silos. And what I mean by that is a um, let's take an example of uh, a data science team. Typically, the data science team is very focused on using, it's a very code first approach. They get their hands on the data. Um, they work with the data using Python or R or, um, or any language of their choice um, and then create solutions and then deploy them. Whereas on the other hand, the data engineers, very SQL focused. Uh, their job as they see it is mostly to provide the data to the data science team and as well as to the business intelligence team. And they are a little bit removed from the actual application or the actual final result or the predictions that are created by the data science team. On the other end of the spectrum is the business intelligence team, which typically works with the data engineering team to get the data, um, it, go, it goes through the medallion architecture, which is the schematic that I'm showing here on my screen, where you uh, the data lands in the bronze zone, you cleanse the data, uh, and then it is converted into a dimensional form um, in the gold zone. And the data science team either uses the data from the gold or silver or from somewhere else, and then create the data uh, science solution. 
and the business intelligence team typically using power bi if you're using uh, uh, the microsoft data stack to create the the reports now the challenge with this is uh, although they um, on paper work as a team and they use the same data after the solutions are created because they use different tools and technologies, uh, there is a, a gap in the communication. And what I mean by that is, let's say for example, um, the data science team, they create some forecasting uh, uh, prediction algorithm or prediction model, and they deploy their solution. The Power BI, the business intelligence uh, developer, he or she, they're going to use that into their report. But the challenge in, in this case is, the the bi person the bi developer they don't necessarily know how the model was created now as if as you know um, a machine learning model uh, is probabilistic in nature it has assumptions underneath be it the data generation assumptions be it uh, how the features were created using different um, uh, different data types or different data. Maybe it was augmented using different data. And the BI developer is not going to know that. And um, it's very much possible that their definition of the forecast is completely different from how uh, the, the assumptions were made by the, the, the machine learning engineer or the data scientist. So that's problem number one. Number two is the difference in languages meaning the BI developer typically, they won't use a Python or R. So even if they are using the languages, it's going to be hard for them to actually understand or um, to figure out how these uh, different features or how these different uh, business uh, uh, definitions um, are created uh, and what they mean. So again, taking an example of, uh, let's say forecast. The forecast is going to be created based on, let's say, sales. Um, how the sales are calculated. Um, in If you worked with business intelligence, you know that um, there might be some definitions created. For example, uh, exclude uh, internal accounts, ex uh, exclude internal customers, take only certain uh, product types into account and exclude R&D from it, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and all these different definitions which capture the business logic are embedded into how the net sales is calculated. Now, when you use these, the business intelligence person is going to use these definitions, they assume that the data scientist may have used the exact same uh, business logic and business definitions as well. Even if they do, um, because the difference in technologies, all these different technologies that are used, for example, um, the data scientist could be using Databricks or Data Robot or something else, whereas the business intelligence developer will be using uh, Power BI. So they don't necessarily have the same tools and the technologies or access to the same tools and technologies, which can create um, a miscommunication or the data silo. Uh, uh, definition drift and again something for example even if they do know and have access um, and let's say they use the exact same definition of what accounts for or what is calc how you what you mean by net sales you work on the project you move away from the project and six months from from now maybe the new the business requirements have changed and there are new, there is a new data scientist and new business intelligence developer um, and they don't necessarily know uh, that how uh, these definitions were created. So they could create their own definitions again. So there is no way to really reconcile that uh, in on any platform. Um, they could change their definitions. And so if that happens, then the predictions that have been created by the data scientists uh, could be off um, and no longer valid. Reusability of these definitions and KPIs and the features meaning each of them are going to use or are going to create uh, net sales. So why should they create this net, uh, this definition of how the net sales is created um, on different platform, platforms for single source of truth and to, um, to make sure that the business users who are going to use the, uh, this data or these solutions to make business, dis uh, de uh, business decisions, 
they should not have to figure out um, how each of these different teams um, are aligned or not, right? Um, so if ideally what we want is these definitions are created in one single place and then used throughout the, the entire life cycle of the project uh, in different stages and different uh, applications and different platforms um, without worrying if the, the definitions have drifted uh, from each other. And then using and creating data science solutions, meaning for many organizations, uh, the data science is still something that's looked as um, uh, you have to hire a PhD and you know a PhD person and then create these data science solutions, which is far from to truth. Um, we want data science solutions to be more um, accessible, even to small organizations who may not have uh, the technical know-how to uh, do that. So which means a business intelligence developer, for example, they should be able to create these uh, data science solution in their organizations. And um, it's not that you just get up and then create these data science solutions, right? Uh, typically in most organizations, just based on my experience, the way it happens is you create a report um, and then the business users, they use those reports and then they notice something and then that generates a requirement. Okay, we need to have some predictive ability and that's how you generate or maybe more insights and that's how you generate a data science uh, solution. And Microsoft Fabric offers uh, us a, a platform to unify all of these requirements on one single platform. It's a SaaS platform where um, uh, where you use different compute engines on the same set of data or same data um, and just use different computes, meaning we can use data science notebooks and then Power BI, which is business intelligence on same data and all of these different persona, they have access to the same data and all access to all the solutions that are created. Um, so, which helps us break these uh, silos. But going beyond that, um, it's not enough to just have a platform. There are many platforms that allow you to have, uh, you know, all create all these different solutions using one single platform. Where Fabric differs is you can use what's called a semantic link, which is a Python library um, you can use to access both uh, to uh, to create a collaboration between BI persona as well as the data scientist. And what I mean by uh, semantic is if you're coming from a data science world, just a, clear, a bit of clarification here. A semantic model is nothing but data with some business logic on top of that um, with human concepts and rings, links and relationships. So what I mean by that is typically in a data science project, you have the data, you have the business data, um, that's one flat table. Um, but in the business intelligence world, you define on, on top of that some definition of business logic. So again, take an example of net sales, the business logic there is it's not just some of a column called sales. You apply some business logic to it, meaning you filter a few things out, you do some transformation on top of that, and then plus uh, you add some human concepts to that. Uh, these human concepts are something that are used within your organization, something that's very well known within your organization. And then you create relationships uh, uh, of, uh, like enterprise uh, relationship diagrams, um, like if you're coming from the database world, uh, then to create these relationships on how different uh, data sources are related to each other. So let's uh, get into it. So what I've done here is I already have, um, if you're new to Microsoft Fabric, um, as I said, there are all these different compute engines. These are tied together on one single platform. So I went to this persona switcher and you can see I have Power BI, um, which, I, which is used for business intelligence, data engineering, which you can use Spark and Spark SQL and uh, T-SQL to create uh, data engineering uh, solutions. And then we have data science, uh, which includes um, notebooks as well as creating machine learning models and deploying those machine learning models. And then uh, you, uh, it, it, MLflow is integrated into this whole 
um, a platform. Um, so you can create machine learning models, uh, experiments, uh, and then uh, be show those or ex share those with your business intelligence and data engineering counterparts uh, as well. I can go to data science um, and then create a notebook from here, but I've already started a, a notebook uh, which I want to show. So the first things first, what we need to do to use semantic link is to install semantic link, which is pip install semantic link. And this is only available in Microsoft uh, Fabric. So this won't work in my, uh, outside of Microsoft Fabric. Uh, you only can use it in uh, Fabric here. So once I have uh, installed this, I can import it into my, um, I can import it into uh, uh, my notebook as sempy, which is uh, semantic, sem for semantic, and then py for uh, Python. So import sempy.fabric um, as fabric. That's how, that's how I'm going to import it. Uh, and my alias is uh, fabric. Now I can show you two different ways how you can use semantic link. What I'm going to do first is show you how to use fabric assuming you do not have any existing uh, BI model in uh, Power BI model that's all already created. Okay. So what I'll do is first uh, import some data. So this is some just random data, uh, business data that I found on GitHub, uh, which looks like as, as it uh, comes up, you will see that it is, um, give it a second. Yeah, so you can see there is a region, country, item type, sales channel, uh, and then some products, the some uh, cost and price associated with it, um, and then the total cost and total profit. So a very typical business data set. Uh, data set. Um, and if you, uh, there are many different ways we can analyze the data. Maybe your end goal is again to create a forecasting model on top of this um, and then deploy this model so the business intelligence developer can use it in their reports uh, ultimately. Um, now, as I imported this uh, to analyze this into uh, using a semantic link, I'll first have to convert this into a fabric data frame, which is nothing but I can just pass it as fabric data frame. So I imported a fabric data frame class from fabric and then I passed the pandas data frame to it to convert that into a fabric data frame. Fabric data frame, it supports the entire uh, pretty much all the entire uh, Pandas API, meaning I can use the same uh, Pandas API that uh, you are familiar with. So FDF is my fabric data frame. So uh, FDF um, and then columns, for example, and then I will get all the columns uh, that I need. I can, again, um, I can use units sold uh, and select a sep, uh, single column. Uh, uh, let me go here. Units sold. Uh, oh, I need to do the columns, sorry. So, units sold and which is what I'm going to do. And that can, I can use all of this to, uh, you know, same way uh, what we can do with um, a fabric data frame, right? So it works exactly the same way. Um, plus on top of that in a fabric notebook, you can also use data wrangler, which is a feature um, who you can use to work with the semantic data frame or pandas data frame using UI. Meaning I could go here and then if I wanted to not use Python and use a UI um, to work with my uh, data frame. So just a, a, a tip there. Now, as I import this uh, data um, in here, um, I'm new to this data, right? Um, I don't know anything. Now, just based on just looking at these different columns, I can, I know what this data means, right? So ship date, order date, it means something. Unit cost, unit price, is it means something. And how, why do I, if somebody tells me that, hey, you uh, analyze this data, 
just based on the column names, I know what exactly I need to analyze, right? But that may not always be the case, which is where the semantic relationships really help. I can uh, use the find dependencies method in, uh, uh, in semantic link to identify dependencies among these columns. So what I'm seeing here is order ID, um, there is no dependency on it. Um, whereas order date, there is a one to one relationship between these two, meaning for each order ID, there is an order date. For each order ID, there is a ship date, but for each order ID, there is a total revenue, total cost and total profit, and all of three are grouped together, meaning there is a, some relationship uh, among them, and which makes sense as well, right? Because uh, the total cost, uh, 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 so we have total revenue, and revenue minus cost is a profit, right? So there is a relationship. Now we have not provided any other information to fabric uh, to uh, to uh, to semantic link, but just based on um, the, how the data is, we were we are able to identify exactly um, how these different columns are related uh, to each other. Similarly, item, unit price, and unit cost. So I know all these three different columns are maybe pertaining to a single product. Uh, so uh, semantic link can really help you identify dependencies among all of these different uh, columns, which is super helpful. I can go ahead and then plot this, uh, drop duplicates like I sh uh, showed you. Um, and then I can also identify a uh, relationship among all of these different columns. So meaning um, if I plot uh, uh, some relationships here, you will see that there is country, state, um, but the postal code and then state here, right? Which does not make sense because for each state and the city, uh, there should be one unique postal unique postal code. Uh, but it looks like there is some error in this data. And sure enough, we can see that um, there are there is one zip code, this zip code over here, which has two different cities assigned to that. So there is some error in the data uh, that we will probably want to clean um, in here. Uh, going ahead, uh, what if we, uh, so we looked at, um, finding relationship among different columns. But what if I have different tables or different data sets? So in this case, um, I'll show you that I have uh, these different uh, tables here. Uh, I have date, fact, industry, and all of those. And I want to identify if there is a relationship among all of these different uh, tables, which I can do that using semantic link so what I'll do is I'll just uh, read all of these tables, assign, uh, um, store them in a dictionary, um, and then plot the relationship among all these different uh, tables that I've identified. And then what semantic link will do is it will scan the data. Um, so it does it two different ways. Um, so it will identify uh, the column names and as well as it will scan the data and uh, tell you how these different tables are related to each other. Meaning I have the fact table here, uh, which has a BU key and there is a BU table here, which has the BU key, right? Um, so easy enough. Um, so we know that the fact table there is a one to many relationship between the fact table and the BU. Same thing with the fact and the customer. And how is this helpful to you? Well, as a data scientist, maybe you work with uh, the data engineering team or you work with uh, the business intelligence team um, and the data has already been normalized for you. Um, but uh, because it has already been normalized, it is not, it's, it's not in one single table. So you can easily use a semantic link to identify relationship among all of these different uh, tables um, and figure out uh, how exactly you need to denormalize it to create your data science application. But what about, um, what about working with Power BI semantic models? So Power BI, uh, this is a Power BI report based on the same data um, that let's say your BI um, colleague has already created. And there is some KPIs here that are created, uh, but now you've been asked that can we enrich this report using 
uh, a data science. Maybe you create again uh, a, a forecast, right? Now, the point that I raised earlier, should the data scientists at this point create their uh, start with start from scratch, import all the data, figure out how to define sales, figure out how to define profit, um, and then recreate that semantic definition? Or shouldn't they be able to use the same definition that the, your BI colleague has already created and then use that as a starting point, right? And sure enough, that's what semantic link allows you to do. So what I will go and do here is I already have, let's see, I already have, um, uh, I already have, uh, I can access this uh, 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 semantic model, the customer profitability sample. Um, uh, and then I know this particular uh, semantic model has a measure called a total revenue. So I can use total revenue um, and then I want to aggregate it by year and the period and that's how I can get this definition. Um, I didn't have to again go and then define how exactly I want it. I, I, I want to use the same definition of revenue that the, uh, the, the business intelligence developer uh, has uh, created for me. I can also uh, scan all the tables that are available. So I can uh, scan all the tables, for example, um, scan all the measures that are created within that sim same semantic models um, and use that as my starting point. So this really allows you um, to, for uh, the data scientists and uh, the business intelligence developer to collaborate uh, with each other. But then we can take it next step further, uh, for example, um, and then create uh, 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 the um, uh, uh, and then we can create, uh, for example, forecasting model um, on top of that. So, for example, uh, if I go here, what I did was um, I created, used a theta model um, just for the sake of uh, a demonstration from stats model, um, and then the same uh, data that I imported from my semantic model. I created that, deployed that, um, uh, those predictions, and now I can relay that back to uh, my uh, uh, BI colleague who can take it over from them. So the whole point of uh, doing all of this is we want to be able to use the exact same definitions, the semantic definitions that are um, used in the semantic model across the entire uh, solution uh, 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 that is created for uh, our organization. So I hope this was helpful to you on how you can use semantic link to uh, break uh, data silos in your organization. Um, if you want to learn more about semantic link, go to aka.ms slash senpai here and you will see that uh, Microsoft has a rich uh, documentation on that, which really goes into what semantic link is and all the different uh, features that are available within that. So um, thank you again, and I really appreciate you joining me. Hello, hello. Great presentation again, and I'm so excited, it's been a full day of awesome talks. And we have our last talk coming up. It is a live presentation. There's an allusion to bears. I, I love bears. <laughs> I'm so excited. So we're going to talk about data science and bears with Renee. Um, but Sujin, you have a, a, yes. a tidbit for us. Uh, just a shameless plug <laughs> for VS Code again. Um, am uh, I sharing my screen? Let's add to this stage. Okay, cool. 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 Yeah, so uh, everything that we've talked about so far, I mean, you can always come to like any of our videos or events mm -hmm. like these to, to learn about something new. But for the time that you're, you don't see us on screen, mm -hmm. um, you can always go to our uh, release notes. Um, so if you go to code.visualstudio.com slash updates, you don't, you don't need the, the V, the, the version number. Um, it'll go to the, the latest updates that we have. Um, so if you're interested in like notebooks, for example, we have a whole notebook section or like you can just find like notebooks or Jupyter or what have you. Um, then we also uh, roll up all of our co-pilot um, releases uh, and, and changes that we make into this uh, release notes as well. So you can always come to this. Um, and 
we shared earlier the video where Don is doing the Python release uh, on on video. There's also something like that, like a like a release party for mm. uh, for VS Code for in all of VS Code. Yep. So like that, my video was specifically just Python, Python. things. Mm -hmm. But Burke and Olivia yep. and Reynold, they do an awesome job on the exactly. release party. It's very fun. Yeah, and that's where actually devs come on uh, to to talk about the the features that they've implemented. So if you want to interact with any of the devs in VS Code, that's a really good way to um, to see them and to hear directly from them. Um, and then another way that you can do that is through GitHub. Um, our oh, it's back. Okay, it's back. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Our devs live in GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to issues on, oh, of course, um, on either the VS Code GitHub uh, repo or um, the Jupyter one, for example, if you go to the issues, um, then you'll be able to file an issue there. And we usually respond like, probably within 48 hours, if not earlier than that. Yeah. Um, so they, you know, our devs are always looking at issues and, and like responding directly in there. So that's, I always say, if you don't want to like fill out a survey, I mean, please do. But if you don't want to fill out that survey that we sent earlier, put this it back is, on screen. Yeah, I know. Like, this, is, this, is where, this is where you go. Um, so yeah. Our awesome. Issues, yep. And do, how often do you direct people to like a roadmap, for example, the VS Code roadmap in particular? Um, we don't usually. Um, I mean, just but it's open. It's it just, is open. Yeah. There's just so many other ways to get involved as well, too. Yep. But yep. the roadmap is there. Roadmap is, roadmap is there. So we have iterations um, every month. So we do monthly iterations, monthly sprints, I guess. Um, and so you see all these, like when you go to the release notes, you'll see like February release, January release. There's no December. We don't do December releases. Um, but you see these monthly releases, release cadences. So, you, so you'll be able to see that. Um, but yeah, you can see the roadmap and you can see how they, like all of the items are actually directly linked to a GitHub issue. So mm -hmm. like, that's how much we really like want to interact with people, yep. um, that are using our product. So yeah, I wanted to give that, that shameless plug before yeah. we bring on the last speaker. Right, we love day. VS Code. <laughs> um, in the same vein, I'm going off the cuff here, but if you do want to have some FaceTime with uh, the Azure developers, they have a Azure developer YouTube channel, and they also have community stand-ups, which is really, really cool. They talk about you know um, uh, their databases and, and app service and web apps, and I'm not the Azure expert, but they have a lot of really cool stand-ups um, um, every month. And so check out that YouTube channel as well. All right. Without further ado, let's get our last uh, speaker on. I'm so excited to chat with Renee. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here as well. Um, I do have some possibly heartbreaking news for you, Dawn. I'm not actually going to be talking about bears today. Oh, no! <laughs> it's okay. The it's okay. Because I'm, we hope... Excuse but me? We are going to be talking about koalas. Oh, oh no no this is better upgrade <laughs> i love koalas. excellent this is great. and we'll also be talking about australia. pandas pandas which are also <laughs> okay <not> there you <laughs> go and you're in australia right now what time is it there it is currently 10 30 nearly 10 30 a.m yeah okay good I'm That's glad it. we got you at a better hour. We were about to have her at something that was unfair and we wouldn't have gotten the best version of Renee, although she always shows up and, and <laughs> does it well. Um, but I'm excited. So like, let's, let's get out of the way and let you talk about koalas and pandas and stuff. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. So yes, as uh, we've just said, I'm gonna be talking about the bare necessities of data science today. Um, but there will be no bears discussed during this talk, but don't worry, there will be references to plenty of animals, um, especially koalas, and there'll be a lot of pictures of koalas. So what are we actually gonna be doing today? Uh, well, the bare necessities I'd say of data science include inspecting your data, uh, being able to manipulate your data, and then visualizing your data. That's really gonna help you get started with data science wherever you are on your journey. Uh, so. Who can do this and who would be, who's the ideal audience for this talk? Well, maybe you're already a data scientist, but you want data scientists and you want to learn a bit more about Python and Matplotlib and Pandas, so you can do more with uh, with those technologies. Or maybe you're a developer who's launching into the world of data science. Maybe you're a teacher or university lecturer and you want to be able to do some of your own data science and teach others, or you're teaching actual school students or uni students, they can do it too. This is perfect for everybody. These are actually some of the tools that I used when I was in uni, actually doing chemical engineering and stuff to do some data science way back then. 
Uh, so yeah, let's let's uh, see what we're going to need today. We're going to be needing some koala data. As I've mentioned, there is none of these, none of these are going to be bears. So we've got koala data, not bears. Pandas or pandas, uh, the uh, the Python programming library for dealing with data. Also not uh, actual not actual pandas, uh, which are also not bears. Uh, Python, which is also not a bear. Um, hopefully, this is sticking with you. Python's not a bear. And finally, matplotlib, which is definitely not a bear either. So there'll be no bears discussed during this talk, but we will be doing a lot of uh, koala-related data science today. So I'm very excited to get started with that. So uh, yes, if, you, if you've seen on here, there is a link, um, aka.ms slash koala dash repo. If you want to code along with me or if you want to grab it for later, have some code for later, um, then you can have all of this and you can feel free to clone this repo. Um, and I'm going to be working in a code space today that I've already got started uh, working here. You can clone it and make your own code space and code spaces right here, um, which is really handy if you want to do some data science and just do it in the browser. So I'm going to be using a Jupyter notebook today. Um, I am working on the demo underscore koala dot IPYNB. That's short for IPython Notebooks, the original name of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, but all of the code that you might need later uh, will be in the Koala Data Science uh, Notebook. So it's all going to be there if you want to have a go at that um, later. Or I'll push these uh, changes up once we're done here today. So let me just get my own notes up so we can get started here. Um, so yeah, firstly, we're, as I've mentioned, we're going to be using Pandas today which is a library for handling our data because we've got some koala data here today. Um, what we have is some koala sightings. So I'm just going to open up that CSV uh, so we can take a look. This is not the most friendly way to actually have a look at your data. It's a little bit overwhelming. You can't really get a lot of nuance out of it right here. So we're not going to be looking at our data in this form today. We're going to be looking at it using Pandas firstly. Um, so I've already installed Pandas, but I've got a requirements.txt file right there if you need to install it yourself. So I'm installing Pandas and matplotlib. Um, and you can use, just in the terminal, you can run if install-r requirements.txt to install that whole file. So we've got that all ready to go. Uh, so now we're going to need to create a Pandas data frame. Uh, one second, I've just lost my notes on my other screen. Here we go, much better. Okay, so firstly, we're gonna to wanna to get the data out of that koala sightings dot uh, underscore data dot CSV. So this is just how we can read some data using Pandas into a data frame. So that's how we're gonna store all of our, our data. It's kind of like, if you imagine like an Excel table almost, but you have so much more functionality and a lot of different bits and pieces you can do to interact with that data. And it's just really easy, much easier than dealing with your data in CSV format. So that's going to be pretty fun. So I'm going to use this uh, to read data from our CSV. And then I'm just going to print it out so we just have a bit of information about our data. So we're using koaladata.info. So once it's in our data frame, we can just kind of start asking questions of our data using this .info uh, right here. So let's give that a run. So firstly, we're going to import pandas. If you haven't used a notebook before, uh, you just run one of these cells each at a time, just writing Python, and then it can just run each of them and it keeps all of that in memory. Um, and you can also run all of them from top to bottom if you ever need to do that. So we have now pulled our data from the CSV into a data frame and it can tell us things like some information about our data. Um, we could also ask it for the shape of our data. Let's do that first. Um, just a quick, easy one. Let's comment this one out and then rerun that. So super easy. We can just say, oh, here's the shape of our data. We've got 649 rows. So 649 different koalas have been cited in this data. And we've got 32 different columns, our different fields about the data. So let's uncomment that and run that again. And we can have a look at the info. So we can just ask it to tell us some information about this data. Um, it's already looking a lot more friendly than looking at the whole CSV. Uh, so we can see the different bits of information we have for each of these koala sightings. The year, the date, the age of the koala, uh, 
the number of adults that we're seeing there, the location, we've got the LGA, the local government area, we'll be working with that in a little bit as well. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of different bits and pieces we could do here. And something I really love about data science is it's really just a way of asking a lot of different questions. Most of these questions, you'll go and do some investigation, and then you'll probably be left with more questions, but that's kind of the fun of it. So we've got our starting point of inspecting our data here. What have we got going on? What could we possibly do with this? So now we've got our setup a little bit. Let's have a little bit more of a, an explore of our data uh, to see what are some of the you know things we might want to start looking at. So I'm going to just start by getting the names of the columns. We did have them up here, but actually there's more than can fit on this screen. Um, it only prints out 18 and then it kind of tells us there's more and you could get them. So I'm going to get all of them. I can know a bit more about the names because if we know the names of the columns, we can start addressing our data frame by those columns and doing some interesting data science with them. So here are all the names of our columns. So we can start going, oh, what might I want to do with these different things? So I'm thinking, okay, in this data, I could see that there was a lot of data and it's got different places in it. I kind of maybe want to know what different locations have been surveyed for koalas and where the most koalas are and things like that. So I'm going to say, okay, what locations are we looking at? How many different locations? Is it just like a really small area? I know that this data is from Queensland, which is a state of Australia, um, up in the northeast. Um, it's a pretty, one of, I guess most of our states are pretty big, but it's a pretty big state with a lot going on. So let's find out where this data is from. Okay, so we've run this. Um, and now we can see that our data is from these, uh, how many locations? Eight locations, I think, are there. Um, so we've got, you know, Brisbane. You might have heard of Brisbane, capital of Queensland. Um, we've also got the Gold Coast just a bit south of Queensland. No, not south of Queensland, south of Brisbane, where my lovely partner is from. Uh, and, yeah, we've got a few more less metropolitan areas as well. So we've got a few different locations going on here. We could start thinking about where might the koalas be? What might be going on here? Where could we consider there'd be a lot of koalas? So we've got all of that information there, but we just need to be able to get it out. So let's find out which is the most koala, koala -y location in these Queensland locations. So let's, I'm going to take first a look at, at the Gold Coast, where my lovely fiance is from. So we're going to look at where, how many how many koalas are in the Gold Coast? I'm going to call these my golden koalas. So we've got our golden koalas. Here we go. I'll just explain this bit of code here. So we've got golden koalas, and they're going to be, we're going to get the location of the koalas. And we want to make sure it is equal. So we're going to say, hey, give me that koala data. Um, LGA. So it's just we want to look at those columns and we want to make sure it's equal to the Gold Coast. So if we run that, it's going to tell us what koalas. We have to print something. That would be important. Let's print the golden koalas as well. I can tell you these are not gold colored koalas, these are just koalas in the Gold Coast. And here we go. We've got all of our Gold Coast based koalas that we've seen uh, in, we can see they're in the bushland around the Gold Coast here. So uh, that's good to know. You say, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of koalas there. That's just a nice way to know that we can address specific areas. We can say, hey, I just wanted to get uh, koalas for this location. And we're going to use uh, a bunch of things like that going forward to kind of aggregate our data and do some visualization in a minute when we get to it. But just for in case we want to be able to save our golden koalas for later, I'm just going to quickly show you how you can save your data because maybe you're like I don't actually care about Brisbane koalas, I don't care about Logan koalas, I only care about my Gold Coast golden koalas. So if you wanted to be able to export that data really easily, um, maybe to give to somebody else, uh, we could just say to CSV. So we've previously imported from a CSV, but now we can just go to a CSV and we're going to make our new CSV called golden koalas. And I'm just going to run that, and then we will have here our golden koala csv so if you ever need to export your data super simple like that um to send back on its way back in the format that it came to you because pandas is really great for working with data and if you're working in a team i can completely advocate for working with your data in 
regards to that. And you've heard a lot of different talks today. Maybe we've been talking about fabric. I've heard a few of them about that. So you can work with um, similar notebooks like this in fabric. Um, and it'd be great if you're working together in fabric with the rest of your team. But if you do need to send some data on its way, maybe to another organization, you can export it in a CSV just like that. Uh, so there we go. Um, so we just uh, wanted to know how many unique locations we are looking at. I think we did this earlier. So let's just run that again. Um, yes, we've already had that one. So those are our different unique locations that we have our data for. I think maybe we didn't run that earlier, but yeah, that is just a way of saying, hey, what were all our different headings? There we go. Yeah, we had that before. Um, just, and we're going to be using that going forward um, because we're going to be willing to say, where are these koalas? How many are in each location? So really handy say, hey, this is my data set I want to look at. I want this column, LGAs, and I want only, I just want unique ones. I don't want you to premiere out all of the LGAs and then have Gold Coast repeated a bunch of times, Brisbane City repeated a bunch of times. I just want to know what all the individual ones are. So really handy if you want to, for instance, make a bar chart or something. So we're going to be doing that in just a minute. Okay, so let us visualize some data as well. Uh, so we've got a lot of different data going on here. And I think data science is a really interesting way. Just It's just really interesting for me as an adult, but I think it's also a really interesting way to learn to program um, and to ask a lot of questions, whether you're teaching kids science, whether you're teaching them computing, there's so many different interesting things you can do with it. And it's fun to make some graphs that are really fun to interact with, with as, as kids and just like visual representations of things that they understand. Uh, so we're gonna try and make a few fun ones today, but we're just gonna get started with the tree heights of the trees that koalas have been spotted in, as well as the koala height in the tree. So how high up in the tree do they go? Do they like to go higher? I don't know. Maybe they always stay near the ground. Maybe they go to the top of the tree. So we're going to find out this using a scatter plot. So let's have a look at how to get our tree data. So we've got our tree heights variable and we're getting our koala data. And super simple, we're just going to ask, please give me the height of the tree. And we're just creating a slice essentially. We just want this column of data because when we're going to plot our X versus Y axes, we do need to have those two bits separated. So a bit of this data finagling that we're doing is just getting our data and putting it in two little slices so we can plot them against to each other. So firstly, we get the height of the tree. Secondly, we also want the height of the koala in the tree. So we're gonna pop that in here as well. And then let's just have a quick look at what that looks like. As I said, it's just gonna be a single slice of the data. Um, so we can just kind of like how you would reference something in a list instead of using an index, you can just use the name or for instance, actually a dictionary is a much better example. You say, hey, I want this column of data and it will just give us that column of data. So this is our koala heights in the tree. So that's that's all good. So now we've got those two bits of data. Let's make a plot. And as I said, we're also working with matplotlib today, which we imported at this week installed with pip at the start in requirements.txt, but it's now time to import it. We're going to use pyplot to make some nice graphs. So let's start with a nice little scatter plot. Super easy. If you just want to make a single plot, you can just go plot.scatter. And so import, imported pyplot as PLT, which is very common in the matplotlib space to just have that shortening of it. So we're going to get plot.scatter and we just want koala heights versus tree heights. I'm going to have koala heights on the x-axis going across, and I'm going to have the tree heights kind of actually like representing the height of the tree going up the y-axis. So I think that's that's fun. I think that's fun for the kids to understand if you're teaching it to students, whether they're kids or university students or just your friends. I think it's pretty cute. So let's give it a run. And then we can just export it. We can just see it right here in our uh, Jupyter Notebook, which is super handy. So uh, we can see here we've got different tree heights and as the trees get taller we do see the koalas actually going up higher in the tree so when i see this i kind of start asking a bunch of different questions being like huh i wonder how logging is impacting the populations of koalas because koalas are endangered that's why a lot of people around the world will know of koalas not just because they're cute but also because we're trying to save them so if we're cutting down trees and the trees aren't as tall are they less safe from wildlife what's going on uh, are they less safe from feral animals like cats and things, um, what 
what can we do to help them? So yeah, that's something I really like about data science. So we've created that here and yeah, you go, okay, what else could we maybe want to know about our koala friends and their tree based habits? Maybe what trees, what areas do they like the most? So let's take a look. As we said, we have different LGAs. How can we plot these to see which LGAs are the most popular for the koalas? What are the hot spots for koalas in Queensland? So I'm going to grab this line of code. And this one here is we're going to get the koala, koala sightings count. So what I want is how many koalas have been seen in each of these local government areas. So we get the koala data and we want to group it by the local government area. So we want to put everything that's in Logan, they should be grouped together. Everything that's in Brisbane City, they should be put together. And everything that's in the Gold Coast, they should be put together. So grouping by that. And then once everything is grouped in those different LGAs, we want to do a count. So because we know the IDs are unique, I'm going to use that as the field we're going to count based on. And then we can just get how many different items are in each of those, um, in each of those groups now. So if we do that, I'm going to also print it out. And it's going to give us a nice little table with just for those different LGAs. How many koalas have we seen there? So here we go. We've got a nice bit of data now. So it's looking pretty good. It looks like what we want it to, want it to look like numbers and different locations. But it would be look better if it was in the form of a, of a bar chart, I think. So let us make that a reality. Um, so we're going to once again separate those x and y axes because we've got our what we want on our axis x axis is x axis here and what we want on our y axis here. Um, but we do need to separate those into two different bits and pieces because they're currently in koala sightings count, which is which is great because we can just split those out just like a dictionary. And we can say, okay, I want the keys, which are the names of the different LGAs. And I want the values, which are just the numbers here. And we can say, okay, now we've got our X axis, which is the LGAs and our Y axis, which is the counts. And we can start making a nice plot on that one. So making a bar graph here. We're going to hit run on that. Um, but I may have forgotten to put actually our axes titles and our title for the graph on our last graph. Um, but yes, as we can see here, it's looking a bit sad without those on it. It's also got this horrible situation going on here where we've got a lot of overlapping going on. So let's fix that up a little bit. We're going to start by giving it a title and some axes titles as well. So looking a bit better. Got a title, very easy, and adding our different axes for the X and the Y axes. But also we can do lots of fun things like we can rotate these tick marks here, these little, uh, these axes style down the bottom using X ticks rotation equals 45. Just make it a little bit nicer and we can do show. If you are running this in Python rather than in a Jupyter Notebook, you'll need to do show. Otherwise, it won't show it. It just happens to show it because it is the, the last thing that happens in this stupid notebook, in this in this cell. Uh, so we've got this going on now. So that's looking way better. We can see that Morden Bay has heaps of koalas, Redland City, tons of koalas too. Um, and yeah, now we've actually got a good visual visualization for that, which is going well. Cool. So uh, that's great. Let's go and see how tall the trees are in each of these LGAs. Because I think that's going to help us understand possibly the state of the koala life in each of these LGAs. Maybe it'll show us something about why there's more koalas in in Morden Bay than in Noosa, but I don't know if it will. Um, but it's just good questions to ask. And maybe if it doesn't, then it just leads us to ask more questions. Um, yeah, because there's always more data and there's always more nuance, especially when dealing with just the environment, there's so much going on there. So let us start by getting now tree data. And now this time we're going to group by the local government area again. But this time I want to get the average height, the mean height of the height of the trees for that LGA. So grouping again, but this time instead of doing a count, how many koalas have we seen there, we're going to do a 
height of the tree um, and get the average. So we're going to get all these bits of data and we're going to get the mean and then we're going to store that for each of the LGAs. So if we can print that one again as well. Three heights me. Cool. So looking looking good. Got some data going on there. Um, that's the shape that we would expect to be. Always good to have a look at your data, both when you start with the CSVs and throughout to be like, is this what I was expecting? Because data is not always clean. It does need some cleaning up sometimes. Uh, so let us start by plotting a graph. So this time I'm going to do something a little bit different uh, because we do, I want to do a little bit of a fancy graph later. So I'm actually going to have two graphs here um, and they're going to be on top of each other. So I'm going to use something called subplots um, just to start because we want to put more graphs into this later. Uh, so it's a little bit trickier, but it's not very tricky and we just need to set it up this way so we can have two graphs on it later. And once again, we are going to split out our data into our X and Y axes. So I'm just going to have X and Y for our tree heights, mean keys and values. And then I'm going to plot our bar chart here. And you're gonna, let's start by writing that. I'm going to make it brown because I want it to look like the trees. So we've got these little tree uh, bars here, uh, which is fun. And that's looking good, except for we don't have any titles, et cetera, again. So let's whack those on uh, and tilt those, tilt those axes names as well. So we're going to make them vertical. Type over there. Cool. So let's hit run and have that looking better again. Uh, question in the chat, how does the data frame look after we add group by anything? So the data frame itself won't change. It's making a reference to that data frame. Um, so that's going to stay the same. I see people are not liking this light colored VS code in the chat. But that's okay. We just do that for the stream. It does make it more visually able to be seen by people, especially coming across the stream. It improves the definition. So I'm apologize for the white that it's it is coming out your eyes, but it is better for being able to see. Uh, but hopefully that is answering your question a little bit about the data frame after we add the group by anything. It stays the same. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just a reference and creating a new reference to that data. And then little little like mini data frame essentially. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. We've got some tree heights for each of the LGAs. Um, this is the average tree height for each of them. Um, and obviously, you could do a lot more with the different, like you could do a, a mode, or you could do the median, you could do a lot of different things in here, but we're just doing this for simplicity today. You can do all manner of data science, all kind of statistics things here with your data. Okay, so now we've got our tree heights. I kind of want to add where the koala is in the tree to that. So how high are the koalas in the tree? We're once again going to do another average, another mean here to get the koala height in the tree, just like we did for the tree heights. And then we are going to add our koalas. So I'm actually going to be putting a lot of the same graph stuff in here um, because I just want to add to the ones we just had. Um, so yes, we've got, once again, we've got our tree data here. And I'm going to add our koalas here. So I want to do a little scatter plot on top of my tree vertical bar graph. And then we're just going to add those axes labels as well. And let's hit run on that. And there we go. We can actually have our koalas as they are on average in the trees as they are on average represented on the same graph, which is, I think, a pretty cool thing. Uh, so yeah. That's that's most of it. What I had to show for you today. I did want to try and get little koalas as emojis on here, which I have not quite been able to do because uh, I'll show you quick quickly what ha what we get if we do try and use a koala emoji, and then we'll see what we uh, can do instead. Maybe we can uh, implement the koala emoji in Matplotlib. We do not have koala emojis represented in Matplotlib, but we can instead uh, use a different emoji of your choice um, here. So, which is, um, I'm gonna use one, one thing again, a thing that is not a bear, 
because we didn't have bear emojis. I thought that would be a fun way to end this session, but there are no bear emojis. So instead, we're going to have cat emojis in a tree to represent our koalas uh, as where they are sitting in these trees. A bit ironic because cats may be part of the problem, but I think logging is mostly part of the problem. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you've learned a little bit about uh, data science today. Um, and if you want to learn a little bit more, you can check out any of these resources here. I've got a uh, a few episodes on data science, doing more of this kind of stuff, touching the color data a little bit, but also some other environmental data on my Code Garden video series on Microsoft Reactor YouTube. Um, you can check out our 14 days of data science blog. We're up to day seven now. Um, and there'll be seven more days coming um, where me, Jasmine, and Nitya have been working on some awesome blogs that tell you all about things, all about machine learning and different stuff. And also, there's a great data science uh, learn pathway that you can check out on Microsoft Learn. These links are also all on the README for my repo. So you can check that out at aka.ms slash koala repo again, if you are keen to give it a go. Yeah, that's all I have for you. That's all my koalas here today. <laughs> I hope you've learned one thing that koalas and pandas are not bears as well. <laughs> That was so great. And we got both you and Nitya um, on the screen today and Jasmine earlier today. She started off the this, the episode and that's uh, the, the team have been really doing an awesome job with those 14 days of data science blog posts. I'm so excited that you were all able to contribute that. Um, you were answering some questions in chat as you were going, but I had another one. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe if we wanted to bring back your last screen, but so you really wanted to focus on the fundamentals. I feel like I have a really great fundamental um, understanding of data science in Copilot after your presentation. Um, but like, what would you imagine that like the next steps should be? What what is involved in so, some of those more advanced presentations that you have? Mm, that's a great question because there's so many kind of different places you can go to once you've kind of got a few of these basics, like obviously explore more into ter in terms of how you can like do other statistics and stuff. Um, okay. But I think other things that I really enjoy, uh, like I've also got some things on like 3D graphing potentially that, that's in one of my videos. So in my Code Garden month, I did uh, introduction, just how to work with the data. So really just delving more into pandas and what you cool. can do there. Then there's a whole episode two on more of these different bar graphs line charts as well, just having a full mm. um, basis in all of those and then going more into 3D graphing surfaces and things like that. I think that's another good spot to go to next. And then if you also want to branch out and do go into more um, like machine learning stuff, I think that's where I kind of went with my data science um, was doing some more prediction based things and also being able to explain the, like the statistics behind the probabilities of like the likelihood of the different outcomes that you're predicting, which is really interesting, which okay. I've done a bunch around environmental data and graphing that with colors on different 3D surfaces, I think is a really fun direction to go in. Yeah, I love the animals. I love the environment. I love those <laughs> use cases. It was great. I love that. Thanks so much for joining us, Renee. I appreciate it. Um, you have a great day. Um, happy Pi Day. Is it still Pi Day for you or is it the day after Pi Day? It's the day after Pi Day. It's Pi Hangover Day if you eat too much pie, I guess. Um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no longer Pi Day, day but pie? every day not Pi Day. Yes, there you go. We just need to pie every day and then it doesn't matter. That's it was it. great. It was an awesome way to end the day. Thanks, Renee. Thanks for having me. Have a great Pi Day, everyone. So... Yeah. It was a lot. It. <laughs> it was a great pie day. Oh, yes. Um, I hope everyone had fun. Uh, all of the episodes, all of the sessions are going to be available where you're watching. If you're watching on YouTube, it'll be available on this channel on a playlist. You'll also be able to access them on Microsoft Learn. Uh, it will be a show um, and it'll all be categorized there. We'll add some more um, goodies into the show notes of each of these episodes as we split them out and edit them. Um, but we had a lot of great chats. I, do you have anything else that you wanted to share with the I mean, group before we go? This was our very first Python Data Science Day. So it was. Uh, I, I, we're very curious to understand how this went for you. If oh, yes. If you liked any of the content. Let's add that um, on. What were some of the things that you wish you saw a little bit more? I know mm -hmm. some of you have shouted that out in the chat as well. But um, we would love to capture that in our survey. So that's ak.ms slash Python 
slash data science day slash survey. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot, uh, but it's showing on the screen right now. So you can go over there and, and let us know like how we can improve it in the next round. Yep. Um, so that's it for that's it for us. Yeah. Have a great pie day. Eat some pie. Bye, y'all.